And the Gods Laughed by Frederick Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. You know how it is when you're with a work crew on one of the asteroids? You're there, stuck for the month you signed up for, with four other guys and nothing to do but talk. Space on the little tugs that you go in and return in and live in while you're there is at such a premium that there isn't room for a book or a magazine or equipment for games, and you're out of radio range except for the usual once-a-terrestrial-day system-wide newscasts. So, talking is the only indoor sport you can go in for. Talking and listening. You've plenty of time for both because a work day in spacesuits is only four hours, and that with four 15-minute back-to-the-ship rest periods, so you actually work only three hours and spend half that time getting in and out of the airlock. But those are union rules, and no asteroid mining outfit tries to chisel on them. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that talk is cheap on one of those work crews. With most of the day to do nothing else, you listen to some real whoppers. Stories that would make the old-time liars clubs back on Earth seem like Sunday school meetings. And if your mind runs that way, you've got plenty of time to think up some yourself. Charlie Dean was on our crew, and Charlie could tell some dillies. He'd been on Mars back in the old days, when there was still trouble with the bullies, and when living on Mars was a lot like living on Earth back in the days of Indian fighting. The bullies thought and fought a lot like emerins, even though they were quadrupeds that looked like alligators on stilts, if you can picture an alligator on stilts, and used blowguns instead of bows and arrows. Or was it crossbows that the emerins used against the colonists? Anyway, Charlie's just finished a whopper that was really too good for the first tryout of the trip. We'd just landed, you see, and were resting up from doing nothing en route, and usually the yarns start off easy and believable, and don't work up to real depth of space lying until along the fourth week, when everybody's bored stiff. So we took this head bowly, Charlie was ending up, and you know what kind of flappy little ears they got, and we put a couple of zircon-studded earrings in its ears and let it go. And back it went to the others, and then darned if... Well, I won't go on with Charlie's yarn, because it hasn't got anything to do with this story, except that it brought earrings into the conversation. When Charlie had finished, Zeb Wera stood up and sniffed. Air's getting kind of bad in here, he said. Reckon I'll go out and get my first shift over with. Anybody want to come? Ray went with him. Our tug had equipment for only two men to work outside at a time, and the rest of us helped them into suits and out the lock, and then settled down for some more talk there being nothing else to do. Zeb's remark about the air had just been a crack at Charlie's story, of course. How'd you happen to have zircon earrings along? Blake Powers asked Charlie when things had quieted down again. Blake was skipper for the voyages, but now that we were anchored down on our asteroid, he was just one of the boys, until we took off again. And with the slum for trading, Charlie said, when you're going to any place in the system that might be inhabited and you don't know by what kind of critters... You take a little of almost everything. You never know what's going to strike the fancy of any civilized or semi-civilized race you might hit. It might be mirrors. I've known dime store mirrors to bring in twice their weight in radium salt. Or it might be paper clips or harmonicas or salted peanuts or plaster statuettes. He turned to me and said, You know that, Hank. You've been on a first trip or two. So have you, Blake. Blake nodded. I remember I was on the crew of the ship that landed first on Phobos. You know what the Phoboians turned out to be like, of course? They had about everything we had, and damned if we could do a lick of trading until the captain of our ship put something back in a box and happened to put a rubber band around the box. They went nuts. They'd never seen anything that had elasticity. Rubber or anything like it simply wasn't known on Phobos. We managed to find a few dozen rubber bands in the ship's office and practically bought out Phobos with them. One of the crew was wearing old-fashioned suspenders with elastic in them, and he traded them for a bucket of Phoboian sail stones. Had to hold up his pants with a piece of rope for the rest of the trip, but when he got back to Earth, he was rich. Me, I was wearing a belt. I've worn suspenders ever since, but I never got back to Phobos. Not that it would matter if I did, and her planet's doing a regular trade in rubber there now, and it's down to 20 credits a pound or thereabouts. Blake shook his head gloomily and then turned to me. He said, Hank, what went on at Ganymede? You were on that ship that went out there a few months ago, weren't you? The first one that got through? I've never read or heard much about that trip. Me either, Charlie said. Except that the Ganymedians turned out to be humanoid beings about four feet tall and didn't wear a thing except earrings. 
Kind of immodest, wasn't it? I grinned. You wouldn't have thought so if you'd seen the Ganymedians. With them, it didn't matter. Anyway, they didn't wear earrings. You're crazy, Charlie said. Sure, I know you were on that expedition and I wasn't, but you're still crazy because I had a quick look at some of the pictures they brought back. The natives wore earrings. No, I said. Earrings wore them. Blake sighed deeply. I knew it. I knew it, he said. There was something wrong with this trip from the start. Charlie pops off the first day with a yarn that should have been worked up to gradually. And now you say, or is there something wrong with my sense of earring? I chuckled. Not a thing, Skipper, Charlie said. I've heard of men biting dogs, but earrings wearing people is a new one. Hank, I hate to say it, but just consider it said. Anyway, I had their attention, and now was as good a time as any. I said, if you read about the trip, you know we left Earth about eight months ago for a six months round trip. There were six of us in the M94. Me and two others made up the crew, and there were three specialists to do the studying and exploring. Not the really top flight specialists, though, because the trip was too risky to send them. That was the third ship to try for Ganymede, and the other two had cracked up on outer Jovian satellites that the observatories hadn't spotted from Earth because they were too small to show up in the scopes at that distance. When you get there, you find there's practically an asteroid belt around Jupiter, most of them so black they don't reflect light to speak of. And you can't see them till they hit you or you hit them. But most of them... Skip the satellites, Blake interrupted. Unless they wore earrings. Or unless earrings wore them, said Charlie. Neither, I admitted. All right, so we were lucky and got through the belt and landed. Like I said, there were six of us. Lecky, the biologist, Haynes, geologist and mineralogist, and Hilda Race, who loved little flowers and was a botanist, egad. You'd have loved Hilda, at a distance. Somebody must have wanted to get rid of her and sent her on that trip. She gushed. You know the type. And then there was Art Willis and Dick Carney. They gave Dick Skipper's rating for the trip. He knew enough astrogation to get us through. So Dick was Skipper and Art and I were flunkies and gunmen. Our main job was to go along with the specialists whenever they left the ship and stand guard over them against whatever dangers might pop up. And did anything pop up? Charlie demanded. I'm coming to that, I told him. We found Ganymede not so bad as places go. Gravity low, of course, but you could get around easily and keep your balance once you got used to it. And the air was breathable for a couple of hours. After that, you found yourself panting like a dog. A lot of funny animals, but none of them were very dangerous. No reptilian life, all of it mammalian. But a funny kind of mammalian, if you know what I mean. Blake said, I don't know what you mean. Get to the natives and the earrings. I said, but of course, with animals like that, you never know whether they're dangerous until you've been around them for a while. You can't judge by size or looks. Like if you'd never seen a snake, you'd never guess that a little coral snake was dangerous, would you? And a Martian ZZ looks for all the world like an overgrown guinea pig. But without a gun or with one, for that matter. I'd rather face a grizzly bear or a... The earrings, said Blake. You were talking about earrings. I said, oh, yes, earrings. Well, the natives wore them. For now, I'll put it that way to make it easier to tell. One earring apiece, even though they had two ears, gave them a sort of lopsided look because they were pretty fair-sized earrings, like hoops of plain gold two or three inches in diameter. Anyway, the tribe we landed near wore them that way. We could see the village, a very primitive sort of place made of mud huts from where we landed. We had a council of war and decided that three of us would stay in the ship and the other three go to the village. Lecky, the biologist, and Art Willis and I with guns. We didn't know what we might run into, see, and Lecky was chosen because he was pretty much of a linguist. He had a flair for languages and could talk them almost as soon as he heard them. They'd heard us land and a bunch of them, about forty I guess, met us halfway between the ship and the village. And they were friendly, funny people, quiet and dignified and acting not at all like you'd expect savages to act toward people landing out of the sky. You know how most primitives react. Either they practically worship you or else they try to kill you. We went to the village with them, and there were about forty more of them there. They'd split forces just as we did for the reception committee. Another sign of intelligence. They recognized Lecky as leader and started jabbering to him in a lingo that sounded more like a pig grunting than a man talking. And pretty soon, Lecky was making an experimental grunt or two in return. Everything seemed on the up and up and no danger. 
and they weren't paying much attention to Art and me, so we decided to wander off for a stroll around outside of the village to see what the country in general was like and whether there were any dangerous beasties or whatnot. We didn't see any animals, but we did see another native. He acted differently from the others. Very different. He threw a spear at us and then ran. And it was Art who noticed that this native didn't wear an earring. And then breathing began to get a bit hard for us. We'd been away from the ship over an hour, so we went back to the village to collect Lecky and take him to the ship. He was getting along so well that he hated to leave, but he was starting to pant too, so we talked him into it. He was wearing one of the earrings and said they'd given it to him as a present, and he'd made them a return present of a pocket slide rule he happened to have with him. Why a slide rule? I asked him. Those things cost money and we've got plenty of junk that would make them happier. Uh, that's what you think, he said. They figured out how to multiply and divide with it almost as soon as I showed it to them. I showed them how to extract square roots, and I was starting on cube roots when you fellows came back. I whistled and took a close look to see if maybe he was kidding me. He didn't seem to be. But I noticed that he was walking strangely and, well, acting just a bit strangely somehow. Although I couldn't put my finger on what it was. I decided finally that he was just a bit overexcited. This was Lecky's first trip off Earth, so that was natural enough. Inside the ship, as soon as Lecky got his breath back, the last hundred yards pretty well winded us, he started in to tell Haynes and Hilda Race about the Ganymedians. Most of it was too technical for me, but I got that they had some strange contradictions in them. As far as their way of life was concerned, they were more primitive than Australian bushmen. But they had brains and a philosophy and a knowledge of mathematics and pure science, they told him some strange things about atomic structure that excited hell out of him. He was in a dither to get back to Earth where he could get at equipment to check some of those things, and he said the earring was a sign of membership in the tribe. They'd acknowledged him as a friend and compatriot and whatnot by giving it to him. Blake asked, Was it gold? I'm coming to that, I told him. I was feeling cramped from sitting so long in one position on the bunk, and I stood up and stretched. There isn't much room to stretch in an asteroid tug and my hand hit against the pistol resting in the clips on the wall. I said, what's the pistol for, Blake? He shrugged. Rules. Has to be one hand weapon on every spacecraft. Heaven knows why on an asteroid ship, unless the council thinks someday an asteroid may get mad at us when we tow it out of orbit so it cracks up another. Say, did I ever tell you about the time we had a little 20-ton rock in tow and... Shut up, Blake, Charlie said. He's just getting to those damn earrings. Yeah, the earrings. I said. I took the pistol down from the wall and looked at it. It was an old-fashioned metal project weapon. Twenty shot, circa 2000. It was loaded and usable, but dirty. It hurts me to see a dirty gun. I went on talking, but I sat down on the bunk, took an old handkerchief out of my duffel box, and started to clean and polish the handgun while I talked. I said, He wouldn't let us take the earring off. Acted just a little funny about it when Haynes wanted to analyze the metal told Haynes he could get one of his own if he wanted to mess with it, and then he went back to rhapsodizing over the superior knowledge the Ganymedians had shown. Next day, all of them wanted to go to the village, but we'd made the rule that no more than three of the six of us would be outside the ship at once, and they'd have to take turns. Since Lecky could talk their grunt lingo, he and Hilda went first, and Art went along to guard them. Looked safe enough to work that proportion now, two scientists to one guard. Outside of that one native that had thrown a spear at Art and me, there hadn't been a sign of danger. And he looked like a halfwit and missed us by twenty feet anyway. We hadn't even bothered to shoot at him. They were back, panting for breath, in less than two hours. Hilda Race's eyes were shining and she was wearing one of the earrings in her left ear. She looked as proud as though it was a royal crown, making her Queen of Mars or something. She gushed about it, as soon as she got her wind back and stopped panting. I went on the next trip with Lecky and Haynes. Haynes was kind of grumpy for some reason, and said they weren't going to put one of those rings in his ear even if he did want one for analysis. They could just hand it to him or else. Again, nobody paid much attention to me after we got there, and I wandered around the village. I was on the outskirts of it when I heard a yell, and I ran back to the center of town but fast, because it sounded like Haynes. There was a crowd around a spot in the middle of, well, call it the compound. It took me a minute to wedge my way through, scattering natives to all sides as I went. And when I got to the middle of things, Haynes was just getting up, and there was a big stain of red on the front of his white linen coat. I grabbed him to help him up and said, Haynes, what's the matter? You hurt? He shook his head slowly as though he was kind of dazed, and then he said, oh, I'm all right, Hank. I'm all right. I just stumbled and fell. 
Then he saw me looking at the red stain and smiled. I guess it was a smile, but it didn't look natural. He said, that's not blood, Hank. Some native red wine I happened to spill, part of the ceremony. I started to ask what ceremony, and then I saw he was wearing one of the gold earrings. I thought that was damned funny. But he started talking to Lecky, and he looked and acted all right. Well, fairly all right. Lecky was telling him what a few of the grunts meant, and he acted awful interested. But somehow I got the idea he was pretending most of that interest so he wouldn't have to talk to me. He acted as though he was thinking hard inside, and maybe he was making up a better story to cover that stain on his clothes and the fact that he had changed his mind so quick about the earring. I was getting the notion that something was rotten in the state of Ganymede, but I didn't know what. I decided to keep my yap shut and my eyes open till I found out. I'd have plenty of time to study Haynes later, though, so I wandered off again to the edge of the village and just outside it. And it occurred to me that if there was anything I wasn't supposed to see, I might stand a better chance of seeing it if I got under cover. There were plenty of bushes around, and I picked out a good clump of them and hid. From the way my lungs worked, I figured I had maybe a half hour before we'd have to start back for the ship. And less than half that time had gone by before I saw something. I stopped talking to hold the pistol up to the light and squint through the barrel. It was getting pretty clean, but there were a couple of spots left up near the muzzle end. Blake said, Let me guess, you saw a Martian traghound standing on his tail singing Annie Laurie. Worse than that, I said. I saw one of those Ganymede natives get his legs bit off, and it annoyed him. It would annoy anyone, said Blake. Even me, and I'm a pretty mild-tempered guy. What bit them off? I never found out. I told him. It was something underwater. There was a stream there going by the village, and there must have been something like crocodiles in it. Two natives came out of the village and started to wade across the stream. About halfway over, one of them gave a yelp and went down. The other grabbed him and pulled him up on the bank, and both his legs were gone just above the knees. And the damnedest thing happened. The native, with his legs off, stood up on the stumps of them and started talking, or grunting quite calmly to his companion, who grunted back. And if tone of voice meant anything, he was annoyed. Nothing more. He tried walking on the stumps of his legs and found he couldn't go very fast. And then he gave a gesture that looked for all the world like a shrug, and reached up and took off his earring and held it out to the other native. And then came the strangest part. The other native took it, and the very instant the ring left the hand of the first one, the one with his legs off, he fell down dead. The other one picked up the corpse and threw it in the water and went on. And as soon as he was out of sight, I went back to get Lecky and Haynes and take them to the ship. They were ready to leave when I got there. I thought I was worried a bit, but I hadn't seen anything yet. Not till I started back to the ship with Lecky and Haynes. Haynes, first thing I noticed, had the stain gone from the front of his coat. Wine, or whatever it was, somebody would managed to get it out for him, and the coat wasn't even wet. But it was torn, pierced. I hadn't noticed that before. But there was a place there that looked like a spear had gone through his coat. And then he happened to get in front of me, and I saw that there was another tear or rip just like it in the back of his coat. Taken together, it was like somebody pushed a spear through him from front to back, when he'd yelled. But if a spear had gone through him like that, then he was dead. And there he was, walking ahead of me back to the ship, with one of those earrings in his left ear. And I couldn't help but remember about that native and the thing in the river. That native was sure enough dead, too, with his legs off like that. But he hadn't found it out until he had handed that earring away. I can tell you I was plenty thoughtful that evening, watching everybody, and it seemed to me they were all acting strange, especially Hilda. You'd have to watch a hippopotamus acting kittenish to get an idea. Haynes and Lecky seemed thoughtful and subdued, like they were planning something, maybe. After a while, Art came up from the glory hole, and he was wearing one of those rings. Gave me a kind of shiver to realize that, if what I was thinking could possibly be true, then there was only me and Dick left. And I'd better start comparing notes with Dick pretty soon. He was working on a report, but I knew pretty soon he'd make his routine inspection trip through the storerooms before turning in, and I'd corner him then. Meanwhile, I watched the other four, and I got surer and surer and more and more scared. They were trying their darndest to act natural, but once in a while, one of them would slip. For one thing, they'd forget to talk. I mean, one of them would turn to another as though he was saying something, but he wouldn't. 
and then, as though remembering, he'd start in the middle of it, like he'd been talking without words before telepathically. And pretty soon, Dick gets up and goes out, and I followed him. We got to one of the side storerooms, and I closed the door. Dick, I asked, have you noticed it? And he wanted to know what I was talking about. So I told him. I said, those four people out there, they aren't the ones we started with. What happened to Art and Hilda and Lecky and Haynes? What the hell goes on here? Haven't you noticed anything out of the ordinary? And Dick sighed, kind of, and said, Well, it didn't work. We need more practice, then. Come on, and we'll tell you all about it. And he opened the door and held out his hand to me, and the sleeve of his shirt pulled back a little from the wrist, and he was wearing one of those gold things like the others, only he was wearing it as a bracelet instead of an earring. I, well, I was too dumbfounded to say anything. I didn't take the hand he held out, but I followed him back into the main room. And then, while Lecky, who seemed to be the leader, I think, held a gun on me, they told me about it. And it was even screwier and worse than I'd dare guess. They didn't have any name for themselves because they had no language, what you'd really call a spoken or written language of their own. You see, they were telepathic, and you don't need a language for that. If you tried to translate their thought for themselves, the nearest word you could find for it would be we, the first person plural pronoun. Individually, they identified themselves to one another by numbers rather than names. And just as they had no language of their own, they had no real bodies of their own, nor active minds of their own. They were parasitic in a sense that Earthmen can't conceive. They were entities, apart from... Well, it's difficult to explain, but in a way they had no real existence when not attached to a body they could animate and think with. The easiest way to put it is that a detached uh, earring god, which is what the Ganymedian natives called them, was asleep, dormant, ineffective, had no power of thought or motion in itself. Charlie and Blake were looking bewildered. Charlie said, You're trying to say, Hank, that when one of them came in contact with a person... They took over that person and ran him and thought with his mind, but, uh, kept their own identity? And what happened to the person they took over? I said, as near as I can make out, he stayed there too, as it were, but was dominated by the entity. I mean, there remained all his memories and his individuality, but something else was in the driver's seat, running him. Didn't matter whether he was alive or dead, either, as long as his body wasn't in too bad shape. Like Haynes... They had to kill him to put an earring on him. He was dead and that if the ring was removed, he'd have fallen flat and never got up again, unless it was put back. Like the native whose legs had been cut off, the entity running him had decided the body was no longer practicable for use, so he handed himself back to the other natives, see? And they'd find another body in better shape for him to use. They didn't tell me where they came from, except that it was outside the solar system, nor just how they got to Ganymede. Not by themselves, though, because they couldn't even exist by themselves. They must have got as far as Ganymede as parasites of visitors that had landed there at some time or other, maybe millions of years ago. And they couldn't get off Ganymede, of course, till we landed there. Space travel hadn't developed on Ganymede. Charles interrupted me again. But if they were so smart, why didn't they develop it themselves? They couldn't, I told him. They weren't any smarter than the minds they occupied. Well, a little smarter in a way, because they could use those minds to their full capacity. And people, terrestrial or Ganymedian, don't do that. But even the full capacity of the mind of a Ganymedian savage wasn't sufficient to develop a spaceship. But now they had us. I mean, they had Lecky and Haynes and Hilda and Art and Dick. And they had our spaceship. And they were going to Earth, because they knew all about it and about conditions there from our minds. They planned simply to take over Earth and, uh, run it. They didn't explain the details of how they propagate, but I gathered that there wouldn't be any shortage of earrings to go around on Earth. Earrings or bracelets or however they'd attach themselves. Bracelets, probably, or arm or leg bands, because wearing earrings like that would be too conspicuous on Earth, and they'd have to work in secret for a while, take over a few people at a time without letting the others know what was going on, and Lecky or the thing that was running Lecky, told me they'd been using me as a guinea pig, that they could have put a ring on me, take me over at any time. But they wanted a check on how they were doing at imitating normal people. They wanted to know whether or not I got suspicious and guessed the truth. So Dick, 
or the thing that was running him, had kept himself out of sight under Dick's sleeve. So if I got suspicious of the others, I'd talk it over with Dick, just as I really did do. And that let them know they needed a lot more practice animating those bodies before they took the ship back to Earth to start their campaign there. And well, that was the whole story, and they told it to me to watch my reactions, as a normal human. And then Lecky took a ring out of his pocket and held it out to me with one hand, keeping the pistol on me with the other hand. He told me I might as well put it on, because if I didn't, he could shoot me first and then put it on me, but that they greatly preferred to take over undamaged bodies, and that it would be better for me too if I, that is, my body, didn't die first. Naturally, I didn't see it that way. I pretended to reach out for the ring, hesitantly, but instead I batted the gun out of his hand and made a dive for it as it hit the floor. I got it too, just as they all came for me, and I fired three shots into them before I saw that it wasn't even annoying them. Damn it, the only way you can stop a body animated by one of those rings is to make it fix it so it can't move, like cutting off the legs or something. A bullet in the heart doesn't worry it. But I backed to the door and got out of it, out into the Ganymedian night, without even a coat on. It was colder than hell, too. And after I got out there, there just wasn't any place to go, except back in the ship. And I wasn't going there. They didn't come after me, didn't bother to. They knew that within three hours... Four at the outside, I'd be unconscious from insufficient oxygen. If the cold or something else didn't get me first. Maybe there was some way out, but I didn't see one. I just sat down on a stone about a hundred yards from the ship and tried to think of something I could do, but I didn't go anywhere with the butt, and there was a moment's silence, and then Charlie said, Well? And Blake said, What did you do? Nothing, I said. I couldn't think of a thing to do. I just sat there. Till morning? No, I lost consciousness before morning. I came to while it was still dark in the ship. Blake was looking at me with a puzzled frown. He said, The hell? You mean... And then Charlie let out a sudden yip and dived headfirst out of the bunk he'd been lying on and grabbed the gun out of my hand. I'd just finished cleaning it and slipped the cartridge clip back in. And then, with it in his hand, he stood there staring at me as though he'd never seen me before. Blake said, Sit down, Charlie. Don't you know when you're being ribbed? But uh, better keep the gun just the same. Charlie kept the gun all right and turned it around to point at me. He said, I'm making a damn fool out of myself all right, but Hank, roll up your sleeves. I grinned and stood up. I said, don't forget my ankles, too. But there was something dead serious in his face, and I didn't push him too far. Blake said, he could even have it on him somewhere else with that adhesive tape. I mean, on the million-to-one chance that he wasn't kidding. Charlie nodded without turning to look at Blake. He said, Hank, I hate to ask it, but... I sighed and then chuckled. I said, well, I was just going to take a shower anyway. It was hot in the ship, and I was wearing only shoes and a pair of coveralls. Paying no attention to Blake and Charlie, I slipped them off and stepped through the oil-silk curtains of the little shower cubicle and turned on the water. Over the sound of the shower, I could hear Blake laughing and Charlie cursing softly to himself. And when I came out of the shower, drying myself, even Charlie was grinning. Blake said, And I thought that yarn Charlie just told was a dilly. This trip is backwards. We'll end up having to tell each other the truth. There was a sharp rapping on the hull beside the airlock, and Charlie Dean went to open it. He growled, If you tell Zeb and Ray what chumps you made out of us, I'll beat your damn ears in. You and your earring gods. Portion of telepathic report of number 67843 on asteroid J864A to number 5463 on Terra. As planned, I tested credulity of terrestrial minds by telling them the true story of what happened on Ganymede, found them capable of acceptance thereof. This proves that our idea of embedding ourselves within the flesh of these terrestrial creatures was an excellent one, and is essential to the success of our plan. True, this is less simple than our method on Ganymede, but we must continue to perform the operation upon each terrestrial being as we take him over. Bracelets or other appendages would arouse suspicion. There is no necessity in wasting a month here. I shall now take command of the ship and return. We will report no ore present here. The four of us who will animate the four terrestrials now aboard this ship will report to you on Terra. End of And the Gods Laughed by Frederick Brown
When the Sun Went Out by Leslie F. Stone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Doug Wade. When the Sun Went Out by Leslie F. Stone. The dying earth lay wrapped in its dismal coat of what was soon to be the complete darkness of a sunless world. Just as she no longer had the moon, her lamp of ages, to light the night skies as she whirled on her course through the limitless ocean of space, so now she was about to lose the sun which, after billions of years, was at last burning out. Cold, somber darkness of everlasting night was to engulf the eight planets to which old soul had once given heat and light. History tells of the sun in all its glory, of a bright, warm earth, of joy on the globe. It tells, too, of the moon, a shell set aglow by the sun's rays and reflecting on earth the beauty of silvery light. But with the light from the sun growing more and more feeble through the preceding thousands of years, the night's fixture had faded, too, until now it was no more than a dark body flitting past by day. Only at times during the night did a stray gleam of the sun illuminate, for a fleeting moment, the dead face as a shadow passing across the white ice scapes. Now there were only stars, distant and aloof, smiling disdainfully upon the senile planet Earth to light her night and her day, too. In Central City, most of the few hundred thousands of people who now comprised the entire world's population had already gathered. The rest were hastening to join the multitude, so that together they might watch the sun in the throes of death. Then they would make their descent to the bowels of the Earth, wherein the once proud Earthlings planned to make their last stand against their arch-enemy, nature. Quila Ray was one of the tardy ones. As his name denoted, he was of the race of astronomers. He was the last to leave Mount 83, upon whose summit he and his fellow scientists had for many years kept the sun under surveillance, publishing their minute calculations as to the hourly condition of the waning star. Quila, like many, objected strenuously to his removal to thousands of feet below the Earth's crust. He knew that several centuries before, the Earth had been warned of the critical state of the sun. Then had been the time for action. However, for the last million of years, the Earth's people had been retrograding, and now, except for a few hundred men and women of Quila's ilk, were mental and physical weaklings. They had been content to live on what their mighty ancestors had provided for them, using only what knowledge had come to them through the ages, and making no attempt to improve their condition. Now, through their lack of energy and foresight, what machines they possessed were gradually wearing away. One by one, those gigantic monsters that had for thousands of years been producing all of man's needs were breaking down because of the failure of their parts. From time to time, men with some mechanical genius had repaired here and there. But, as the years went on, the knowledge of these men was lost until now the world was faced at last with the fact that they had practically no hope of succor from their present condition. A hope. What they were to do when the last machine halted forever, when those machines would no longer turn out their barest necessities, they were not able to conceive. In fact, they gave no thought to the future at all. These simple-minded offsprings of the mechanical geniuses of the world existed, living on the fruits of the machines that produced foods and materials from the air, as well as the soil, and from minerals dug from the Earth's core. And now the sun, from which much of the energy that drove these machines was obtained, was dying. The sun would be a sun no longer. It would become cool and perhaps foster new life in its tepid waters, life that would after ages crawl out upon a new, as yet unlighted land. However, as always in man's history, time and time again, it was in dire need that his supremacy eventually asserted himself. And such was now the case. A few men of stronger will and greater intellect had realized the state of affairs into which they were being plunged, and under the inspiration for the past fifteen years, a new activity had seized the earthlings. Those who still possessed an understanding of mechanics were called forth. Together they built new machines out of the scraps of the old, and with these commenced digging day and night a shaft in the earth that was to be the salvation of mankind. Without a doubt, the earthlings could not abide any longer on the surface of the earth. Year after year, great fields of ice had come down from the Northlands, gradually encompassing the land, driving its peoples further and further into the south. They were increasing in such numbers that their cold was taking hold on the earth and the sun's weak rays could not stave them off. It would only be a question of time before the narrow belt of the equator that was alone untouched would be conquered by the great ice flow. There had been some talk of building machines that would carry them away from Mother Earth to a new planet and a new sun. But the wisest men knew the futility of such a course. True, history did tell of such attempts. Some had been successful, some not. Yet that had been in a day when men who understood such machines had lived, and they had not been built in a moment or a day. To build ships that could bear them millions of miles through space was too difficult a feat for people who had just awakened from a lethargy in which they had dreamed and played for many centuries. For the present, only one course was open. Then when man was more fully awakened, he might make other plans. Already man had reached the depth of almost a thousand miles below the surface. 
New machines were hollowing out great caves in the Earth's bowels in which the present population hoped to survive. The construction of the machines of the past now being studied from the records that remained, new discoveries were made, and it looked as though mankind were taking a new lease upon life. After the first shaft had been driven, a second was started. It had been found that at this depth, the temperature was a little below the normal heat required for the comfort of man, but until better provision could be made, it would be necessary to make that do. Heating apparatus would be installed, lights, sewerage, everything to make the underground caves livable, and then with the years to come, men would continue to dig deeper as the cold of the ice-coated earth penetrated. Giant caves were being hewn out of the living rock to house the 500,000 souls that now made up the populace of the world. As each cave was dug, it was lined with ega, a glass-like substance that was sprayed from the mouth of a machine and which hardened into a hard, almost impregnable shell and coated to a uniform thickness and smoothness. For the present, the sole idea was to provide room enough for the world's inhabitants to seek protection from the wretchedness and bitter chill of the Earth's surface. Everything must be upon a communistic basis, and so many people allotted to each giant cave. Later, small caves were to be hewn out for individual comfort and privacy, but that would take time. Underground, many obstacles barred their way. Subterranean rivers were a source of trouble and sometimes disaster to the diggers, but with their newly discovered ingenuity, the workers learned to overcome and divert them to their own purposes. Sinkholes, crumbling rocks, and other calamities often retarded progress, but sometimes Mother Nature presented them with a few of the gifts that were still left in her cornucopia. There were natural caves, a deposit of precious metals, and barriers that fell without man's efforts. Quila Ray. Thus had twenty great caves been dug out when at last word came from the astronomers that the sun's power could not possibly survive the week. Night and day the work continued so that thousands might be made fairly comfortable. There was much lamenting on Earth's crust as the world watched the fading of the sun. It was hard enough to lose the warmth of the sun, but to have to creep into the damp cellar of the Earth was almost too much for the soft men and women who had lived luxuriously under the shadow of mighty machines that had given them all. Quila Ray, journeying in his flyer from the observatory wherein he had spent almost his whole life since he had emerged from the city of children, thought of all this. The flyer had been built several thousand years before. Once it had been the very latest type of lighter-than-air machines that science had produced. And it still was, for no better had been brought forth since. It sat like a bubble on the thin air of the globe, and in form it resembled a bubble. It was a perfect globe, fashioned from a material that resembled glass, but its qualities were as different from that brittle, splintery material as night was unlike the day. Alu, the ancients called it, and it was as transparent as the air, yet as strong as earth itself, malleable as clay and lighter than air. The greatest weight could not smash or crush it, the sharpest point could not even scratch its surface. Within this indestructible chamber sat Coyle Ray on a seat covered with a leathery material whose back could be let down for sleeping purposes. His feet rested on a similar pad, and on a bar in front of him that extended from side to side were placed the various levers that controlled the machine. Under the seat was fitted the motor contained in a small metal box, taking up no more than a cubic foot of space. The oxygen tank twice the size of the motor stood nearby. Flying thousands of feet above the ground, man had found that the thinning atmosphere was too rare, and each flyer was consequently supplied with its own oxygen tank containing enough of the precious gas to sustain the pilot for 100 hours. An open valve in the side of the globe allowed enough of the poor grade of air to flow from the outside to the tank and thence into the globe, reviving the air sufficiently to have the proper proportions needed for the driver. The motor, ingenious and yet of a marvelous simplicity, used for its fuel the carbon dioxide expelled by the occupant of the machine, thus also keeping the air clean and fresh. Through another vent, the motor tossed off its waste. On entering his flyer, Quila had set the indicator for Central City and had turned the height gauge to the altitude he knew it best to fly. He had no more to do but wait until he arrived at his destination. Had he been able to see the ground over which he was flying, at a height necessary to avoid the irregularity of Earth's surface, he would not have been interested in the least. For where ages before had flourished beautiful trees and wild jungle verdure, where jeweled pools had laid dimpling in the sun, where brilliant birds and chattering monkeys had lived joyously, in that part of the world that had once been called Brazil, there was nothing now other than a wasteland, gray, bleak and cold, its face like the worn, wrinkled visage of the old. Quila had with him a collection of ancient books and archives that he had discovered during his life. Many hours he had studied them, and in those hours he had lived not in the barren world of today, but in the beautiful sunlit years that had gone before. In his books he had read of the glory of the sun, of the vast, ever-moving waters, all ice now, of green, happy lands, of the moon that had once lighted the sky at night. Ah, if only he could journey to a world that was f as fresh and as young. 
not until he felt the growing stuffiness in his machine, due to the accumulation of carbon dioxide no longer being used by his motor, did he realize that he had come to a stop and that he was floating like a bubble over the city. Like every man-made structure that still existed, Central City had been built in the far-off past. Here had been the core of the once great realm of the Earth. Here sat the five, scientists all, who directed the welfare of mankind. Here had the greatest of men lived. Building after building rose thousands of feet in the air, each building an entire community in itself, joined to its neighbors by numberless airways for both pedestrian, ground, and air cars. Several great arteries were still used by the small population of the city. But for the most part, the city that had once housed 30 millions lay as dead, the skyscrapers untenanted and cold, although to this day there was still no sign of decay. One could pass from chamber to chamber and find the belongings of their past owners neatly in order. The decay of the race had been gradual. There had been no hurried flight, only the slow disintegration of a well-satisfied people. Quila Ray maneuvered his flyer gently down the roof of perhaps the most gigantic skyscraper in the city. As he drew near, he saw the roofs of the surrounding buildings, as well as the one to which he was descending, were crowded with people. Room was cleared for his machine close to the hangar, and a small group detached themselves to aid him in pushing the machine under cover. An aged man standing nearby spoke to him. It is the last time you shall fly through the air of this condemned world, O Ray, he murmured and sighed. Quila scowled at the reminder of that fact and pushed himself into the heart of the crowd. He found his way to one of the kiosks that housed an elevator, and stepping in it, he pressed an indicator for a floor a thousand feet below. The drop occupied less than a minute, and he was in a corridor. He hurried along to an office wherein several people were still lingering. In the center of the room stood a machine with a mouthpiece on its face, and into this he dictated his report. He stated his name, age, and occupation, and explained that he had been the last to leave the observatory of Mount 83, that it was in perfect condition, a condition, he conjectured, that would withstand the ice flow that was slowly surmounting the peak on which the observatory stood. His report ended, he turned away. He knew that the machine would relay his report to an adjoining office, write it in indelible ink on a thin metal sheet, and file it away with similar reports in alphabetical and chronological order. A Beautiful Companion with that done, he left the office, returning to the shaft by which he descended. A girl was walking ahead of him, and they both reached the lift almost at the same moment. She was dressed exactly as Quila Ray, and on her shoulder he described the insignia the same as he wore, the insignia of the astronomers. The suits of the earthlings were made of a material that transmitted no heat, holding the normal body heat of the wearer. It was in two pieces, blouse and trousers. The trousers, almost skin-tight, fitted snugly at the hips. They were designed so as to contain the feet, and under the feet were sewn heavy pieces of felt that fitted the foot. The blouse was loose to give free movement to the torso. It fell straight from the shoulder halfway to the thighs and was caught tightly at the waist with a girdle. The sleeves hung rather full from shoulder to wrist and were buckled tightly, while the collar, rather high, fitted the neck closely. From the shoulders hung a hood that would be pulled over the head and fitted tightly about the face and chin. From it, a mask could be drawn over the face to protect it in cases of extreme cold, and to the mask were fastened small tubes for nose and mouth. These could be attached to an oxygen tank that the wearer could carry on his shoulders. Gloves were carried in one of the slip pockets of the blouse. Quila followed the girl into the elevator, and they came face to face. He was struck by the exquisite beauty of her clear features, a beauty that was striking even among a people who were all beautiful. Her skin was a warm olive, a complexion that had been evolved from the admixture of the five original races upon Earth. Her eyes were clear hazel, her lips a deep red. Each feature was as perfect as though hand-chiseled, from the little square chin to the fine, sensitive eyebrows and smooth white temples. And framing it all was the hair of a rich blackness. Once, human hair entailed the constant need of trimming, but science had easily done away with that inconvenience by the simple means of the T-ray. When the T-ray was trained on the hair and beard by means of a cap-shaped helmet, it not only halted the natural growth of the roots, but at the same time treated them so that in a lifetime not a single hair could fall from the scalp. In response to his smile, the girl smiled back brightly. I suppose we are both ascending to the roof, she queried in a low, well-modulated voice that was strangely thrilling to a man who had not heard a woman's voice in over ten years. He nodded, and she touched the lever that should carry them upward. The lift traveled fast, but in the thousand-foot ascent there was still time for Quila Ray to learn that the girl was Ramo Ray, and that she had returned from Mount 47, whereupon was set an observatory like the one he had just left, that she had been associated with only two women and two men, all of whom had already passed the third cycle, 150 years of age, and so therefore she had taken no companion, mate, and was like himself, quite alone in the new world they were to enter. They were not immediately aware that the elevator had stopped. Only when the steady murmur of voices came to them from without did they realize that they had reached the roof. 
Quila managed to elbow his way through the crowd and found for them an unoccupied spot in a secluded part of the parapet. It was now almost time for the rising of the sun. Once, the annals of history showed, the Earth had known approximately 12 hours of daylight. But gradually, through the ages, the periods of day had grown shorter until now, at the present time, there was scarcely one short hour of light. This was due to the fact that the sun was no longer a ball of fire, that only two spots still burned on its wide expanses. A month since, the smaller of the two spots had burned out, and now it was but a question of hours before the other spot would give its last flicker. A stillness pervaded the towering roofs, and here and there a few groups could be seen whispering. On the left was the building now occupied by the 27,000 children who had been brought from the city of children, and their sweet, fresh voices could be heard in song as they greeted the wan light. Almost a billion years ago, the ancestors of these children had sung in the same manner to the sun to give them light and keep them in health. In their corner, Ramo and Quila were speaking in subdued tones. There was much for them to tell each other, and the affinity which had drawn them together was strengthened as they learned that they had many interests in common. She, too, had gathered books of the past, and they both longed to see a sun in all its wonder and feel its warmth surge through their veins. I contend, said Quila, that we make a mistake in descending to the Earth's core. It would be far better that we migrate to another universe that has a sun that is still young. He saw the light that came into her eyes at his words. She nodded her head in approbation. I, too, Quila Ray, have had such dreams. At night, when I was alone at the sky eyes, I studied the various planets and universes for the possibility of transferring ourselves to another world. Buick Gray, head astronomer of Mount 47, and I have studied the proposition from all angles, and he agrees it is feasible. Only we are not yet equipped for such an expedition. Long ago, we might have profited by the knowledge of our forefathers and traversed space at will. Now, instead, we must begin all over again to learn what they had so gladly prepared for us. Then you do believe there is a possibility. Is anything impossible? Further discussion was halted at that moment by the cry that had gone up from the 500,000 earthlings gathered on the rooftops. There had been a change in the somber darkness enclosing them. A pale grayish light was now visible in the eastern sky. The sun, the blessed sun, cried the voices. Gradually the light became brighter, and then on the eastern horizon appeared the sun, but oh, so different from the old bright sun. Once it had been globe-shaped, dazzling bright, so that the eyes could not look upon it. Now all that remained of the old fire was one strange, ragged streak of light that ran vertically up the surface of the globe, and so weak and feeble was that single streak that it looked wan and livid. There was no rosy haze to accompany this dawn. All was gray, stark, nude. The hour was passing, and, as they watched, the onlookers could see that the white streak that was the sun was gradually turning on its axis so that the single burning spot would soon be hidden from the sight of those on Earth, and it would be many, many hours before the Earthlings would catch sight of it again. The grayness was gradually fading into the darkness again. The myriad of stars overhead continued to gleam, sparkling in all their splendor, twinkling like the eyes of a man overcome by laughter laughing at the plight of a doomed world. With sighs and low murmurings, the crowds dispersed from the rooms. Ramo and Quila did not leave yet. The earth may grow senile, but youth tells the same old story, and the two had much to tell each other. Astronomers both, they spoke the same language, had the same hopes and desires, and then they were young. Two hours later, they agreed to descend from the roof. As they had just arrived in the city, neither had taken up new quarters as yet, and they went down to the office where they would be assigned quarters. They had but to speak their name, number, and rating into a machine like the one to which they had already reported, and in answer came a small piece of circular metal having upon it, in the strange numerical writing of that day, their new address. Each giant building was a city in itself. Each had its auditorium where gathered for general announcements, amusements, lectures, and discussions the tenants of the building. There were large conservatories where was planted what verdure and vegetation had been preserved through the centuries. A few birds and smaller animals had been kept alive in the same container. Canned sunlight, the light of the sun that had been gathered by scientists many years before and stored in giant vats, took the place of the ineffectual sun. Here people spent much of their time. The Home of the Five Another floor was devoted entirely to a commissary to provide the building with its necessities. Three entire floors were devoted to the offices that recorded automatically every small detail in the life of its tenants. The remaining floors were given over to living quarters. This particular building, which now housed Quila and Ramo, was the scientific building, and herein dwelt all those who belonged to one branch of science or another. Once every building in the city had been filled to capacity, and there had been a continual overflowing into new buildings. But in the centuries that had just preceded this, the population of the world had diminished so greatly that city after city had been deserted until only Central City and the City of Children were inhabited. In Central City, there was one building that differed from the others. This odd building formed the nucleus of the city, and was reckoned, for that matter, the center of the world for from it emanated the life of the world and its government. This was the residence of the five. Many millions of years before, four scientists had revolutionized the civilized world. 
they had provisioned a world subjugated by the Yellow Wraiths, and to avoid that, they had overthrown the entire world, destroyed its antiquated civilization, and set up a new government with scientists at the head instead of kings. Only by the effort of a young man was a catastrophe that would have entirely depopulated the world averted. Thereafter, the youth was added to the Quaternion, and henceforth it became a Quinvate and had continued so to this day. The five were sufficient unto themselves, directing the destinies of their world, choosing from each generation a new member to succeed the old, and governed only by their high sense of duty to their fellow man. As the new member was recruited from the younger generation, he, or she, for sex to be no difference, was taught the high principles of the order, bringing with him a fresh sense of justice and knowledge of the world he had been a part of. Thence he studied with his elders, so that, when he was aged and called upon a youth to succeed him, he had much to impart. As the man was sure to live well past his 200th year, he had great knowledge, experience, and understanding to pass on to his juniors. The building that housed the five was only ten stories high. One floor was given over to a common council chamber, the second to private council rooms, rooms for the guards and offices. Two more floors were laboratories, and might be likened to a patent office where all new inventions, new innovations were investigated, tried, and proven as to their practicability. Here the various members of the five spent much of their own time working, improving, giving the products of their mind to civilization. The next five floors belonged to the five exclusively. Here they had privacy, each one having one entire floor for himself and his attendants. The tenth floor was their mutual meeting ground. Here was their common lounge and their conservatory. They also had a roof promenade, but that was covered over with unbreakable glass, and guards passed up and down day and night. The five dressed exactly as did their fellow men, without mark of distinction. Only with them the mask was always worn over the face, and they never moved about unless under a heavy guard. When once a man or woman took the sacred oath of the quinvate, all ties were cut. Friends were forgotten, mother and father they had never known, mates were discarded like all else. Thus, once in a generation, a fellow being might drop out of his sphere and never be seen again. One time friends may conjecture that he who had so excelled in his line of endeavor had reached the zenith and he'd been chosen by the five. But one could never be positive. Perhaps the friend had been transferred to a station across the world to carry on their work as heretofore. Hence the mask, that none might claim friendship with any member of the five and retard the wheels of justice. For first of all, the five were the judges to decree life and death. Once some fanatic who imagined an enemy of his to have been elevated to that high position had, with an infernal machine, managed to almost demolish the center, killing two of the five. That was the greatest catastrophe to have happened to them, and it took years to recover from the effects. It took vigilance and extreme care to prevent the recurrence of that same action. For the past several thousand centuries, the five had not been the august body as heretofore. Recruited from a decaying race, they had been merely representative of it. However, it was through the efforts of the newest recruit that the program of today was brought about, that the new machinery had been brought into being, that new heart was taken by the populace. After receiving cards with their room numbers upon them, Ramo Ray and Quila Ray separated and agreed to meet again and go together to the council chamber where a meeting was scheduled to take place in ten hours. Last Hours Quila repaired to the room given him, identical to all other living rooms in Central City. In measurement, the room was 15 by 15 and 12 feet high. At first glance, the walls were a buff color, but after a few moments in the room under the glow of the light that appeared to emanate from the walls themselves, it was evident that they were changing color. A pink flush was creeping over them, a pink that deepened to a rose to be saved from red by the appearance of another hue, a delicate blue, that from dark blue became a light green and so through the spectrum of colors. Ages ago, man had discovered the effects of color upon his nervous system and knew that the monotony of any one shade would eventually drive him mad. Therefore, as one by one the colors of nature disappeared around him, he set about producing a riot of color about him. Everything he made was colored with a pigment, which, in the light, brought out the seven colors and all the delicate shades between them. Even clothes had the faculty to change minutely. In shape, the room was square, and yet the corners were built with a curve that gave the room a graceful line. Its furnishings were of the simplest. There were low couches padded with soft felt-like material, and like the walls, it changed color continually. These couches, fashioned so as to give a perfect ease to the body, were shaped to its curves and angularities, and were used both as beds as well as for relaxation, serving for the awkward chair of the ancient. Several low tables, hardly a foot high, served as desks or to hold a few simple though colorful ornaments. One wall of the room was given almost entirely over to a large mirror-like surface that gave no reflection. But by touching a small lever on its side, it gave the onlooker all the news of the world, like the news reels of old, by which ages ago one might sit back and watch the progress of the world. A simple attachment gave forth sound so that music, lectures, and various sound arrangements came to the listener. Now men seldom used this medium, for, in a world that comprised only two cities and a few outposts, there was little news to broadcast besides that which went by word of mouth or could be announced in the city streets and auditoriums. Adjoining the single room was a small bathroom with all its necessary features, and on the far side of the room was a small closet. Herein were three faucets and a cupboard. 
One faucet gave water, and the other two faucets each emitted a liquid food that was the mainstay of the Earth's thousands. Once man ate the flesh of animals, but animals, as well as leaves, fruits, and roots of grasses and vegetation had passed away. Man had discovered thereafter that the food products of trees, and later of minerals, were even more highly efficient, and though man lost sense of taste, he gained a better store of body energy. The machinery that produced the tasteless liquids also brought forth cubes of highly concentrated food that was preserved in this manner for indefinite periods. And, as one cube a day together with a measure of liquid is sufficient for the human, it was possible to carry several months' supply on one person without taking up much space. Consequently, the pleasure of eating had been lost, but the triple deficiency of the food overcame that loss. Kila Ray drew a glass of the colorless liquid that was hot to the taste, and then threw himself on a couch. He did not sleep immediately, dreaming rather of the girl he had just left. Soon, however, sleep claimed him. He was awakened by a metallic voice near at hand, coming from a small instrument on one of the nearby tables that informed him that the hour of the meeting in the auditorium was at hand. He found Ramo Ray at the place they had named for their tryst, and together the pair took their places on the benches arranged to seat the several thousand the building was housing. They were addressed by an official who spoke of what the machines had been doing in the bowels of the earth, of what they would find in their new home, of what would be the duty of every man and woman. It was not a beautiful prospect he painted for them, but then there was no reason to paint the picture any brighter than it was. He explained that everyone was to carry on the type of work that he was accustomed to atop the earth, and for those whose type of employment would be of no use under the earth's crust, new work should be found. Ramo and Kila turned to each other with a question. What could they, the astronomers, do now? It would take years before shafts could be dug through the earth back to the summits of the mountains where on stood the observatories. Well, whatever might come, it was certain that the twain should stick together. They went into a conservatory and strolled there together for hours. Then, when the hour of dawn was again at hand, they repaired to the roof. Two more days passed in the same manner, and on the third day, word was noised about that the last hour was at hand. The sun was in its death throes. The two went to their place at the parapet. The crowds were silent now, holding their breath. Gradually the sky was becoming gray, but a sickly gray, watery and pale. Nothing was distinct in the poor light. Eyes strained to catch the first glow of the single flame of light, and a volume of sound went up when it at last appeared. Its light was very faint, so faint that it looked no brighter than the glow of a distant star. Then suddenly it all changed. It grew brighter and brighter, that streak of red growing brighter, still brighter. It looked suddenly as if the whole star was aflame again. Who said the sun was dying? A cry went up from the rooftops. The multitude could feel the warmth from that bright fire. Brighter, ever brighter, a single flame pushed out, reaching out, growing brighter and brighter. Someone screamed, that flame, the sun is coming to consume us. Hail, O sun, take us to your heart. Devour us in your last burst of glory. The flame, however, appeared to have spent itself. It was dwindling once more. The sun was dying. That burst of light had been the sun's last burst of glory. Low murmurings arose from the cloud. Someone commenced to sing a dirge, and all took it up as they watched the flame growing smaller, smaller. Then the light was gone. Only a faint grayness persisted, but that too died. Several minutes more, and a darkness gathered in, a darkness that was never to be dispelled again. Into the Depths The stars seemed creeping closer so that they might see and jeer at Mother Earth. A voice broke loose from the rooftops again. Come, let us creep like ants into our holes and burrow into the heart of our mother. Come, come, you poor weak things that proudly term yourself man, lord of the universe. Creep into the darkness. Come now, out of this bitter coldness that you would grasp you by the throat. Come, all of you that would play at limbing. Come. A death-like silence settled over the multitude. Then voices were heard again, whisperings and comfortings, and a wail that grew in volume until it seemed to encircle the earth. The cry of a people forsaken, broken. On the roof of one building, a commotion started, then a yell and a scream and a body went hurtling over the roof, down the several thousand feet to the ground. Another followed, and another as men and women despairingly threw themselves over the parapets. More might have followed had not a figure of command appeared on the highest pinnacle of the roof of the scientific building. Come, to the lifts, we descend to our new home, my people, he cried out. Come, new life awaits us, come. In answer, the crowds became milling masses as they made their way to the elevators. Forgotten were the weaklings who could not face life any longer, and those who had thought to do the same turned instead to the voice of command. Ramo and Kila were amongst the last to descend. They had been as breathless as their fellow men at the appearance of the sun and its last supreme effort, and with its dying, Ramo had hid her face in her hands. Somehow Kila had found his arm around her, and she had laid her head on his breast while she sobbed. But even though the sun had died and the last hope of earth departed, Kila found himself happy, happier than he had ever known. For now he knew that the sun could not go out for him, and then perhaps, who knows, together they would someday venture out and find a new sun, a new world, 
one that had trees and flowing waters, a radiant warmth, and mayhap a moon or two to light their night. The End End of When the Sun Went Out by Leslie F. Stone Recording by Doug Wade Beamy Says by Sidney J. Van Syok This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bimi Says by Sidney J. Van Syok June the 27th, 1982 Bimi said to do this, keep a diary. I said, cows? He said, you deaf woman, a book. Then I remembered, only I haven't seen one. It's for when he's famous. Then we can have it published any time we need money. I'd better tell about us. I'm short, sort of cute, and I cook good. Bimmy's tall and skinny, he likes to eat. He's 18, I'm 16. We got married 22 days ago. Instead of a fancy wedding, Bimmy told my folks, give us money. He needed the money for his laboratory. It's in the basement. It's what'll make him famous. June the 31st, 1982. We got a cat and dog. They're black and two months old. I wanted red colors. Bimmy said, don't waste my money, woman. Bimmy wanted them down in his laboratory. He said that'd be proper conditions. I said, no, I'll leave if you do and you'll have to eat capsules. The cat's he, the dog's she. Bimmy doesn't want them outside, ever. July the 3rd, 1982. We thought Bimmy's folks changed their minds, but they said, finally and conclusively, we want. Bimmy says he doesn't want to go to college if they're stingy because we got married. He already knows everything important. He wants me to finish school. I can finish in December. I thought when you got married, you didn't have to. Just slept late and fixed your hair. July the 9th, 1982. The puppy's sister, the cat's sup. Sister's jealous because sup jumps on the couch and she can't. Bimil have to make pills for sister. She hides from his needle. She'll be small. That's good, Bimi says. August 17, 1982. He just married me to cook. Every night he's in his laboratory. I'm always in this stupid, ugly house. August 18, 1982. Sister won't change for a long time. Bimi has pills now. September the 1st, 1982. School started. Frank is still stuck on me. He says I'm sexy, that's why Bimi married me. I said he married me for my cooking. He laughed. September 11th, 1982. I felt funny again. I stopped by Mama's. She bets she knows what it is. She knew after ten days. September the 15th, 1982. I had to ask the school nurse if it was that. She said, yes, two weeks. I hope she's wrong. Babies are work. She said, but the fulfillment. I said, changing soppy diapers is what you call fulfillment? It doesn't show. Frankie winked at me. September the 17th, 1982. The cat climbed to those lace curtains Bimi's mother gave us. Bimi said it was my job to watch him. I said, that's a stupid way to spend my life. He said, I didn't marry you to have you sit around and do nothing. Sister watched Sup and whined. She wants to be a cat. September 27th, 1982. Bimi read my diary. He said there wasn't a June 31st. He says to tell more about his work. It won't make money if he's not in it. I told him about the baby. He said, whoopee. He got some obstetrics books. October the 5th, 1982. Bimi expects the baby to kick already. I'm glad it doesn't. He made the puppy spills tonight. October the 7th, 1982. I let them outside. The smell in the house turns my stomach. I'm afraid to take the pills Bimi made me. October the 9th, 1982. I let them out again. There's a black dog next door with a long nose, ears like rosebuds, and white feet. 
Sister was scared. Sap hissed. October the 25th, 1982. Bimi's so nice. He took me to a tri-diversion. He hates them. He said, therefore the claudy minded masses. I said, well, what are we? I want a tri-diversion wall. Bimi says, no. We had a fight. October the 30th, 1982. I took a pill Bimi made. I felt good. I let them out. It beats cleaning up. Sister played with that dog. November the 7th, 1982. I went to Dr. Brantley. He hypnotized me. I don't remember it. December the 13th, 1982. Sister's leaving spots. I thought she's hurt. Bimi explained and said, don't let her out. He wants to wait till next time to have puppies. He said the treatment must take full effect first. He explained, but I didn't understand. January 5th, 1983. I'm out of school. It's boring. Mama says I'm too young to settle down. She's crazy. I'm 16. January 11th, 1983. Beam is reading more obstetrics books. Hypnotism, too. He tried to hypnotize me, but I went to sleep. January 14th, 1983. I wish Mama would stop. She said, where are you going to put a baby with only one bedroom? She cried and called me baby. Gosh, she said, you shouldn't have cats around babies. You'll have to give him away. Bimi heard from the bedroom. He came out. He said, I am conducting an important scientific experiment with a cat and dog. I would as soon give away the baby. Mama got white under her plastic skin. She said, Bimi, you're a monster for experimenting on dumb animals and for rejecting your own child. Then Sap climbed the curtains Mama gave us. She shrieked, you're ungrateful, and halfed out. She came back later, asking us to forgive her. She said she wanted to help, since we're both still children. Well, I do wonder where we'll put the baby. Maybe on the couch. February 17th, 1983. I had to tell Bimi I was letting them out. Sap fought with the dog next door. Bimi got mad. He told me they must have a controlled environment. I said it's hard for me to bend over to clean up. Finally, he said he'd clean up, and wasn't it funny? Sap and that dog knew they were rivals. I didn't know myself. March 17, 1983. I saw Dr. Brantley today. He says I'm fine. I tried to remember him putting me in a trance, but I couldn't. April 19, 1983. Saw Dr. Brantley. Sap pulled the curtains down. Sister isn't jealous anymore. She's playing with a string. May the 9th, 1983. I am writing this next day. Last night, I had this sharp pain. I said, be me, call Dr. Brantley. I remember him looking at me funny. That's all I remember until I woke up in the hospital. Bimi was sitting beside me, looking proud. I asked him, what's happened? He grinned. We had a nine-pound son, he said. I named him after the man who delivered him. I said, did I faint? That wasn't the way it was explained, just that Dr. Brantley would put me in a trance. Bimi was too busy grinning to say, then he had to go to work. The doctor came in. I said, it wasn't bad. I only felt one pain. He frowned. I said, can I see the baby? He said, later. He went out too. I thought I must have cursed. I didn't understand until the nurse brought the baby. He had a little plastic bracelet that said Binford Faust Jr. He was red and squalling. I felt like doing the same because I knew why Bimmy had been studying those obstetrics books. He has to try everything. May the 21st, 1983. I'm 17 today. Bimi says to write more. He thinks that's all I have to do. The baby sleeps all the time. He isn't crying. I like him, only I'm tired of diapers. Sister gets three pills every day. She plays with them, then eats them. Bimi said last night, it won't be long until my experiment bears fruit. He said to write that here. June the 3rd, 1983. Sister tried to climb the curtains. June the 5th, 1983. Bimi wanted to give the baby some pills he made. I said no. He said, they'll make him smarter, woman. I said, he's enough trouble, dumb. 
Today was our first anniversary. Bimi wouldn't buy me anything. June the 9th, 1983. We thought about a dryer. After he left, I said, For that I'll let your animals out. The dog next door came up. Sister arched her back. June the 21st, 1983. I've been putting them out every day. June the 25th, 1983. Bimi says to write every day. His experiment is coming to a head. I can't see anything happening. Sister gets six pills now. June the 27th, 1983. The dog's that way again. Bimi said, at last my experiment shall be carried to completion. Not that I care for fame and riches, no. I care only for the accomplishment of something man has never before achieved. I said he didn't sound natural. He said, put it down that way, woman. June the 29th, 1983. Bimi wanted to feed the baby. I caught him before he gave him a pill. We fought. He said, who delivered him? I said, I made him and pointed to my stomach. I said, I won't have you using him like a guinea pig. July the 4th, 1983. Bimi says tomorrow we'll shut them up in the basement. July the 5th, 1983. The funniest thing. Bimi said you put them in the basement. Then he left. I thought, I'll just take them out while I hang diapers. But when we went out, three dogs came up. I said, scat. I couldn't chase them because I had my arms full of diapers, because Bimi won't buy me a basket. They came closer, edging around. I stomped my feet and yelled. The dog next door came and growled. Then Sap hissed at him. This was the first the other three saw Sap. He hunched up, spitting and intending to chase them off. Only they took out after him instead. He ran off with four dogs after him. I couldn't do anything. My arms were full. July the 6th, 1983. Bimi didn't think it was funny. He yelled. What are you, stupid? Didn't you know dogs would come around? Didn't you know dogs chase cats? He took the car and called Kitty Kitty all over town. No luck. I said, get another cat. He said, this one is used to Susta. I said, there'll be another time. He stared at me and said Susta's system would tolerate only so much of the stuff he's been giving her. He can't give her any more after next month. He'll have to wait another year. Then he went looking again. That was last night. Maybe he'll come home tonight. July the 7th, 1983. He hasn't. Bim is biting his fingernails. He'd bite harder if he knew what happened today. I thought Sosta was asleep when I went to hang diapers. I had my arms clear full. When I opened the door, Sosta shot past me. I yelled at her, but she went flying down the street, and I saw that dog next door take off behind her. I thought first thing, it's Bimi's fault for not buying me a dryer. I hung the clothes fast. After all, nothing could happen in such a short time. Then I started up the street calling, Here, sister, but the baby was alone. I had to hurry home. She came back in half an hour. I didn't tell Bimi yet. July the 8th, 1983. I didn't tell him still. He was mad because he had to pay to get sap out of the pound. Bimi solved his ears. They were torn and put them in the basement. He said, now. July the 15th, 1983. Bimi says to write every day. It's dull, them in the basement. They come up tomorrow. July 23rd, 1983. Sister acts funnier than ever. She rubs my legs when I'm cooking. She keeps wetting her paws and rubbing her face. August the 3rd, 1983. Today I caught sister sharpening her claws on the couch. I said, be me, look at that crazy dog, thinks she's a cat. He frowned. He only has one pimple now. He's kind of handsome. I said, isn't it cute? Be me went downstairs. I think he was worried. August the 11th, 1983. Sister's getting big. I let her sleep with a baby. Bimi says, whoopee, it worked. I'm scared to tell him now. August the 12th, 1983. Sister rubs my leg when she's hungry. Then she sits and switches her tail for a long time. August 17th, 1983. Sister meowed today. I was fixing dinner. She looked up and said, meow. It wasn't supposed to be this way. Bimi's afraid she'll have kittens. 
that isn't what he's trying to do. September the 5th, 1983, Sister wanted to go down in the basement this afternoon. When I called her for supper, she came up with her stomach flat. Bimi and I went down. Sister ducked back in a hole in the wall. There's a sort of little cave. We said they must be in there. We got a flash, and we could see little black balls. Bimi couldn't reach them. Bimi kept talking about how his experiment is going to revolutionize agriculture. September the 6th, 1983. I can hear her meowing to them. We can see them with a flash. We can't tell anything yet. September the 7th, 1983. He'll buy a typewriter, but not a dryer. He's going to write a book about his experiment. He expects me to type it. September the 10th, 1983. She still won't bring them out. She purred today, rusty-like. Bimmy says sometimes it had to work. Other times he bites his nails. He gave me ten pages to type. I thought I'd better. September the 13th, 1983. I went down to call sister and I saw them. There were five, wobbling everywhere. They were the cutest fat things. I picked one up and then I felt sick. He had a long nose and little rosebud ears and white feet. He looked like the dog next door. All of them do. They're all puppies. Nothing else, just puppies. I put them in a box and took them upstairs. Bimmy's working tonight. I'll go to bed before he comes home. September 14th, 1983. He raved all morning and tromped around. I said, shut up or I'll leave and you'll have to eat capsules. He said, I could eat dog food. Then he wanted to see my diary. I said no, but he yanked out all the drawers and found it. I took the baby and went to Mama's. It was supper time when I came home. He was on the couch with Sap and Sosta and the puppies. He didn't act mad, just nasty nice. So you came home, he said. I never realized how limited you were, Listy. Your diary's shown me a lot. Can you at least find homes for the puppies? I said, I guess. I put the baby down. He hadn't thrown anything or burnt my diary. He said, good then. I've fixed supper. He had hamburger, frozen pie, and hot chocolate. Some of it tasted bad. I didn't say anything. September 15th, 1983. I asked Bimmy, should I quit my diary? He said yes. Then, no, keep on. I asked, was he doing another experiment? He said, not yet. I said, Bim better not start talking early. He said, you don't think I'd experiment with my own child? I didn't know. He said, Bim might be smart anyway. I said, he might be, he's your son. It was a good compliment. September 17th, 1983. Bimmy wants to learn cooking. He said, you have to work hard hanging diapers. It will help if I can cook. I'll teach him hot chocolate first. His fixing tastes awful. October the 5th, 1983. I have little to report. Bimford Jr. is flourishing. The puppies are adorable. Sister and Sap tend them jointly. Bimmy has no new project. He has thrown all his energies into cooking. He does quite well, except for hot chocolate, which still tastes of chemicals. I never until yesterday realized the intellectual and sensual joy to be derived from delving into Greek drama. November the 9th, 1983. Bainford Jr. is six months old today. Since I gave up the last puppy, the house seems barn-like in its emptiness. I mentioned the fact to Bainford. His glance was speculative. I have some money saved. Want a tri-diversion wall? I was horrified. Whatever for? He shrugged. Maybe you'd like to go to the library, get something to read. I considered. Perhaps I will, I said. There isn't much for me to do, hang diapers and push buttons. Automation has almost completely eliminated the housewife's traditional chores. I left Binford Jr. with mother and walked to the library. I asked the librarian to show me about. What are you interested in? she inquired. I don't know, I replied. Do you have any good recent works on chemistry or perhaps nuclear physics? She raised her eyebrows but conducted me to the proper shelf. After finding several interesting volumes, I also checked out a volume on cookery for Binford. His hot chocolate doesn't improve despite nightly practice. He tells me he is working on a new project. 
End of Bimi Says by Sidney J. Van Sayuk. Pythias by Frederick Pohl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ron Altman. Pythias by Frederick Pohl. I am sitting on the edge of what passes for a bed. It is made of loosely woven strips of steel, and there is no mattress, only an extra blanket of thin olive drab. It isn't comfortable, but of course they expect to make me still more uncomfortable. They expect to take me out of this precinct jail to the district prison, and eventually to the death house. Sure, there will be a trial first, but that is only a formality. Not only did they catch me with a smoking gun in my hand, and Connaught bubbling to death through the hole in his throat, but I admitted it. I, knowing what I was doing, with, as they say, malice aforethought, deliberately shot to death Lawrence Connaught. They execute murderers, so they mean to execute me especially because Lawrence Connaught had saved my life. Well, there are extenuating circumstances. I do not think they would convince a jury. Connaught and I were close friends for years. We lost touch during the war. We met again in Washington a few years after the war was over. We had, to some extent, grown apart. He had become a man with a mission. He was working very hard on something, and he did not choose to discuss his work, and there was nothing else in his life on which to form a basis for communication. And, well, I had my own life, too. It wasn't scientific research in my case. I flunked out of med school while he went on. I'm not ashamed of it. It is nothing to be ashamed of. I simply was not able to cope with the messy business of carving corpses. I didn't like it. I didn't want to do it, and when I was forced to do it, I did it badly. So I left. Thus I have no string of degrees, but you don't need them in order to be a Senate guard. Does that sound like a terribly impressive career to you? Of course not, but I liked it. The senators are relaxed and friendly when the guards are around, and you learn wonderful things about what goes on behind the scenes of government, and a senate guard is in a position to do favors, for newspaper men who find a lead to a story useful, for government officials who sometimes base a whole campaign on one careless repeated remark and for just about anyone who would like to be in the visitor's gallery during a hot debate. Larry Connaught, for instance. I ran into him on the street one day, and we chatted for a moment, and he asked if it was possible to get him in to see the upcoming foreign relations debate. It was. I called him the next day and told him I had arranged for a pass and he was there watching eagerly with his moist little eyes when the secretary got up to speak, and there was that sudden unexpected yell, and a handful of Central American fanatics dragged out their weapons and began trying to change American policy with gunpowder. You remember the story, I suppose. There were only three of them, two with guns, one with a hand grenade. The pistol men managed to wound two senators and a guard. I was right there talking to Connaught. I spotted the little fellow with the hand grenade and tackled him. I knocked him down, but the grenade went flying, pin pulled, seconds ticking away. I lunged for it. Larry Connaught was ahead of me. The newspaper stories made heroes out of both of us. They said it was miraculous that Larry, who had fallen right on top of the grenade, had managed to get it away from himself. 
and so placed that when it exploded no one was hurt. For it did go off, and the flying steel touched nobody. The papers mentioned that Larry had been knocked unconscious by the blast. He was unconscious, all right. He didn't come to for six hours, and when he woke up, he spent the next whole day in a stupor. I called on him the next night. He was glad to see me. "'That was a close one, Dick,' he said. "'Take me back to Tarawa.' I said, "'I guess you saved my life, Larry.' "'Nonsense, Dick. I just jumped. Lucky, that's all.' The papers said you were terrific. They said you moved so fast nobody could see exactly what happened. He made a deprecating gesture, but his wet little eyes were wary. Nobody was really watching, I suppose. I was watching, I told him flatly. He looked at me silently for a moment. I was between you and the grenade, I said. You didn't go past me over me or through me, but you were on top of the grenade. He started to shake his head. I said, also, Larry, you fell on the grenade. It exploded underneath you. I know because I was almost on top of you, and it blew you clear off the floor of the gallery. Did you have a bulletproof vest on? He cleared his throat. Well, as a matter of Cut it out, Larry. What's the answer? He took off his glasses and rubbed his watery eyes. He grumbled, Don't you who read the papers? It went off a yard away. Larry, I said gently, I was there. He slumped back in his chair, staring at me. Larry Connaught was a small man but he never looked smaller than he did in that big chair, looking at me as though I were Mr. Nemesis himself. Then he laughed. He surprised me. He sounded almost happy. He said, Ah, hell, Dick. I had to tell somebody about it sooner or later. Why not you? I can't tell you all of what he said. I'll tell most of it, but not the part that matters. I'll never tell that part to anybody. Larry said, I should have known you'd remember. He smiled at me ruefully, affectionately. Those bull sessions in the cafeterias, eh? Talking all night about everything. But you remembered. You claimed that the human mind possessed powers of psychokinesis, I said. You argued that just by the mind, without moving a finger or using a machine, a man could move his body anywhere instantly. You said that nothing was impossible to the mind. I felt like an absolute fool saying those things. They were ridiculous notions. Imagine a man thinking himself from one place to another. But... I had been on that gallery. I licked my lips and looked to Larry Connaught for confirmation. I was all wet, Larry laughed. <laughs> Imagine! I suppose I showed surprise because he patted my shoulder. He said, becoming sober, Sure, Dick, you're wrong, but you're right all the same. The mind alone can't do anything of the sort. That was just a silly kid notion. But, he went on, but there are, well, techniques linking the mind to physical forces, simple physical forces that we all use every day that can do it all, everything, everything I ever thought of and things I haven't found out yet. Fly across the ocean? In a second, Dick. Wall off an exploding bomb? Easily. You saw me do it. Oh, it's work. It takes energy. You can't escape natural law. That was what knocked me out for a whole day. But that was a hard one. It's a lot easier, for instance, 
to make a bullet miss its target. It's even easier to lift the cartridge out of the chamber and put it in my pocket, so that the bullet can't even be fired. Want the crown jewels of England? I could get them, Dick. I asked, Can you see the future? He frowned. That's silly. This isn't supersti— How about reading minds? Larry's expression cleared. Oh, you're remembering some of the things I said years ago. No, I can't do that either, Dick. Maybe some day, if I keep working at this thing. Well, I can't right now. There are things I can do, though, that are just as good. Show me something you can do, I asked. He smiled. Larry was enjoying himself. I didn't begrudge it to him. He had hugged this to himself for years, from the day he found his first clue through the decade of proving and experimenting, almost always being wrong, but always getting closer. He needed to talk about it. I think he was really glad that at last someone had found him out. He said, "'Show you something? Why, let's see, Dick.' He looked around the room, then winked. See that window? I looked. It opened with a slither of wood and a rumble of sash weights. It closed again. The radio? said Larry. There was a click, and his little set turned itself on. Watch it! It disappeared and reappeared. It was on top of Mount Everest, Larry said, panting a little. The plug on the radio's electric cord picked itself up and stretched toward the baseboard socket, then dropped to the floor again. No, said Larry, and his voice was trembling. I'll show you a hard one. Watch the radio, Dick. I'll run it without plugging it in. The electrons themselves— He was staring intently at the little set. I saw the dial light go on, flicker, and hold steady. The speaker began to make scratching noises. I stood up right behind Larry, right over him. I used the telephone on the table beside him. I caught him right beside the ear, and he folded over without a murmur. Methodically, I hit him twice more, and then I was sure he wouldn't wake up for at least an hour. I rolled him over and put the telephone back in its cradle. I ransacked his apartment. I found it in his desk. All his notes, all the information, the secret of how to do the things he could do. I picked up the telephone and called the Washington police. When I heard the siren outside, I took out my service revolver and shot him in the throat. He was dead before they came in. For you see, I knew Lawrence Connaught. We were friends. I would have trusted him with my life. But this was more than just a life. Twenty-three words told how to do the things that Lawrence Connaught did. Anyone who could read could do them. Criminals, traitors, lunatics. The formula would work for anyone. Lawrence Connaught was an honest man, and an idealist, I think. But what would happen to any man when he became God? Suppose you were told twenty-three words that would let you reach into any bank vault, peer inside any closed room, walk through any wall. Suppose pistols could not kill you. They say power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely and there can be no more absolute power than the twenty-three words that can free a man of any jail or give him anything he wants. Larry was my friend, but I killed him in cold blood knowing what I did, because he could not be trusted with the secret that could make him king of the world. But I can. End of Pythias by Frederick Pohl McIlvain's Star by August Derleth 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Grzynski. McIlvaine's Star by August Derleth. Call them what you like, said Tex Harrigan. Lost people or strayed, crackpots or warped geniuses. I know enough of them to fill an entire department of queer people. I've been a reporter long enough to have run into quite a few of them. For example, I said, recognizing Harrigan's mellowness. Take Thaddeus McIlvain, said Harrigan. I never heard of him. I suppose not, said Harrigan, but I knew him. He was an eccentric old fellow who had a modest income, enough to keep up his hobbies, which were three. He played cards and chess at a tavern called Bixby's on North Clark Street. He was an amateur astronomer, and he had the fixed idea that there was life somewhere outside this planet and that it was possible to communicate with other beings. But unlike most others, he tried it constantly with the queer machinery he had rigged up. Well, now, this old fellow had a trio of cronies with whom he played on occasion down at Bixby's. He had no one else to confide in. He kept them up with his progress among the stars and his communication with other life in the cosmos beyond our own. And they made a great joke out of it, from all I could gather. I suppose, because he had no one else to talk to, McElvain took it without complaint. Well... As I said, I never heard of him until one morning the city editor, it was old Bill Henderson then, called me in and said, Harrigan, we just got a lead on a fellow named Thaddeus McIlvain, who claims to have discovered a new star. Amateur astronomer up North Clark. Find him and get a story. So I set out to track him down. It was a great moment for Thaddeus McIlvain. He sat down among his friends almost portentously, adjusted his spectacles and peered over them in his usual manner, halfway between a querulous oldster and a reproachful schoolmaster. "'I've done it,' he said quietly. "'I and what?' asked Alexander testily. "'I discovered a new star.' "'Oh,' said Leopold flatly, "'a cinder in your eye.' "'It lies just off Arcturus,' McIlvain went on, "'and it would appear to be coming closer.' "'Give it my love,' said Richardson, with a wry smile. "'Have you named it yet, or don't the discoverers of new stars name them any more? "'McIlvain's star, that's a good name for it. "'Hard a port of Arcturus, with special displays on windy nights.' "'McIlvain only smiled. "'It's a dark star,' he said presently. "'It doesn't have light.' "'He spoke almost apologetically, as if somehow he had disappointed his friends.' I'm going to try and communicate with it. That's the ticket, said Alexander. Cut for deal, said Leopold. That was how the news about McIlvain's star was received by his cronies. Afterward, after McIlvain had dutifully played several games of euchre, Richardson conceived the idea of telephoning the Globe to announce McIlvain's discovery. The old fellow took himself seriously, Harrigan went on. And yet he was so damned mousy about it. I mean, you got the impression that he had been trying for so long that now he hardly believed in his star himself any longer. But there it was. He had a long, detailed story of its discovery, which was an accident, as those things usually are. They happen all the time, and his story sounded convincing enough. Just the same, you didn't feel that he really had anything. I took down notes, of course. That was routine. I got a picture of the old man with never an idea we'd be using it. To tell the truth, I carried my notes around with me for a day or so before it occurred to me that it wouldn't do any harm to put a call into Yerke's observatory up in Wisconsin. So I did, and they confirmed McIlvain's star. The Globe had the story. Did it up in fine style. It was two weeks before we heard from McIlvain again. That night, McIlvain was more than usually diffident. He was not like a man bearing a message of considerable importance to himself. He slipped into Bixby's, got a glass of beer, and approached the table where his friends sat, almost with trepidation. "'It's a nice evening for May,' he said quietly. Richardson grunted. Leopold said, "'By the way, Mac,' 
Whatever became of that star of yours, the one the papers wrote up? I think, said McElvane cautiously, I'm quite sure I have got in touch with them. Only, his brow wrinkled and furrowed, I can't understand their language. Ah, said Richardson with an edge to his voice, the thing for you to do is to tell them that's your star, and they'll have to speak English from now on, so you can understand them. Why, next thing we know, you'll be getting yourself a rocket or a spaceship and going over to that star to set yourself up as king or something. King Thaddeus I, said Alexander loftily, all you star dwellers may kiss the royal foot. That would be unsanitary, I think, said McIlvain, frowning. Poor McIlvain. They made him the butt of their jests for over an hour before he took himself off to his quarters, where he sat himself down before his telescope and found his star once more, almost huge enough to blot out Arcturus, but not quite since it was moving away from that amber star now. McIlvain's star was certainly much closer to the Earth than it had been. He tried once again to contact it with his homemade radio, and once again he received a succession of strange rhythmic noises, which he could not doubt were speech of some kind or other, a rasping, grating speech, to be sure, utterly unlike the speech of McIlvain's own kind. It rose and fell, became impatient, urgent, despairing. McIlvain sensed all this and strove mightily to understand. He sat there for perhaps two hours when he received the distant impression that someone was talking to him in his own language, but there was no longer any sound on the radio. He could not understand what had taken place, but in a few moments he received the clear conviction that the inhabitants of his star had managed to discover the basic elements of his language by the simple process of reading his mind, and were now prepared to talk with him. What manner of creatures inhabited Earth, they wished to know? McIlvain told them. He visualized one of his own kind and tried to put him into words. It was difficult, since he could not rid himself of the conviction that his interlocutors might be utterly alien. They had no conception of man, and doubted man's existence on any other star. There were plant people on Venus, ant people on Andromeda, six-legged and four-armed beings which were equal parts mineral and vegetable on Betelgeuse, but nothing resembling man. "'You are evidently alone of your kind in the cosmos,' said his interstellar correspondent. "'And what about you?' cried McIlvain, with unaccustomed heat. Silence was his only answer, but presently he conceived a mental image which was remarkable for its vividness, but the image was of nothing he had ever seen before, of thousands upon thousands of miniature beings, utterly alien to man. They resembled amphibious insects, with thin elongated heads, large eyes and antennae set upon a scaled four-legged body, with rudimentary beetle-like wings. Curiously, they seemed ageless. He could detect no difference among them. All appeared to be the same age. We are not, but we rejuvenate regularly, said the creature with whom he corresponded in this strange manner. Did they have names? McIlvain wondered. I am Guru, said the star's inhabitant. You are McIlvain. And the civilization of their star? Instantly he saw in his mind's eye vast cities which rose from beneath a surface which appeared to bear no vegetation recognizable to any human eye, in a terrain which seemed to be desert, of monolithic buildings which were windowless, and had openings only of sufficient size to permit the free passage of its dwarf dwellers. Within the buildings was evidence of a great and old civilization— you see, McIlvain really believed all this. What an imagination the man had. Of course, the boys at Bixby's gave him a bad time. I don't know how he stood it, but he did. He always came back. Richardson called the story in. He took a special delight in deviling McIlvain, and I was set out to see the old fellow again. You couldn't doubt his sincerity, and yet he didn't sound touched. But, of course, that part about the insect-like dwellers of the star comes straight out of Wells, doesn't it? I put in. Wells and scores of others, agreed Harrigan. 
Wells was probably the first writer to suggest insectivorous inhabitants on Mars. His were considerably larger, though. Go on. Well, I talked with McIlvain for quite a while. He told me all about their civilization and about his friend, Guru. You might have thought he was talking about a neighbor of his I had only to step outside to meet. Later on, I dropped around at Bixby's and had a talk with the boys there. Richardson let me in on a secret. He had decided to rig up a connection to McIlvain's machine and do a little talking to the old fellow, making him believe Guru was coming through in English. He meant to give McIlvain a harder time than ever, and once he had him believing everything he planned to say, they would wait for him at Bixby's and let him make a fool of himself. It didn't work out quite that way, however. McIlvain, can you hear me? McIlvain started with astonishment. His mental impression of Guru became confused. The voice speaking English came clear as a bell, as if from no distance at all. Yes, he said hesitantly. Well then, listen to me, listen to Guru. We have now had enough information from you to suit our ends. Within twenty-four hours, we, the inhabitants of Ali, will begin a war of extermination against Earth. But why? cried McIlvain, astounded. The image before his mind's eye cleared. The cold, precise features of Guru betrayed anger. There is interference, the thought image informed him. Leave the machine for a few moments while we use the disintegrators. Before he left the machine, McIlvain had the impression of a greater machine being attached to the means of communication which the inhabitants of his star were using to communicate with him. McIlvain's story was that a few moments later there was a blinding flash just outside his window, continued Harrigan. There was also a run of instantaneous fire from the window to his machine. When he had collected his wits sufficiently, he ran outside to look. There was nothing there but a kind of grayish dust in a little mound, as if he had put it, somebody had cleaned out a vacuum bag. He went back in and examined the space from the window to the machine. There were two thin lines of dust there, hardly perceptible, just as if something had been attached to the machine and let outside. Now the obvious supposition is naturally that it was Richardson out there, and that the lines of dust from the window to the machine represented the wires he had attached to his microphone while McIlvain was at Bixby's entertaining his other two cronies. But this is fact, not fiction, and the point of the episode is that Richardson disappeared from that night on. You investigated, of course, I asked. Harrigan nodded. Quite a lot of us investigated. The police might have done better. There was a gang war on in Chicago just at that time, and Richardson was nobody with any connections. His nearest relatives weren't anxious about anything but what they might inherit. To tell the truth, his cronies at Bixby's were the only people who worried about him, McIlvain as much as the rest of them. Oh, they gave the old man a hard time, all right. They went through his house with a fine-tooth comb. They dug up his yard, his cellar, and generally put him through it figuring he was a natural to hang a murder rap on. But there was just nothing to be found, and they couldn't manufacture evidence when there was nothing to show that McIlvain ever knew that Richardson planned to have a little fun with him. And no one had seen Richardson there. There was nothing but McIlvain's word that he had heard what he said he heard. He needn't have volunteered that, but he did. After the police had finished with him, they wrote him off as a harmless nut but the question of what happened to Richardson wasn't solved from that day to this. People have been known to walk out of their lives, I said, and never come back. Oh, sometimes they do. Richardson didn't. Besides, if he walked out of his life here, he did so without much more than the clothing he had on. So much was missing from his effects, nothing more. And McIlvain? Harrigan smiled thinly. He carried on. You couldn't expect him to do anything less. After all, he had worked most of his life trying to communicate with the worlds outside, and he had no intention of resigning his contact, no matter how much Richardson's disappearance upset him. For a while he believed the guru had actually disintegrated Richardson. He offered that explanation, but by that time the dust had vanished, 
and he was laughed out of face. So he went back to the machine and Guru and the little excursions to Bixby's. "'What's the latest word from that star of yours?' asked Leopold when McIlvain came in. "'They want to rejuvenate me,' said McIlvain, with a certain shy pleasure. "'What's that?' asked Alexander sourly. "'They say they can make me young again, like them up there. They never die. They just live so long, and then they rejuvenate. They begin all over. It's some kind of a process they have.' "'And I suppose they're planning to come down and fetch you up there and give you the works, is that it?' asked Alexander. "'Well, no,' answered McIlvain. "'Guru says there's no need for that. It can be done through the machine. They can work it like the disintegrators. It puts you back to thirty or twenty, or wherever you like.' "'Well, I'd like to be twenty-five myself again,' admitted Leopold. "'I'll tell you what, Mac,' said Alexander. You go ahead and try it, then come back and let us know how it works. If it does, we'll all sit in. Better make your will first, though, just in case. Oh, I did this afternoon. Leopold choked back a snicker. Don't take this thing too seriously, Mac. After all, we're short one of us now. We'd hate to lose you, too. McIlvain was touched. Oh, I wouldn't change, he hastened to assure his friends. I'd just be younger, that's all. They'll just work on me through the machine, and overnight I'll be rejuvenated. That's certainly a little trick that's got it all over monkey glands, conceded Alexander, grinning. Those little bugs on that star of yours have made scientific progress, I'd say, said Leopold. They're not bugs, said McIlvain, with faint indignation. They're people, maybe not just like you and me, but they're people just the same. He went home that night filled with anticipation. He had done just what he had promised himself he would do, arranging everything for his rejuvenation. Guru had been astonished to learn that people on earth simply died when there was no necessity of doing so. He had made the offer to rejuvenate McIlvain himself. McIlvain sat down to his machine and turned the complex knobs until he was in rapport with his dark star. He waited for a long time. It seemed, before he knew his contact had been closed, Guru came through. "'Are you ready, McIlvain?' he asked soundlessly. "'Yes, all ready,' said McIlvain, trembling with eagerness. "'Don't be alarmed now. It will take several hours,' said Guru. I'm not alarmed, answered McIlvain. And indeed he was not. He was filled with an exhilaration akin to mysticism, and he sat waiting for what he was certain must be the experience above all others in his prosaic existence. McIlvain's disappearance coming so close on Richardson's gave us a beautiful story, said Harrigan. The only trouble was it wasn't new when the globe got around to it. We had lost our informant in Richardson. It never occurred to Alexander or Leopold to telephone us, or anyone, about McIlvain's unaccountable absence from Bixby's. Finally, Leopold went over to McIlvain's house to find out whether the old fellow was sick. A young fellow opened up. "'Where's McIlvain?' Leopold asked. "'I'm McIlvain,' the young fellow answered. "'Thaddeus McIlvain?' Leopold explained. That's my name, was the only answer he got. I mean the Thaddeus McIlvain who used to play cards with us over at Bixby's, said Leopold. He shook his head. Sorry, you must be looking for someone else. What are you doing here, Leopold asked then. Why, I inherited what my uncle left, said the young fellow. And sure enough, when Leopold talked to me and persuaded me to go around with him to McIlvain's lawyer, we found that the old fellow had made a will and left everything to his nephew, a namesake. The stipulations were clear enough. Among them was the express wish that if anything happened to him, the elder Thaddeus McIlvain, of no matter what nature, but particularly something allowing a reasonable doubt of his death, the nephew was still to be permitted to take immediate possession of the property and effects. Of course you called on the nephew, I said. 
Harrigan nodded. Sure, that was the indicated course in any event. It was routine for both the press and the police. There was nothing suspicious about his story. It was straightforward enough, except for one or two little details. He never did give us any precise address. He just mentioned Detroit once. I called up a friend on one of the papers there and put him up to looking up Thaddeus McIlvain. The only young man of that name he could find appeared to be the same man as the present inhabitant's uncle, though the description fit pretty well. There was a resemblance then? Oh, sure. One could have imagined that old Thaddeus McIlvain had looked somewhat like his nephew when he himself was a young man, but don't let the old man's rigmarole about rejuvenation make too deep an impression on you. The first thing the young fellow did was to get rid of that machine of his uncle's. Can you imagine his uncle having done something like that? I shook my head, but I could not help thinking what an ironic thing it would have been if there had been something to McIlvain's story and in the process to which he had been subjected from out of space, he had not been rejuvenated so much as just sent back in time, in which case he would have no memory of the machine nor of the use to which it had been put. It would have been as ironic for the inhabitants of McIlvain's star, too. They would doubtless have looked forward to keeping his contact with Earth open and failed to realize that McIlvain's construction differed appreciably from theirs. He virtually junked it, said he had no idea what it could be used for, and didn't know how to operate it. In the telescope? Oh, he kept that. He said he had some interest in astronomy and meant to develop that if time permitted. So much ran in the family, then. Yes, more than that. Old McIlvain had a trick of seeming shy and self-conscious. So did this nephew of his. Wherever he came from, his origins must have been backward. I suspect that he was ashamed of them, and if I had to guess, I'd put him in the Kentucky Hill Country or the Ozarks. Modern concepts seem to be pretty well too much for him, and his thinking would have been considerably more natural at the turn of the century. I had to see him several times. The police shivvied him a little, but not much. He was so obviously innocent of everything that there was nothing for them in him. And the search for the old man didn't last long, no one had seen him after that last night at Bixby's, and since everyone had already long since concluded that he was mentally a little off-center, it was easy to conclude that he had wandered away somewhere, probably an amnesiac. That he might have anticipated this is indicated in the hasty preparation of his will, which came out of the blue, said Barnival, who drew it up for him. I felt sorry for him. For whom? The nephew. He seemed so lost, you know, like a man who wanted to remember something but couldn't. I noticed that several times when I tried to talk to him. I had the feeling each time that there was something he wanted desperately to say. It hovered always on the rim of his awareness, but somehow there was no bridge to it, no clue to put it into words. He tried so hard for something he couldn't put his finger on. What became of him? Oh, he's still around. I think he found a job somewhere. As a matter of fact, I saw him just the other evening. He had apparently just come from work, and he was standing in front of Bixby's with his face pressed to the window looking in. I came up nearby and watched him. Leopold and Alexander were sitting inside, a couple of lonely old men looking out, and a lonely young man looking in. There was something in McIlvain's face that same thing I had noticed so often before, a kind of expression that seemed to say there was something he ought to know, something he ought to remember, to do, to say, but there was no way in which he could reach back to it. Or forward, I said, with a wry smile. As you like, said Harrigan. Pour me another one, will you? I did, and he took it. That poor devil, he muttered. He'd be happier if he could only go back where he came from. Wouldn't we all? I asked. But nobody ever goes home again. Perhaps McIlvain never had a home like that. You'd have thought so if you could have seen his face looking in at Leopold and Alexander. Oh, it may have been a trick of the street light there. It may have been my imagination, but it sticks to my memory. And I keep thinking how alike the two were. Old McIlvain trying so desperately to find someone who could believe him. 
and his nephew now, trying just as hard to find someone to accept him, or a place he could accept on the only terms he knows. End of McIlvain's Star by August Derleth Dear Nan Glanders by Beta McGavin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dear Nan Glanders by Beta McGavin Read by Quartertone A time-traveling friend of ours recently returned from the future with the following clipping from the Galactic Times. It seems that even in the world of tomorrow there will always be an advice column, and that folks will still be worried about such humdrum things as interplanetary etiquette and cosmic sex. Dear Miss Glanders, From his childhood, my Johnny has been an avid collector of bugs, snakes, birds' nests, and other things. Our little centurion home is crammed full with extraterrestrial life forms as well. I put up with it as long as I could. Yesterday, he brought home a native centurion female. As you know, it is a quasi-intelligent mammalian form with the breasts and hips of a woman, fish scales and tail, and a horned head. Johnny insists he's going to marry her. What shall I do? Distressed mother. Dear Distressed, I suggest you contact your local fish and game department. Dear Nan Glanders, I am a hostess noted for my parties. Tomorrow we will have the Syrian ambassador and two of his three wives coming for a dinner party. How many forks and knives will be necessary for a guest with three sets of tentacles? Should I seat one of his wives on either side of him, or, or what? Worried. Dear Worried, Seating arrangements are unnecessary, as Syrians prefer to hang attached by the dorsal suction disc from a ceiling fixture and suspend their elongated trunks to the table below. Just have a dish of adobe-type clay handy on the table and let them help themselves. Dear Miss Glanders, My mother-in-law is a noted TK with a high range of ESP and prescience. Today she asked me if I was pregnant. Do you think she could have peeked at my mind? P.S. I am five months along, but still get into my everyday clothes with the help of a safety pin. Concerned. Dear Safety Pinned, it's high time you peeked and buy a maternity smock while you're at it. Confidential to what will it be, I've consulted an obstetrician for you. He said the baby has to be human, a simple matter of differential chromosomes. So relax. Dear Nan, I was the victim of a billion-to-one transplant accident. When I came out of the transmitter after commuting to work one day, two extra copies of my original body, rather than only the usual one, were reassembled at the receiving end. In other words, I became triplets, with each person having the same memories and all. Nobody was around, so I decided not to report it to the transplant company. Until now, I was an ordinary guy who faithfully hands over his paycheck to the old girl every payday. Don't get me wrong now. I'm a happily married man, but I do like having a little spending money for myself and a night out with the boys every now and then. So the three of us made a deal. One of us went to work, another one would be home, and the third out on the town. We took turns, share and share like. Then our wife caught two of us together and guessed the rest. She is suing for divorce and charging bigamy. We still love her, though. How can we get her to listen to reason? Since the case is in the newspapers anyway, I might as well sign my name. Married, for better or worse. Jimmy Jones, Jimmy Jones, Jimmy Jones. Dear Joneses, either reintegrate or draw straws and two of you skidoo. Dear Nan Glanders, I am a debutante on tour through the United Planets. I have never been so humiliated in my life. Yesterday I was presented to a regalian, and he spat on my new shoes. I would have slapped his face if I could have decided which one to hit. Steaming. Dear Steaming, simmer down. Spitting on the feet is the traditional regalian gesture of welcome. You should have replied by stepping on his tail. Next time, read your tourist guidebook better. End of Dear Nan Glanders by Beta McGavin
Get Out of Our Skies by Henry Slazar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. Get Out of Our Skies by Henry Slazar. On the first cloudy day in November, Tom Blacker, the shining light of Ostrich and Company, public relations counselors, placed a call to a shirt-sleeved man on the rooftop of the Cannon Building in New York City. His message brought an immediate response from the waiting engineer, who flicked switches and twirled dials with expert motions, and brought into play the gigantic 50,000-watt projector installed on the peak. In his own office, Tom paced the floor in front of the three-window exposure, watching the heavens for the results. They weren't long in coming. The eyes came first, eyes the size of navy dirigibles, with pupils of deep cerulean blue floating against the backdrop of the gray cumulus. The long lashes curled out almost a hundred feet from the lids. Then the rest of Monica Mitchell's famous face appeared. The flowing yellow locks, the sensuously curved lips, parted moistly from even white teeth. From chin to hairline, the projected image above the city was close to a thousand feet in diameter. Then, as if the floating countenance wasn't alarming enough, the ruby lips began to move. Monica's sweet, sultry voice, like the first drippings from a jar of honey, overcame the city sounds and began crooning the syrupy strains of Love Me Alone, which happened, by no coincidence, to be the title and theme of Monica's newest epic. It was a triumph. Tom knew it the moment he looked down at the crowded thoroughfare eighteen stories beneath the window. Traffic had come to a more than normal standstill. Drivers were leaving their autos, and hands were being upraised towards the gargantuan face on the clouds above. And, of course, Tom's phone rang. Ostrich's big scowling face was barely squeezed within the confines of the visiphone screen. He said nothing intelligible for two minutes. Relax, Chief, Tom said brightly. I've been saving this as a surprise. Ostrich's reply was censorable. Now, look, Dio, you gave me carte blanche with this Mitchell babe, remember? I figure we really needed a shot in the arm for this new picture of hers. The receipts on her last turkey couldn't pay her masseurs. Ostrich, who had built his firm by establishing golden public images for various industrialists and their enterprises, had anticipated trouble the moment he let the barrier down to admit such unworthy clients as Monica Mitchell. But he had never anticipated that his ace publicist would display such carnival tactics in their promotion. He growled like a taunted leopard. This is a cheap trick, Tom. Do you hear me? Turn that thing off at once. Who, me? Tom said innocently. Gosh, Dio, I'm no engineer. I left instructions with the operator to keep the projector going for three hours until sunset. Don't think I can do anything about it now. You'll damn well have to do something about it. You're ruining us. Look at it this way, Chief. What can we lose? If anybody takes offense, we can blame it on that Hollywood gang. Turn that damn thing off. If that blankety face isn't out of the sky in ten minutes, you can start emptying your desk. Tom was a redhead. He reached over and snapped the visiphone switch before his boss could have the satisfaction. He stomped to the window, still raging at Ostrich's lack of appreciation. But he chuckled when he saw the activity in the street. The crowds were thickening at the intersections, and a special battalion of city police were trying to keep things moving. Behind him, the visiphone was beeping frantically again. He waited a full minute before answering, all set to snap at Ostrich once more. But it was an Ostrich. It was a square-faced man with beetling brows and a chin like a biting end of a steam shovel. It took Tom a while to recognize the face of Stinson, Commissioner of Police. Mr. Blacker? Uh, yes, sir, Tom gulped. Mr. Ostrich referred me to you. You were responsible for that, uh... The Commissioner's voice was choked. That m menace? Menace, sir? You know what I'm talking about. We've got half a dozen CAA complaints already. That thing's a menace to public safety. A hazard to air travel. Look, Mr. Stinson, it's only a harmless publicity stunt. Harmless? You got funny ideas, Mr. Blacker. Don't get the wrong idea about our city ordinances. We got statutes that cover this kind of thing. If you don't want to be a victim of one of them, turn that damned monstrosity off. The commissioner's angry visage left a reverse shadow burned on the visiphone screen. It remained glowing there long after the contact was broken. Tom Blacker walked to the carpeted floor of his office, chewing on his lower lip, and cursing the feeble imaginations of Ostrich and the rest of them. 
When his temper had cooled, he got sober thoughts of indictments and lawsuits and unemployment. With a sigh, he contacted the engineer on the roof of the cannon building. Then he went to the window and watched Monica's thousand-foot face fade gradually out of sight. At four o'clock that afternoon, a long white envelope crossed Tom's blotter. There was a check to the amount of a month's salary enclosed and a briefly worded message from the office of the president. When he left the office, Ostrich's rolling phrases buzzed in his head like swarming gnats. A mockery of a great profession, lowering of dignity, incompatible with the highest ideals of... At ten o'clock that night, Tom was telling his troubles to a red-coated man behind a chromium bar on 49th Street. The man listened with all the gravity of a physician and lined up the appropriate medicine in front of his patient. By midnight, Tom was singing Christmas carols in advance of the season with a table full of Texans. At one o'clock, he swung a right cross at a mounted policeman, missed, and fell beneath the horse's legs. At one fifteen, he fell asleep against the shoulder of a bee-girl as they rode through the streets of the city in a sleek police vehicle. That was all Tom Blacker remembered until he woke up in Livia Cord's cozy two-room apartment. He moved his head and winced with the pain. Hi, the girl said. She was smiling down at him, and for a moment her floating face reminded Tom of the episode which had just cost him twenty grand a year. He groaned and rolled the other way on the contour couch. Hair of the dog, she said. There was a gleaming canister in her hand. No, thanks. He sat up, rubbing the stiff red hair on the back of his head. One eye seemed permanently screwed shut, but the other managed to take in his surroundings. It explored the girl first, and appreciatively. She was wearing something black and satiny, cut in the newest Dallas-approved style, with long, tantalizing diagonal slashes across the breast and hips. Her hair was strikingly two-toned, black and blonde. Her teeth were a blinding white and had been filed to canine sharpness. "'My name's Livia,' the girl said pleasantly. "'Livia Cord. I hope you don't mind what I did.' "'And what was that?' Tom's other eye popped open, almost audibly. "'Bailing you out of jail. Seems you got into a fracas with a mounted cop.' I think you tried to punch his horse. Nuts, I was trying to hit him. Well, you didn't, she chuckled and poured herself a drink. You've had quite a day, Mr. Blacker. You said it. There was a taste in his mouth like cigar ashes. He tried to stand up, but the weight on his head kept him where he was. He wouldn't have an oxygen pill around. Sure. She left with the toss of her skirt and a revelation of silky calves. When she returned with the tablet and water, he took it gratefully. After a few minutes, he felt better enough to ask, Why? What's that? Why'd you bail me out? I don't know you. Or do I? She laughed. <laughs> no, not yet you don't. But I know you, Mr. Blacker. By reputation, at any rate. You see, she sat next to him on the couch, and Tom was feeling well enough to tingle at her nearness. We're in the same line of work, you and I. Unemployment? <laughs> no. She smiled. Public relations. Only I'm on the client side of the fence. I work for an organization called Home Lovers Incorporated. Ever hear of them? Tom shook his head. Maybe you should. It's a rather important company and growing. And they're always on the lookout for superior talent. He squinted at her. What is this? A job offer? Maybe. She wriggled a little, and the slits in her dress widened just a fraction. We've got the nucleus of a good PR department now, but with a really experienced man at the controls, it could grow enormously. Think you might be interested? Maybe I would, Tom said, but he wasn't thinking about PR right then. Mr. Andrusco's had you in mind for a long time, Libby Accord continued. I've mentioned your name to him several times as a possible candidate. If you hadn't been fired from Ostrich, we might have tried to tempt you away. Her fingers touched a stray lock of red hair. Now we don't have to be surreptitious about it, do we? No, Tom said guardedly. I guess not. If you're free tomorrow, I could arrange a meeting with Mr. Andrusco. Would you like that? Well, his office opens at nine. We could get there early. Tom looked at his watch. Livia said, I know it's late, but we could get an early start in the morning, right after breakfast, couldn't we? I don't know, Tom frowned. By the time I get home... Home? The girl leaned back. Who said anything about home? Her bedroom was monochromed. Even the sheets were pink. At five o'clock, the false dawn glimmered through the window and the light falling on his eyes awakened him. He looked over at the sleeping girl, feeling drugged and detached. 
She moaned slightly and turned her face towards him. He blinked at the sight of it and cried aloud. What is it? She sat up in bed and nicked on the table lamp. What's the matter? He looked at her carefully. She was beautiful. There wasn't even a smudge of lipstick on her face. Nothing, he said dreamily and turned away. By the time he was asleep again, his mind had already erased the strange image from his clouded brain. That Livia Cord had absolutely no mouth at all. It was hard to keep track of the glass and steel structures that had been springing up daily along 5th Madison Thruway. When Tom and Livia stepped out of the cab in front of 320, he wasn't surprised that the building, an odd cylindrical affair with a pointed spire, was strange to him, but he was taken aback to realize that all 60 floors were the property of Home Lovers Incorporated. Quite a place, he told the girl. She smiled at him tightly. Livia was crackling with business electricity this morning, her spiked heels clicking along the marble floors of the lobby like typewriter keys. She wore a tailored gray suit that clung to her body with all the perfection and sexlessness of a window mannequin. In the elevator, shooting toward the executive offices on the 57th floor, Tom looked over at her and scratched his poorly shaven cheeks in wonderment. They plowed right through the frosty receptionist barrier and entered an office only half the size of Penn Station. The man behind the U-shaped desk couldn't have been better suited to the surroundings by central casting. He was cleft-jawed, tanned, exquisitely tailored. If his polished brown toupee had been better fitted, he would have been positively handsome. The handshake was firm. Good to see you, he grinned. Heard a lot about you, Mr. Blacker. All of it good. Well, Livia said airily, I've done my part. Now you two come to terms. Buzz me if you need me, J.A. John Andrusco unwrapped a cigar when she left and said, Well, now, suppose we get right down to cases, Mr. Blacker. Our organization is badly in need of a public relations setup that can pull out all the stops. We have money and we have influence. Now all we need is guidance. If you can supply that, there's a vacant chair at the end of the hall that can accommodate your backside. He grinned manfully. Well, Tom said delicately, my big problem is this, Mr. Andrusco. I don't know what the hell business you're in. The executive laughed heartily. Then let me fill you in. He stepped over to a cork-lined wall, pressed a concealed button, and panels parted. An organizational chart with designations that were meaningless to Tom appeared behind it. Speaking basically, Andrusco said, Home Lovers Incorporated represents the interests of the world's leading real estate concerns. Land, you know, is still the number one commodity of Earth. The one priceless possession that rarely deteriorates in value. In fact, with the increase in Earth's population, the one commodity that never seems to be in excess supply. I see, Tom said, not wholly in truth. The stability of real estate is our prime concern. By unification of our efforts, we have maintained these values over a good many years. But as you know, a good business organization never rests on its laurels. Sometimes even basic human needs undergo unusual alterations. I'm not following too well, Tom said frankly. Just where does public relations come into this? I can't see much connection. Andrusco frowned, but without wrinkling his serene brow too much. He went to the multi-paned window and locked his hands behind his back. Let me put it this way, Mr. Blacker. With the Earth's population approaching the three billion mark, you can imagine that real estate is at a greater premium than ever. Yes, even the remotest land areas have gained in market value. But let me ask you this. If there were only a hundred apples in the world and you owned all of them, what would you do if you learned that someone else had discovered a fruitful orchard which contains ten million apples? I'd go out of the apple business? Precisely. Andrusco rocked on his heels. In a sense, that's very much the problem that Home Lovers Incorporated may have to face in the next generation. Somebody swiping your apples? <laughs> in a way, the man chuckled. Yes, in a way. He raised his arm slowly and pointed to the sky. The apples, he said, are up there. Huh? Tom said. Space, Mr. Blacker. Space is opening its doors to us. Already, the UN Space Commission has launched some two dozen manned vehicles into the outer reaches. Already, the satellite-building colony on the moon is well underway. The progress of our space program has been accelerating month by month. 
The expert predictions have been more and more optimistic of late. In another 10, 20 years, the solar system will be beckoning the children of Earth. Tom said nothing for a while. Then he cleared his throat. <laughs> well, I'm no expert on these things, but maybe the population could stand a little more real estate, Mr. Andresco, in 20 years. Nonsense! The voice was snappish. The best authorities say it isn't so. There's plenty of room on Earth. But if ever a mass exodus begins... That doesn't seem possible, Tom said. Does it? I mean, only a handful of guys have ever gone out there. A drop in the bucket. I mean, Mars and all that may be fun to visit, but who'd want to live there? Andresco turned to him slowly. The apples in the new orchard may be sour, Mr. Blacker. But if your livelihood depended on your own little stack of fruit, would you be willing to sit by and take the chance? Tom shrugged. And is that the public relations job? To keep people out of space? Put in its crudest form, yes. A pretty tough job. You know that guff about man's pioneering spirit? Yes, but we're worried about the public spirit, Mr. Blacker. If we can dampen their ardor for space flight, only delay it, mind you, for another few years, we can tighten our own lines of economic defense. Do I make myself clear? Not completely. Will you take the job? What does it pay? 50000 Where do I sit? By the afternoon, Tom Blacker was ensconced in a fair-sized office with vaguely oriental furnishings and an ankle-deep rug. Livia's pretty ankles visited it first. Here's an outline I began on the PR program, she told him briskly, dropping a sheet of paper on his desk. I didn't get very far with it. I'm sure you can add a lot. Okay, I'll read it over this afternoon. He tipped the chair back. How about dinner tonight? Sorry, busy tonight. Maybe later this week. But it wasn't until Friday, three days later, that he saw Olivia Cord again. He accomplished that by calling her in for a conference, spreading his own typewritten notes on the desk in front of him. Got some rough ideas drafted on the program, he told her. The possibilities of this thing are really unlimited. Granted, of course, that there's money in this picture. Oh, there's money, all right, Livia said. We don't have to worry about that. Good. I put down a list of leading citizens that might be enrolled as backers for anything we might come up with. People who have been outspoken about the expense or danger of spaceflight. We'll keep it on file, and add to it as new names crop up in the press. Then, here's a listing of categories for us to develop sub-programs around. Religious, economic, social, medical. Medical's good. There's a heck of a lot of scare value in stories about cosmic rays, alien diseases, plagues, zero-gravity sickness, all that sort of thing. Sterility is a good gimmick. Impotence is even better. Livia smiled. I know what you mean. Hmm. Come to think of it, we ought to set up a special woman's point of view program, too. That'll be worth plenty. Then there's the tax question. We'll have to see what we can set up in Washington. Some kind of anti-space lobby. Good feature story material here, too. You know the stuff. One space vessel equals the cost of 200 county hospitals. Sounds great. We'll have to plan on press parties. Special stuff for the magazines and networks. And I've got a plan for some Hollywood promotion to counteract all this destination space garbage they've been turning out. And as for television... He talked on for another hour, feeling mounting excitement for the job he was doing. Tom wasn't sure that he liked the aims of Home Lovers Incorporated, but the challenge was enjoyable. Even at dinner that night in Livia's snug apartment, he rattled on about the PR program until the girl began to yawn. The bedroom was still monochrome, only Livia had transformed it magically into powder blue. Tom slept blissfully until morning and went into the office that weekend for sheer love of what he was doing. After less than a month, his efforts started producing results. On a crisp December morning, he found the following in his mail. Earth Song, a screenplay by Duncan Devine. Roger Tenblade, a dashing young rocket pilot in the UN Air Force, yearns to join the Space Expeditionary Force, now planning the first landing and colonization of the planet Mars. Despite the protest of his lovely fiancée, Diane, he embarks upon the journey. The trip is fraught with hazards, and the ship is struck by a meteor en route. Every member of the crew is killed except Roger, who heroically brings the vessel back to home base. However, Roger is exposed to large amounts of cosmic radiation. When he is so informed by the medical authorities, he realizes that he can never make Diane a normal husband. So rather than return to her and ruin her life, he changes his identity and disappears to South America, 
where he takes a job as a shuttle pilot for a third-class airline. Meanwhile, Diane marries Harold Farnsworth, scion of one of America's wealthiest families. Tom Blacker chuckled and slipped the scenario back into the envelope. He marked the manuscript OK for production and turned to the other mail. There was the prospectus of a television series that sounded interesting. He looked it over carefully. Captain Terra, half-hour television series, written by Craig Comfort. Captain Terra and his Earth cadets are dedicated to the principle of Earth above all and have sworn their lives to the preservation of Earth and its peoples and to the protection of Earth against the hostile aliens constantly threatening the planet. Program 1, Act 1. Bobby, Captain Terra's youthful aide, is attacked one day by a strange creature which he describes as half-man, half-snake. He reports the incident to Captain Terra, who calls a special session of his Earth Patrol to determine how best to deal with this enemy. Tom read the prospectus through, and then dictated a letter to its producers to call for an appointment. At the bottom of the mail pile, he found an enthusiastic letter from a theatrical producer named Homer Bradshaw, whom he had dealt with briefly during his career at Ostrich and Company. Dear Tom, great to hear about your new connection. Have a fabulous gimmick that ought to be right down your alley. And thinking of producing a new extravaganza entitled Be It Ever So Humble. This will be a real classy show with plenty of chorus line and top gags. We plan to kid the pants off this spaceman business until those bright boys in the glass hats cry uncle. I've already lined up James Hokum for the top banana and Sylvia Crow for the female lead. You know Sylvia? Tom, she'll make space flight sound about as chic as a debutante's ball on the Staten Island ferry. This is the way to do the job, Tom. Laugh him out of it. If you're interested in a piece of this, you can always reach me at... He was about to call it a day at 5.30 when he got a visiphone call from John Andrisco. When he walked into the immense office at the other end of the floor, he saw a glassy-eyed man standing at Andrisco's desk, twirling his hat with nervous fingers. Tom, Andrisco said cheerfully, want you to meet somebody. This is Sergeant Walt Spencer, formerly of the UN Space Commission. Tom shook the man's hand, and he could feel it trembling in his own. I called Walt in here specially, thanks to that memo you sent me, Tom. Great idea of yours about talking to some of the boys who've actually been in space. Walter here is willing to cooperate 100%. That's fine, Tom said uneasily. Thought you two ought to get together, Andrusco said, reaching for his hat. Think he can help a lot, Tom. Talk it over. Well, suppose we have a drink, Sergeant? That fit your plans all right? Suits me, the man said without emotion. They went down in the elevator together and slid into a red leather booth in the Tuscany bar in the base of the building. The sergeant ordered a double scotch and gulped it with the same respect you give water. So, you've been in space, Tom said, looking at him curiously. Must have been quite an experience. Yeah. Uh, I've... Take it you left the service? Yeah. Tom frowned and sipped his martini. How many trips did you make, Sergeant? Just one. Reconnaissance Moon Flight 4, about six years ago. You must have read about it. Yes, Tom said. Sorry. The man shrugged. Things happen. Even on Earth, things happen. Tell me something, Tom leaned forward. Is it true about... He paused, embarrassed. Well, you hear a lot of stories but I understand some of the men on that flight. The ones who got back all right had children and... Well, you know how the rumors go. Lies, Spencer said without rancor. I've got two kids myself, both of them normal. Oh, Tom tried to hide his disappointment behind the cocktail glass. It would have made great copy if he could have proved the truth of the old rumor about two-headed babies. But what could Sergeant Spencer do for the PR program? And Drisco must have had something in mind. He asked him point-blank. "'It's like this,' the man said, his eyes distant. "'Since I quit the service, I haven't been doing so good. "'With jobs, I mean. "'And Mr. Andrisco, he said he'd give me $5,000 if I'd help you people. "'Did Mr. Andrisco describe this help?' "'Yeah, he wants me to do a story about the kid my wife had. "'The first kid.' "'What about the first kid?' "'Well,' She died, the first kid did, in uh, childbirth. It was something that happens, you know, my wife's a little woman. The baby was smothered. I see, and what kind of story do you want to tell? It's not my idea. A hint of stubbornness glimmered in his dull eyes. It's that Andrisco guys. He wants me to tell how the baby was born a mutant. What? 
He wants me to release a story saying the baby was a freak. The kid was born at home, you see. The only other person who saw her besides me and my wife was this doctor we had, and he died a couple of years back. Tom slumped in his chair. This was pushing public relations a little far. Well, I don't know, he said. If the baby was really normal... It was normal, all right, only dead, that's all. Tom stood up. Okay, Sergeant Spencer, um, let me think it over, and I'll give you a buzz before the end of the week, all right? Anything you say, Chief. In the morning, Tom Blacker went storming into John Andrusco's plush office. Now, look, Mr. Andrusco, I don't mind slanting a story a little far, but this Spencer story of yours is nothing but a hoax. Andrusco looked hurt. Did he tell you that? How do you like that nerve? What do you mean? Why, that story's as genuine as gold. We've known about the freak birth for a long time, cosmic rays, you know. Those men on that reconnaissance flight really got bombarded. Tom wasn't sure of himself. You mean it's true? Of course it is. As a matter of fact, we've got a photograph of the dead baby right after it was delivered. The doctor who attended Mrs. Spencer took it without their knowledge as a medical curiosity. He sold it to us several years ago. We've never used it before because we knew that the Spencers would just deny it. Now that Walt's willing to cooperate. Can I see the photo? Why, certainly. He opened the top drawer and handed a glossy print across the desk. Tom looked at it and winced. Scales, he said. Like a fish, Andrusco said sadly. Pretty sad, isn't it? He looked out of the window and sighed cavernously. It's a menacing world up there. The rest of the day was wasted. Tom Blacker's mind wasn't functioning right. He told Livia about it at lunch. Livia Cord continued eating, chewing delicately on her food without flexing a muscle or wincing an eyebrow. On the 3rd of April, the story of Sergeant Walter Spencer's firstborn monster broke in newspapers, magazines, and telecasts across the country. It was a five-year-old story, but it carried too much significance for the space-minded present to be ignored. Two days later, Sergeant Spencer, 32, and his wife, Laura, 30, were found dead of asphyxiation in their new home in Greenwich, Connecticut. The cause of death was listed as suicide. Tom Blacker didn't hear the news until a day after it happened. He was in Washington, setting up a series of meetings with members of a house group investigating spaceflight expenditures. When he returned by copter that evening, he found Police Commissioner Joe Stinson waiting for him in Tom's own favorite chair. The square, heavy-jowled face was strangely calm. "'Long time no see.' he said mildly. You've been a busy man lately, Mr. Blacker. Hello, Mr. Stinson. Won't you come in? I'm in, the commissioner shrugged. Landlord, let me wait here. It's chilly outside. Do you want the preliminaries, or should we have the main bout? It's about Spencer, isn't it? Tom built himself a long drink. I heard about it on the copter radio flying in. Too bad. He was a nice guy. I never met his wife. But you knew him, right? In fact, you and the sergeant did a lot of business together. Look, Mr. Stinson, you know what kind of job I'm trying to do. It's no secret. Spencer's story happened to gear in nicely with our public relations effort, and that's all. Maybe it is. The commissioner's eyes hardened. Only, some of us aren't satisfied. Some of us are kind of restless about the coroner's verdict. What? You heard me. It's fishy, you know. Nice young couple buys a new house, then turns on the gas. Leaves behind a couple of kids, too. Boys, nice boys. I couldn't feel worse about it, Tom said glumly. In a way, I can almost feel responsible. How? I don't know. They were perfectly willing to release that story about their firstborn. But maybe when they actually saw it in print, they couldn't stand the spotlight. And that's your theory? <sighs> yes, but I hope I'm wrong, Mr. Stinson, for my own sake. The commissioner drew a folded sheet of paper out of his pocket. Let me read you something. This hasn't been released to the press, and maybe it won't be. Interested? Of course. It's a letter. A letter that was never mailed. It's addressed to Tom Blacker, care of Home Lovers Incorporated, 325th Madison, New York. What? Tom reached for it. Uh-uh. It was never mailed, so it's not your property, but I'll read it to you. He slipped on a pair of bifocals. Dear Mr. Blacker, I've been trying to reach you all week, but you've been out of town. Laura and I have just seen the first news story about our baby... And we're just sick about it. Why didn't you tell us about that photograph you were going to print? 
If we had known about that, we never would have consented to doing what you wanted. My wife never gave birth to that damn thing, and I don't care who knows it. I've called Mr. Andresco to tell him that we don't want any part of this business anymore. I'd send you back every penny of the $5,000, only we've already spent half of it. I'm going to call the newspapers and tell them everything. The commissioner paused. It goes on for another half page, but no use reading any more. I'd like a reaction, Mr. Blacker. Got one handy? Tom was on his feet. I don't believe it. His fist thudded into his palm. The letter's a fake. That's easy to prove, Mr. Blacker. But the picture was genuine, don't you see that? Sure, we paid Spencer something for his cooperation, but the picture was the real thing taken by his family doctor. You've heard what the medical authorities said about it. Stinson said nothing, then he got up slowly and walked to the door. Maybe so, but you're missing the point I want to make, Mr. Blacker. This letter was dated the same day as the Spencer suicides. Does it sound to you like the kind of thing a man would put in a suicide note? Think it over. Tom looked at the door the commissioner closed behind him. No, he said aloud. It doesn't. Tom didn't go to the home lover's building the next morning. He proceeded directly to the Lunt Theater, where Homer Bradshaw was putting Be It Ever So Humble into rehearsal. He was in no mood for the theater, but the appointment had been made too long before. When he came through the doors of the theater, Homer leaped halfway up the aisle to greet him and pounded his back like a long-lost pal. Actually, he had met the producer only twice before. "'Great to have you here, Tom,' he said enthusiastically. "'Great! We've just been putting things together. Got some red-hot numbers we had written specially for us. Wait till you hear them. He waved toward the two shirt-sleeved men hovering around the onstage piano. "'You know Julie, don't you? And Milt Steiner? Great team! Great team!' They took seats in the sixth row while Homer raved about the forthcoming production that was going to cost Home Lovers Incorporated some hundred thousand dollars. A dozen shapely girls in shorts and leotards were kicking their heels lackadaisically in the background, and a stout man with a wild checkered suit was wandering around the stage with an unlit cigar in his hand, begging the stagehands for a match. Hey, fellas, Homer Bradshaw called to the men at the piano. Run through that gypsy number for Mr. Blacker, huh? They came to life like animated dolls. The tallest of the pair stepped in front of the stage while the other thumped the piano keys. The tall one sang in a loud nasal voice with an abundance of gestures. Gypsy, gypsy, why do you have to be a gypsy? Life could be so ipsy-pipsy, staying home and getting tipsy, safe on earth with me. He swung into the second chorus while Tom Blacker kept his face from showing his true opinion of the specialty number. The next offering didn't change the viewpoint. It was a ballad. A blonde girl in clinging black shorts sang it feelingly. There's a beautiful earth tonight. There's a beautiful earth tonight. With a beautiful mellow light. Shining on my spaceman in the moon. Why did he leave me? Only to grieve me. Spaceman, come home to me soon. Did you like it? Did you like it? Homer Bradshaw said eagerly. (sighs) It'll do fine, Tom Blacker said with his teeth clenched. When he left the theater, Tom visiphoned the office to tell Libya that he was taking the rest of the day off. But he found that Libya herself was spending the day in her two-room apartment downtown. He hung up and decided that he had to talk to her about Stinson's visit. He hopped a cab and gave him Libya's address. John Andrisco answered the door. Well, thought you were at the office, Tom. He found himself glaring at the lean-jawed executive. What was Andrisco doing here? I've been over at the theater, Tom explained. Watching that musical we're spending all that dough on, he stepped inside. I might say the same about you, Mr. Andresco. Me? Oh, I just came over to talk some business with Livia. Poor kid's not feeling so hot, you know. No, I didn't. He dropped his hat familiarly on the contour couch, with almost too much deliberation. Livia in bed? No. The girl appeared at the door of the bedroom, wrapping a powder blue negligee around her. What brings you here, Tom? I... I wanted to talk something over with you. Now that you're here, Mr. Andresco, we can all talk it over. What's that? Andresco made himself at home at the bar. It's about Walt Spencer. Uh, I had a visitor last night, the police commissioner. He showed me a letter that Spencer had written just before he... uh, before he died. It was addressed to me, only Spencer had never mailed it. Andresco looked sharply at the girl. And what was in this letter? He was upset, Tom said. 
He wanted to back out of the deal we made, said the picture was a phony, but the thing that's bothering the police is the tone of the damned letter. It just doesn't sound like a man about to kill himself and his wife. Is that all? Livia took the drink from Andrusco's hand and sipped at it. I thought it was something serious. It is serious, Tom looked sternly at her. I want to know something, Mr. Andrusco. You told me that picture was genuine. Now I want you to tell me again. The man smiled with perfect teeth. How do you mean, genuine? Is it a picture of a genuine infant with scales? Yes. I assure you in that respect, the picture is absolutely genuine. Tom thought it over. Wait a while. Was the story genuine too? John Andrusco smiled. He sat on the sofa and rubbed the palms of his hands over his knees. Then he looked towards Livia Cord and said, Well, I didn't think we could hold out on our clever Mr. Blacker as long as we have. So we might as well enlist his cooperation fully, eh, Livia? I think so, the girl smiled, her teeth sharp. What does that mean? Tom said. The infant, John Andrusco answered slowly, was not Walter Spencer's child. That, I'm afraid, was nothing more than a little white lie. Tom looked confused. Then what was it? Livia finished her drink. It was my child. The man and the woman, whose grins now seemed permanently affixed to their faces, were forced to wait a considerable amount of time before Tom Blacker was both ready and able to listen to their explanation. Livia did most of the talking. You'll probably be horrified at all this, she said with a trace of amusement around her red mouth, particularly since you and I have been... She paused and looked toward Andrisco with a slight lift of her shoulder. Well, you know... But you needn't feel too squeamish, Tom. After all, I was born and raised on Earth. I am, you might say, an honorary Earth woman. Tom's eyes bulged at her. This civilization from which my husband and I claim ancestry is perhaps no older than your own. Unfortunately, we were not blessed with a planetary situation as agreeable as Earth's. Our sun is far feebler. The orbital paths of our moons act drastically upon our waters, causing generations of drought and centuries of flood. "'What are you talking about?' Tom said hoarsely. "'I speak of home,' Livia Court said, and her eyes gleamed. "'Antamunda is the name we give it,' John Andrusco said cordially. "'A world very much like your own in size and atmosphere, Mr. Blacker, but tragically a world whose usefulness has been gradually coming to an end.' Our ancestors, who were scientists of much ability, foresaw this some hundreds of years ago. Since that time, they have been seeking a solution to the problem. I don't believe this. We have, Livia said carefully, excellent evidence. Some five hundred years ago, Andrisco continued, our people dispatched an exploratory space vessel, a home-hunting force seeking to relocate the surviving members of our race. It was a long, trying odyssey, but it finally culminated in the selection of a new home. I needn't tell you that the home is in your own solar system. Tom shot to his feet. You mean Earth? You mean you want to take over here? Andrusco looked shocked. Certainly not. What a violent thought, Mr. Blacker. The planet you call Mars, Livia said coolly, was the selected destination. A planet with only limited facilities for the support of life, but a planet even more like our own dying world than Earth, Mr. Blacker. So you needn't cry havoc about alien invaders. She laughed sharply. Then what are you doing here? Merely waiting, Andrusco said. We are the offspring of the surviving members of the expeditionary force from Antamunda, placed here on Earth as a vanguard of the immigration that will shortly take place to this system. But your own world is in no danger, Mr. Blacker. That you must believe. Physically, our people are not your equals. Scientifically, we are advanced in certain fields and shamefully backwards in others. Biologically, he frowned, this is our greatest weakness. To the Antimundians, your breeding capacity is nothing short of grotesque. His handsome lip curled. He enjoyed watching Tom's reaction. Tom swallowed hard. 
How long have you been here? Some four generations have been born here. Our duty has been merely to await the arrival of our people. But in the last fifty years, we found ourselves faced with another obligation. It was that obligation which brought about the formation of Home Lovers Incorporated. I don't understand. We had underestimated the science of Earth. Our own necessity drove us towards the perfection of spaceflight. Earth had no such urgency. But now, Livia looked mournful, now we were faced with the possibility that Mars would soon be a colony of your own planet, before our people had a chance to make it their rightful home. You can see the consequences of that. A conflict of interests, a question of territorial rights, even the possibility of an interplanetary war. War? A possibility greatly to be abhorred, Andrusco said, and one we were sure we could eliminate if we merely delay the colonization of Mars. Don't you see? Livia said earnestly. If we could make Mars our natural home, then the people of Earth would come to us as friendly visitors, or invaders, whichever they prefer. But if we arrive too late... No, Tom, we feel that it is imperative to the peace of both our worlds that Antamunda reach Mars first. Then it's a race, Tom was bewildered. You may call it that, but a race we are determined to win, and we will win. Tom thought of another question. The infant, he said, the creature with scales. It was mine, the girl said sadly, born to John and me some ten years ago. Unfortunately, it did not live, and while your earth eyes may consider it a creature, she drew herself up proudly, it was a perfectly formed Antamundan child. Tom gaped at her. No, she said, answering the question in his gaze. You are not looking at us as we are. We lose our scales after our infancy when our mouths are formed. After a while, Tom asked, And what about Spencer? Unfortunate, the man said. His betrayal to the press would have done us incalculable harm. It was necessary to do what we did. Then... You did kill them. Livia turned her head aside. And you think I'll stand for that, Tom said. Perhaps not, Andrusco said. But frankly, I don't really know what you can do about it. Except, of course, repeat this explanation to the authorities. You're free to do that, Tom, any time at all. He smiled slyly. You think they won't believe me? Livia came over to Tom's chair and slithered one arm around his shoulder. Why, Tom, darling, are you so sure that you believe it? He left the apartment some ten minutes later and took a cab to 325th Madison. It was almost five o'clock and the steel and glass cylinder was emptying rapidly of its home lover's employees. He watched the stream of ordinary people stepping off the elevators, the young secretaries with their fresh faces and slim figures, laughing at office anecdotes and sharing intimate confidences about office bachelors. The smooth-cheeked young executives in their gray and blue suits, gripping well-stocked briefcases, and striding energetically down the lobby heading for the commuter trains. The paunchy, dignified men with their gray temples and gleaming spectacles, walking slowly to the exits, quoting stock prices and planning golf dates. The crowd eddied about him like a battling current as he made his way towards the elevators, and their images swam before his face in pink and white blurs. And for one terrible moment, in the thickest vortex of the crowd, he began to imagine that the faces were melting before his eyes, the mouths disappearing into the flesh, and below the white collars and black knit ties and starched pink blouses appeared a shimmering collection of ugly scales. He shuddered and stepped into an empty car, punching the button that shot him to the executive floor of the home lover's building. In his office, he switched on the visiphone and made contact with a square-faced man who frowned mightily when he recognized his caller. What do you want? Stinson said. I have to see you, Tom told him. I learned something this afternoon about Walt Spencer. I don't know whether you'll believe it or not, but I have to take that chance. Will you talk to me? All right, but we'll have to make it down here. I'll be there in an hour. I want to organize a few things first. Then we can talk. Tom switched off and began to empty his desk. 
He found nothing in the official communications of the home lovers that would substantiate his story, but he continued to gather what information he could about the PR program. He was just clicking the locks on his briefcase when a gray-haired woman with a pencil thrust into her curls popped her head in the doorway. Mr. Blacker, she smiled. I'm Dora, Mr. Wright's secretary. Mr. Wright wants to know if you'll stop in to see him. Wright? Tom said blankly. The treasurer. His office is just down the hall. He's very anxious to see you. Something about the expense sheets you turned in last week. Tom frowned. Oh, why don't I see him in the morning? It won't take but a minute. All right. He sighed and picked up the briefcase and followed Dora outside. She showed him the door of an office some thirty paces from his own, and he entered without knocking. A frail man with a bald head and a squiggly mustache stood up behind his desk. Oh, dear, he said nervously. I'm terribly sorry to do this, Mr. Blacker, but I have my instructions. Do what? Oh, dear, Mr. Wright said again. He took the gun that was lying in his outbox and fired it. His trembling hand sent the bullet spanging into the wooden frame of the door. Tom dropped to the thick carpet and then scrambled to the tall credenza set against the right wall of the office. He shoved it aside with his left hand and ducked behind it. The treasurer came out from behind his desk, still muttering to himself. Please, he said in anguish. This is very painful for me. He fired the gun again and the bullet tore a white hole in the wall above Tom's head. Don't be so difficult, the little man pleaded. Sooner or later... Tom insisted upon being difficult. His fingers closed around a loose volume of New York State tax laws and jiggled it in readiness. When the little treasurer came closer, he sprung from hiding and hurled the book. It slammed against Wright's side and surprised him enough to send the arm holding the weapon into the air. That was the advantage Tom wanted. He leaped into a low-flying tackle and brought Wright to the carpet. Then he was on top of the little man, grappling for the gun. Tom fought hard to get the gun. He got it, but not before it was fired again. Tom looked down at the widening stain that was marring the smooth texture of the carpet and was horrified. He bent down over the frail figure, lifting the bald head in his hands. Mr. Wright! The treasurer groaned. Oh, sorry, he said. Instructions, Mr. Blacker. From whom? Andrisco? Yes, your message reported from Switchboard. I had orders... Is it true? Tom said frantically. About Antamunda, is the story true? The little man nodded, then he lifted one hand feebly toward the desk. Gary, he said. Tell Gary. Tom looked in the direction of the gesture and saw the back of a framed photograph. When he turned to the treasurer again, the thin lips had stopped moving. He lowered the body to the floor and went to the desk. The photo was that of a young man with stiff bristled blonde hair and a rugged smile. The inscription read, To Pop with Deep Affection, Gary. Tom shook his head wonderingly. Were these creatures so very different? When Tom stepped out on 5th Madison some ten minutes later, it was just in time to watch a police vehicle draw up to the entrance of 320. Sensing danger, he stepped into the shade of the Tuscany Bar awning and watched the uniformed men pound their way down the marbled lobby floor towards the elevators. He thought fast and decided that the arrival of the police was connected with the shooting in Wright's office. The question was, who are they after? He walked into the Tuscany and headed for the bank of Visiphone booths. He dialed the police commissioner, but ducked out of the path of the Visiphone eye. Stinson growled at the blank screen. Who is it? Never mind, Tom said, muffling his voice. But if you want the killers of Walt Spencer and his wife, pick up John Andrusco and a gal named Libya Cord. Okay, Blacker, Stinson thundered. I knew you'd be calling in. Tom swore and showed himself. Listen, I'm telling you the truth. They told me the whole story. Then they tried to have me killed. Is that so? And I suppose the assassin was a guy named Wright? Yes. Okay, wise guy, we're on to you. You've been pocketing some of the home lover's dough and the treasurer found you out. Isn't that the story? No, Wright's one of them. Sure, pal, whatever you say. Only stay right where you are so you can do your explaining proper. Tom tightened his lips. Uh-uh, I don't like the sound of things. I'll see you later, Mr. Stinson. Blacker! Tom switched off. 
By the time he was settled behind the redneck of a cab driver, Tom was wiping a dripping film of sweat from his forehead. He couldn't return to his apartment. There was bound to be a stakeout. He couldn't go to Livia's, that would be walking right into danger. And he couldn't go to Stinson without risking a murder charge. He leaned forward. Driver, make that the LaGuardia heliport. However efficient Stinson's operations might have been, their tentacles hadn't reached the copter rental station at the heliport. Tom signed out a speedy vessel under an assumed name and taxied it down the runway. Then he pointed the nose west and radioed ahead to his destination at Washington, D.C. Colonel Grady Mortigan had the thoughtful air of a scholar in the body of a college wrestler. When Tom Blacker's name was announced to him, his mouth turned down grimly. He was commanding officer of the Space Flight Commission of the U.N. Air Force, and he had good reason to frown at the sound of the PR man's name. But he invited him into his office. So you're Tom Blacker, he said, pinching his jaw. I've heard a lot about you, Mr. Blacker. I'm sure, Tom said. Only, I want to tell you this, Colonel. I've broken my connection with home lovers. I'm on your side now. Side? There are no sides in this issue, Mr. Blacker. As far as I'm concerned, home lovers is nothing but a flea on the lip of a lion. A damned annoying flea, maybe, but nothing more than that. Now, what do you want? I have to talk to you about something. Something I just found out. Will you listen to me? The colonel leaned back, looking at his watch. Five minutes, he snapped. Tom talked for fifteen. Mortigan didn't call a halt until he was finished, listening without a change of expression. When Tom ran out of words, he merely tapped his fingers on the desk. And that's your whole story, he said gently. Y yes, sir. I, I know it's a wild one. That's one of the things they're counting on. It's just wild enough to get me put into a laughing academy, where I can't do them any mischief. But I had to take that chance, Colonel. I see. And this man you killed, what's happening about that? I don't know, Tom said. The way I figure it, Andrusco and the girl have told the police that I was embezzling money from the firm, that I killed the treasurer for my own protection. But it's not true. He's one of them, one of those creatures. But you have no real proof. Tom's back stiffened. No, he said grimly. If I had proof, I'd have gone to the police, but I came here instead. Now you can tell me if I did the right thing. Mortigan grimaced. I don't know, damn it. I don't have any love for the home lovers. To me, they've always been a bunch of greedy businessmen, intent on salvaging their franchises at any expense. But it's not easy to think of them as a bunch of... His mouth twisted. Loathsome aliens. Maybe not so loathsome, Tom said miserably. I, I just don't know. Maybe their cause is as just to them as ours is to us. But they're determined to reach Mars before we do. Before you do. And they'll do anything to make sure... The colonel stood up. But I'm afraid that question is academic, Mr. Blacker. Because if our calculations are right, an Earth vessel will be on the planet Mars within the next 36 hours. What? No announcement has been made. But a Mars-bound ship was launched almost a month ago, containing seven members of the Space Commission... Our last radio contact with Captain Wright leads us to expect... Who? Tom was on his feet. Captain Gary Wright, the commander of the ship. His brow knitted. Why, do you know him? I'm, I'm not sure, Tom said weakly. But if he's the same man, then that flight's in danger. What are you talking about? Tom concluded his story about the death of the home lover's treasurer down to the last detail of the framed photograph on Wright's desk. The tale brought Colonel Mortigan into immediate action. He buzzed for his orderly and, in another minute, was fumbling through a folder marked classified. Yes, he said numbly. It's the same man. Father's name Benjamin Wright, and he's vice president and treasurer of Home Lovers Incorporated. I never connected the two. He looked up, his eyes heavy. If your story is true, Mr. Blacker, then Captain Wright is one of these so-called Antimundans. And if their mission is what you say it is... Tom clenched his fists on the blotter. Please, sir, let me stay here until the flight is concluded. After that, you can do what you like. All right, Morgan said wearily. I'll fix you up with something in the officer's quarters, but I'm sure you're wrong, Mr. Blacker. You have to be. Twenty-four hours later, radio contact with the Mars Expeditionary ship ceased abruptly. 
From Mount Wilson Observatory, a hurried message arrived, reporting a small brief nova in the orbital vicinity of the planet Mars. Tom Blacker, dozing fitfully on a cot in the quarters of a grumpy lieutenant colonel, was awakened suddenly and summoned to the office of Colonel Grady Mortigan. "'Very well, Mr. Blacker,' the colonel said stiffly. "'I'm willing to help. Just tell me what you want me to do.' The receptionist smiled icily at Tom, and then the smile vanished like a Martian polar cap. "'Why, Mr. Blacker?' "'Hi, Stella,' he grinned. "'Mr. Andrusco in his office?' Why, I don't know. Suppose I give him a ring. He stopped the hand that was reaching for the telephone. No need of that. I think I'll just surprise him. After all, it's been some time. He turned the knob of John Andresco's door slowly. Livia was with him. When he entered, they both stood up hastily, their eyes wide and their mouths unhinged. Livia reacted first. She cried out his name, then sat down heavily, as if the words had been a physical force. Hi, Livia, Tom said casually. Good to see you again, Mr. Andresco. Sorry that I haven't been around, but things have been pretty hectic for me lately. How did you get here? Andresco's voice was choked. I've been here all weekend, if you want to know. Tom seated himself blithely. As a matter of fact, the Home Lovers building has had quite a lot of visitors this weekend. What do you mean? You know the staff of cleaning personnel that invades this place every Saturday? Well, there were some changes made this particular weekend. I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing about them. Livia said, Shall I call the police, John? The police were represented, Tom said. Don't worry about that. In fact, the top technicians from three government agencies were doing the housework around here this weekend, Mr. Andresco. They probably didn't get the building much cleaner, but they swept up a lot of other things. Yes, they certainly uncovered other things. Andresco walked over to Livia and touched her shoulder in a comforting gesture. The sight of them made Tom scowl. All right, he said roughly. I'm not blaming you for what you're doing, but things were getting out of hand, Mr. Andresco. That's why we had to put a stop to it. And have you? Andresco asked politely. I'm afraid so. It was quite a shock, let me tell you. We didn't know what to expect when we dissected this building of yours, but the last thing we expected to find was a spaceship. Andresco smiled. It was cleverly done. You'll have to admit that. I do, Tom said fervently. You've got those space flight experts absolutely insane with curiosity. They'll want to hear the whole story. Will you give it to them? The man shrugged. It doesn't matter, I suppose. I presume the engines have been dismantled. Made inoperable, yes, it would have been a great trick if you could have done it. Livia spoke sadly. It was the only thing we could have done. There's no place on this earth where we could have erected a spaceship without being observed, so we created this building. In time, we would have perfected the mechanism and left this silly planet of yours. That's what I don't understand, Tom said. What about Antimunda and the survivors? There's no longer an Antimunda. John Andresco said hollowly. The story we told you was true in its essence, but not, I'm afraid, complete. You see, the exodus that took place 500 years ago was a total exodus. The entire population of our world, a handful, a pitiful ragged thousand, left Antimunda for this planet. We thought to make it our new home for all eternity. But in time we learned that we had immigrated to an extinction just as certain. What do you mean? This world is cursed to us, Mr. Blacker. I can't tell you why. We breed slowly, infrequently. You might even say thoughtfully. And on your planet, but one child in a thousand has survived the rigors of childbirth on Earth. He looked at Livia, and the woman lowered her eyes and remembered sorrow. That's why we had to leave, Andrusco said, to repopulate elsewhere. We chose the planet Mars, and we were determined to make it our home before your world claimed it. Our scientists and technicians have worked on nothing else but this flight since the beginning of the last century. This building, this vessel, was the culmination of our plans. In another few years, we would have been ready. The dream would have been realized. Tom walked to the window of the office and looked out at a bank of swift-moving clouds drifting past the spire of the home lover's building. I'm afraid that's the saddest part, he said. 
The atomic engines in the basement have been examined, Mr. Andrusco. The best opinions say that they're pitifully inadequate. The men who studied them say that you never would have made the journey in safety. That can't be true. In time. In time, perhaps. But since you're landing here, your scientists have forgotten a great deal about spaceflight. I'm afraid you would have never reached that promised land. Andresco said, Then we must die. No, Tom said. Livia looked at him. I said no, he repeated. The Antimundans can live. Don't you see that? No, Andresco said, shaking his head. On Earth we shall die. If Mars is closed to us... Can't you see? If Mars can be opened for Earth, then it can be opened for you, too. For all Antimundans. Your people can make the journey, too, once space has been cleared for Earth ships. You can still have your new home. Perhaps, Livia said dreamily, perhaps that is the only way. But by then, Tom, it will already be too late. There's been no living child born to us in the last ten years. By the time the Earth people reach Mars and establish regular passageway, we will be too old to keep the race alive. Then let's speed it up, he said. Let's make sure that the space lanes open. Let's do everything to make space the most important project on Earth. But how? Andrusco said, bewildered. Tom went to the visiphone. Get me the Lunt Theater, he snapped. Homer Bradshaw's face appeared. Mr. Bradshaw. Hi, Tom. How's the boy? Great, Homer. Great. Only listen, I got a new angle for you. We're going to doctor up that show of yours before the opening. Don't worry about the dough. Home lovers will take care of it with pleasure. Sure, Tom. Anything you say. Then take this down. The first thing we're changing is the title. From now on, it's Mars or Bust. End of Get Out of Our Skies by Henry Slazar. Dead Ringer by Lester Del Rey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ron Altman Dead Ringer by Lester Del Rey Dane Phillips slouched in the window seat, watching the morning crowds on their way to work, and carefully avoiding any attempt to read Jordan's old face as the editor skimmed through their notes. He had learned to make his tall, bony body seem all loose-jointed relaxation, no matter what he felt but the oversized hands in his pockets were clenched so tightly that the nails were cutting into his palms. Every tick of the old-fashioned clock sent a throb racing through his brain. Every rustle of the pages seemed to release a fresh shot of adrenaline into his bloodstream. This time, his mind was pleading, it has to be right this time. Jordan finished his reading and shoved the folder back. He reached for his pipe, sighed, and then nodded slowly. A nice job of researching, Phillips, and it might make a good feature for the Sunday section at that. It took a second to realize that the words meant acceptance, for Phillips had prepared himself too thoroughly against another failure. Now he felt the tautened muscles release so quickly that he would have fallen if he hadn't been braced against the seat. He groped in his mind, hunting for words and finding none. There was only the hot, sudden flame of unbelieving hope, and then an almost blinding exultation. Jordan didn't seem to notice his silence. The editor made a neat pile of the notes, nodding again. Sure, I like it. We've been short of shock stuff lately, and the readers go for it when we can get a fresh angle. But naturally you'd have to leave out all that nonsense on Blanding. Hell, the man's just buried, and his relatives and friends— But that's the proof! Phillips stared at the editor, trying to penetrate through the haze of hope that had somehow grown chilled and unreal. 
His thoughts were abruptly disorganized and out of his control. Only the urgency remained. It's the key evidence, and we've got to move fast. I don't know how long it takes, but even one more day may be too late. Jordan nearly dropped the pipe from his lips as he jerked upright to peer sharply at the younger man. Are you crazy? Do you seriously expect me to get an order to exhume him now? What would it get us other than lawsuits? Even if we could get the order without cause, which we can't. Then the pipe did fall as he gaped open-mouthed. My God, you believe all that stuff! You expected us to publish it straight. No, Dane said thickly. The hope was gone now, as if it had never existed, leaving a numb emptiness where nothing mattered. No, I guess I didn't really expect anything. But I believe the facts. Why shouldn't I? He reached for the papers with hands he could hardly control and began stuffing them back into the folder. All the careful documentation, the fingerprints, smudged, perhaps, in some cases, but still evidence enough for anyone but a fool. Phillips? Jordan said questioningly to himself, and then his voice was taking on a new edge. Phillips, wait a minute, I've got it now. Dane Phillips, not Arthur. Two years on the Trib. Then you turned up on the register in Seattle. Philip Dean, or some such name there. Yeah, Dane agreed. There was no use in denying anything now. Yeah, Dane, Arthur, Phillips. So I suppose I'm through here. Jordan nodded again, and there was a faint look of fear in his expression. You can pick up your pay on the way out, and make it quick before I change my mind and call the boys in white. It could have been worse. It had been worse before, and there was enough in the pay envelope to buy what he needed. A flash camera, a little folding shovel from one of the surplus houses, and a bottle of good scotch. It would be dark enough for him to taxi out to Oakhaven Cemetery, where Blanding had been buried. It wouldn't change the minds of the fools, of course, even if he could drag back what he might find without the change being completed, they wouldn't accept the evidence. He'd been crazy to think anything could change their minds, and they called him a fanatic. If the facts he'd dug up in ten years of hunting wouldn't convince them, nothing would, and yet he had to see for himself before it was too late. He picked a cheap hotel at random and checked in under an assumed name. He couldn't go back to his room while there was a chance that Jordan still might try to turn him in. There wouldn't be time for Sylvia's detectives to bother him, probably. But there was the ever-present danger that one of the aliens might intercept the message. He shivered. He'd been risking that for ten years yet the likelihood was still a horror to him. The uncertainty made it harder to take than any human-devised torture could be. There was no way of guessing what an alien might do to anyone who discovered that all men were not human, that some were zombies. There was the classic syllogism, All men are mortal. I am a man. Therefore, I am mortal but not Blanding, or Corporal Harding. It was Harding's death that had started it all during the fighting on Guadalcanal. A grenade had come flying into the foxhole where Dane and Harding had felt reasonably safe. The concussion had knocked Dane out, possibly saving his life when the enemy thought he was dead. He'd come to in the daylight to see Harding lying there, mangled and twisted with his throat torn. There was blood on Dane's uniform, obviously spattered from the dead man. It hadn't been a mistake or delusion. Harding had been dead. It had taken Dane two days of crawling and hiding to get back to his group. Too exhausted to report Harding's death, he'd slept for twenty hours. And when he awoke, 
Harding had been standing beside him, with a whole throat and a fresh uniform, grinning and kidding him for running off and leaving a stunned friend behind. It was no ringer, but Harding himself, complete to the smallest personal memories and personality traits. The pressures of war probably saved Dane's sanity while he learned to face the facts. All men are mortal. Harding is not mortal. Therefore Harding is not a man. Nor was Harding alone. Dane found enough evidence to know there were others. The Tribune morgue yielded even more data. A man had faced seven firing squads and walked away. Another survived over a dozen attacks by professional killers. Fingerprints turned up mysteriously copied from those of men long dead. Some of the aliens seemed to heal almost instantly. Others took days. Some operated completely alone. Some seemed to have joined with others. But they were legion. Lack of a clearer pattern of attack made him consider the possibility of human mutation. But such tissue was too wildly different and the invasion had begun long before atomics or x-rays. He gave up trying to understand their alien motivations. It was enough that they existed in secret, slowly growing in numbers while mankind was unaware of them. When his proof was complete and irrefutable, he took it to his editor, to be fired, politely but coldly. Other editors were less polite but he went on doggedly trying and failing. What else could he do? Somehow he had to find the few people who could recognize facts and warn them. The aliens would get him, of course, when the story broke, but a warned humanity could cope with them. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then he met Sylvia by accident after losing his fifth job a girl who had inherited a fortune big enough to spread his message in paid ads across the country. They were married before he found she was hard-headed about her money. She demanded a full explanation for every cent beyond his allowance. In the end she got the explanation. And while he was trying to cash the check she gave him, she visited Dr. Buell, to come back with a squad of quiet, refined, strong-arm boys, who made sure Dane reached Buell's rest home safely. Hydrotherapy. Buell as the kindly, firm father image. Analysis. Hypnosis that stripped every secret from him, including his worst childhood nightmare. His father had committed a violent, bloody suicide, after one of the many quarrels with Dane's mother. Dane had found the body. Two nights after the funeral he had dreamed of his father's face horror-filled at the window. He knew now that it was a normal nightmare, caused by being forced to look at the face in the coffin, but the shock had lasted for years. It had bothered him again after his discovery of the aliens until a thorough check had proved without doubt that his father had been fully human, with a human, if tempestuous, childhood behind him. Dr. Buell was delighted. You see, Day, you know it was a nightmare, but you don't really believe it, even now. Your father was an alien monster to you. No adult is quite human to a child, and that literal-minded self, your subconscious, saw him after he died. So there are alien monsters who return from death. Then you come to from a concussion. Harding is sprawled out unconscious, covered with blood, probably your blood, since you say he wasn't wounded later. But after seeing your father, you can't associate blood with yourself. You see it as a horrible wound on Harding. When he turns out to be alive, you're still in partial shock with your subconscious dominant. 
and that has the answer already. There are monsters who come back from the dead. An exaggerated reaction, but nothing really abnormal. We'll have you out of here in no time. No non-directive psychiatry for Buell. The man beamed paternally, chuckling as he added what he must have considered the clincher. Anyhow, even zombies can't stand fire, Dane, so you can stop worrying about Harding. I checked up on him. He was burned to a crisp in a hotel fire two months ago. It was logical enough to shake Dane's faith until he came across Milo Blanding's picture in a magazine article on society in St. Louis. According to the item, Milo was a cousin of the Blandings, whose father had vanished in Chile as a young man and who had just rejoined the family. The picture was of Harding. An alien could have gotten away by simply committing suicide and being carried from the rest home, but Dane had to do it the hard way, watching his chance and using commando tactics on a guard who had come to accept him as a harmless nut. In St. Louis he'd used the purloined letter technique to hide, going back to newspaper work and using almost his real name. It had seemed to work, too, but he'd been less lucky about Harding-Blanding. The man had been in Europe on some kind of a tour until his return only this last week. Dane had seen him just once then, but long enough to be sure it was Harding, before he died again. This time it was in a drunken auto accident that seemed to be none of his fault, but left his body a mangled wreck. It was almost dark when Dane dismissed the taxi at the false address, a mile from the entrance to the cemetery. He watched it turn back down the road, then picked up the valise with his camera and folding shovel. He shivered as he moved reluctantly ahead. War had proved that he would never be a brave man, and the old fears of darkness and graveyards were still strong in him but he had to know what the coffin contained now, if it wasn't already too late. It represented the missing link in his picture of the aliens. What happened to them during the period of regrowth? Did they revert to their natural form? Were they at all conscious while the body reshaped itself into wholeness? Dane had puzzled over it night after night with no answer nor could he figure how they could escape from the grave. Perhaps a man could force his way out of some of the coffins he had inspected. The soil would still be soft and loose in the grave, and a lot of the coffins and the boxes around them were strong in appearance only. A determined creature that could exist without much air for long enough might make it. But there were other caskets that couldn't be cracked at least without the aid of outside help. What happened when a creature that could survive even the poison of embalming fluids and the draining of all the blood woke up in such a coffin? Dane's mind skittered from it, as always, and then came back to it reluctantly. There were still accounts of corpses turned up with the nails and hair grown long in the grave. Could normal tissues stand the current tricks of the morticians to have life enough for such growth? The possibility was absurd. Those cases had to be aliens, ones who hadn't escaped. Even they must die eventually in such a case, after weeks and months. It took time for hair to grow. And there were stories of corpses that had apparently fought and twisted in their coffins still. What was it like for an alien, then, going slowly mad while it waited for true death? How long did madness take? He shivered again, but went steadily on, while the cemetery fence appeared in the distance. He'd seen Blanding's coffin, and the big solid metal casket around it, 
that couldn't be cracked by any amount of effort and strength. He was sure the creature was still there, unless it had a confederate. But that wouldn't matter. An empty coffin would also be proof. Dane avoided the main gate, unsure about whether there would be a watchman or not. A hundred feet away there was a tree near the ornamental spikes of the iron fence. He threw his bag over and began shinnying up. It was difficult, but he made it finally, dropping onto the soft grass beyond. There was the trace of the moon at times through the clouds, but it hadn't betrayed him, and there had been no alarm wire along the top of the fence. He moved from shadow to shadow, his hair prickling along the base of his neck. Locating the right grave in the darkness was harder than he had expected, even with an occasional brief use of the small flashlight. But at last he found the marker that was serving until the regular monument could arrive. His hands were sweating so much that it was hard to use the small shovel, but the digging of foxholes had given him experience, and the ground was still soft from the grave digger's work. He stopped once as the moon came out briefly. Again a sound in the darkness above left him hovering and sick in the hole, but it must have been only some animal. He uncovered the top of the casket with hands already blistering. Then he cursed as he realized the catches were near the bottom, making his work even harder. He reached them at last, fumbling them open. The metal top of the casket seemed to be a dome of solid lead, and he had no room to maneuver, but it began swinging up reluctantly until he could feel the polished wood of the coffin. Dane reached for the lid with hands he could barely control. Fear was thick in his throat now. What could an alien do to a man who discovered it? Would it be harding there? or some monstrous thing still changing. How long did it take a revived monster to go mad when it found no way to escape? He gripped the shovel in one hand, working at the lid with the other. Now abruptly his nerves steadied, as they had done whenever he was in real battle. He swung the lid up and began groping for the camera. His hand went into the silk-lined interior and found nothing. He was too late. Either Harding had gotten out somehow before the final ceremony, or a confederate had already been here. The coffin was empty. There were no warning sounds this time. Only hands that slipped under his arms and across his mouth, lifting him easily from the grave. A match flared briefly and he was looking into the face of Buell's chief strong-arm man. "'Hello, Mr. Phillips. Promise to be quiet, and we'll release you, okay?' At Dane's sickened nod he gestured to the others. "'Let him go. And, Tom, better get that filled in. We don't want any trouble from this.' Surprise came from the grave a moment later. "'Hey, Burke, there's no corpse here.' Burke's words killed any hopes Dane had at once. "'So what? Ever hear of cremation? Lots of people use a regular coffin for the ashes.' "'He wasn't cremated,' Dane told him. "'You can check up on that.' But he knew it was useless. "'Sure, Mr. Phillips. We'll do that.' The tone was one reserved for humoring madmen. Burke turned, gesturing. "'Better come along, Mr. Phillips. Your wife and Dr. Buell are waiting at the hotel.' The gate was open now, but there was no sign of a watchman. If one worked here, Sylvia's money would have taken care of that, of course. Dane went along quietly, sitting in the rubble of his hopes, while the big car purred through the morning and on down Lindell Boulevard, toward the hotel. Once he shivered and Burke dug out hot brandied coffee. They had thought of everything, including a coat to cover his dirt-soiled clothes 
as they took him up the elevator to where Buell and Sylvia were waiting for him. She had been crying, obviously, but there were no tears or recriminations when she came over to kiss him. Funny, she must still love him, as he'd learned to his surprise he loved her. Under different circumstances. So you found me, he asked needlessly of Buell. He was operating on purely automatic habits now, the reaction from the night and his failure numbing him emotionally. Jordan got in touch with you? Buell smiled back at him. We knew where you were all along, Dane. But as long as you acted normal, we hoped it might be better than the home. Too bad we couldn't stop you before you got all mixed up in this. So I suppose I'm committed to your booby hatch again? Buell nodded, refusing to resent the term. I'm afraid so, Dane. For a while, anyhow. You'll find your clothes in that room. Why don't you clean up a little? Take a hot bath, maybe. You'll feel better. Dane went in, surprised when no guards followed him. But they had thought of everything. What looked like a screen on the window had been recently installed, and it was strong enough to prevent his escape. Blessed are the poor, for they shall be poorly guarded. He was turning on the shower when he heard the sound of voices coming through the door. He left the water running and came back to listen. Sylvia was speaking. Seems so logical, so completely rational. It makes him a dangerous person, Buell answered, and there was no false warmth in his voice now. Sylvia, you've got to admit it to yourself. All the reason and analysis in the world won't convince him is wrong. This time we'll have to use shock treatment. Burn over those memories. Fade them out. It's the only possible course. There was a pause, and then a sigh. I, I suppose you're right. Dane didn't wait to hear more. He drew back while his mind fought to accept the hideous reality. Shock treatment. The works, if what he knew of psychiatry was correct. Enough of it to erase his memories. A part of himself. It wasn't therapy Buell was considering. It couldn't be. It was the answer of an alien that had a human in its hands, one who knew too much. He might have guessed what better place for an alien than in the guise of a psychiatrist. Where else was there the chance for all the refined modern torture needed to burn out a man's mind? Dane had spent ten years in fear of being discovered by them, and now Buell had him. Sylvia? He couldn't be sure. Probably she was human. It wouldn't make any difference. There was nothing he could do through her. Either she was part of the game, or she really thought him mad. Dane tried the window again, but it was hopeless. There would be no escape this time. Buell couldn't risk it. The shock treatment, or whatever Buell would use under the name of shock treatment, would begin at once. It would be easy to slip, to use an overdose of something, to make sure Dane was killed. Or there were ways of making sure it didn't matter. They could leave him alive, but take his mind away. In alien hands, human psychiatry could do worse than all the medieval torture chambers. The sickness grew in his stomach as he considered the worst that could happen. Death he could accept if he had to. He could even face the chance of torture by itself, as he had accepted the danger while trying to have his facts published. But to have his mind taken from him, a step at a time, to watch his personality, his ego, rotted away under him, and to know that he would wind up as a drooling idiot— he made his decision almost as quickly as he had come to realize what Buell must be. There was a razor in the medicine chest. 
It was a safety razor, of course, but the blade was sharp and it would be big enough. There was no time for careful planning. One of the guards might come in at any moment if they thought he was taking too long. Some fear came back as he leaned over the wash basin, staring at his throat, fingering the suddenly murderous blade. But the pain wouldn't last long, a lot less than there would be under shock treatment and less pain. He'd read enough to feel sure of that. Twice he braced himself and failed at the last second. His mind flashed out in wild schemes, fighting against what it knew had to be done. The world still had to be warned. If he could escape somehow, if he could still find a way, he couldn't quit, no matter how impossible things looked. But he knew better. There was nothing one man could do against the aliens in this world they had taken over. He'd never had a chance. Man had been chained already by carefully developed ridicule against superstition, by carefully indoctrinated gobbledygook about insanity, persecution complexes, and all the rest. For a second, Dane even considered the possibility that he was insane, but he knew it was only a blind effort to cling to life. There had been no insanity in him when he'd groped for evidence in the coffin and found it empty. He leaned over the wash basin, his eyes focused on his throat, and his hand came down and around, carrying the razor blade through a lethal semicircle. Dane Phillips watched fear give place to sickness on his face as the pain lanced through him and the blood spurted. He watched horror creep up to replace the sickness while the bleeding stopped and the gash began closing. By the time he recognized his expression as the same one he'd seen on his father's face at the window so long ago, the wound was completely healed. End of Dead Ringer by Lester Del Rey Your reader was Ron Altman The Enemy by Richard Wilson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Enemy by Richard Wilson Read by Quartertone At dusk, the sergeant leaned over the parapet, weary, looking south toward the enemy lines. For him, this was the worst part of the day. The fighting was done until tomorrow, and the enemy casualties were being brought in through the gate below. Their bodies were piled in awful abandon on the big flatbed trucks. A phrase from another war came to his mind. Walking wounded. There were no walking wounded in this war. They came in on the trucks still and tangled, or they didn't come in at all. He couldn't have merely wounded one of the enemy as soldiers used to. The thought of inflicting such an injury in the old conventional way was obscene. To strike through the breast into the heart. He shuddered with a trembling that came up through the thighs and contracted his stomach. The lieutenant had come to stand beside him. "'You shouldn't watch if it bothers you,' the lieutenant said. "'It's all right, sir,' the sergeant said. He looked down again. "'We had a good day. Three hundred, the colonel said. "'That's good.' The sergeant laughed sardonically. Are we winning? It's hard to say. We're not losing. Aren't we, sir? The sergeant spoke bitterly. Aren't they? Aren't we all? Look, sergeant, the lieutenant began. Then he shrugged. The sergeant was older than he was by seven or eight years. There was no need to give him an orientation lecture. He reached in his pocket and took out a fresh pack of cigarettes. He opened it. Have one. A shipment just got in. Thanks. The sergeant took a cigarette. He stared at it, and the fingers holding it trembled. Look at it, he said hollowly. Look at the freaking thing. The lieutenant looked at it, then at the front of the pack. Ruby tips to match your lips. 
it said under the brand name. What are they doing to us? the sergeant said. He crumpled the cigarette in his fist and threw it down and ground it under his boot. Isn't it hard enough? It must be a mistake, the lieutenant said. He sounded shaken, too. Because of the shortage, maybe, unless it's a fifth column trick, like the rumor about them not going to wake up again. It's just a rumor, isn't it? the sergeant said. His voice was almost pleading. We just freeze them for... for the duration, don't we? Don't we, lieutenant? Because I couldn't go on if they were really dead. Nobody could. The lieutenant spoke sharply. Snap out of it, sergeant. It's just propaganda. I'm surprised at an old hand like you falling for it. I'm not, sir. We couldn't really kill them, could we? It'd be suicide, wouldn't it? It's not total war, is it? Not total, no. There'll be an end to it one day, and then a beginning again. I know it's hard, but it's the only way. The last of the big trucks had rumbled in from the battlefield. The sergeant watched the gate close in the fading light. Beloved enemy, he thought. Three hundred today, he said aloud. And one was my personal contribution. My platoon was strung up behind me, and she came up over the hill. Sergeant! She was mine! I got her personally. I aimed slow and held the sight on her. Then I let go. It was almost like, Sergeant! The lieutenant was trembling. The third person singular is prohibited. You know that, Sergeant. The sergeant was calm. Yes, sir. He looked at the young officer. But I feel better for having told it. I'm all right now, sir. I hope I didn't upset you. No, the lieutenant said. No, we'll forget about it. I'll have one of those cigarettes now, sir, if you don't mind. It doesn't matter about the tip, now that it's dark. Well, the lieutenant hesitated. I was going to send them back to Quartermaster with a report, but all right, here, I'll have one too. As the sergeant lit them, he could see a bit of the red tip in the lieutenant's mouth. He dragged deep on his own, pretending he could taste lipstick. Lieutenant, he said, it doesn't matter where you hit them, does it? I mean, it doesn't hurt them at all? No, the lieutenant said. No, it doesn't matter. They just go to sleep. I'm glad. After a while, the sergeant said, I guess I'll hit the sack. It's still early. Yes, but I like to get up early. There's always a line in the latrine at the shaving bowls. Combat troops don't have to shave, the lieutenant said. I know, but we do. We all do. End of The Enemy by Richard Wilson The Legacy by Dick Hank This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman Many writers have tried to capture the essence of man's nuclear fate. Here, a new writer, working in what amounts to blank verse, captures our imagination in an experimental but heart-touching vignette. The Legacy by Dick Hank The Great War ended, the land cooled, and the dawn came. The sun's red rays moved north and south as shadows pointed west. The eastern sky brightened white as the shadows shimmered shorter. The last man watched the shadows move as day began again. He saw around him rubble sent by man in progress, ended. The remnants near, void of shape, purpose lost in flaming heat. A desert made by man's great flight to moon and stars unreached. The sun moved up, piercing haze, cloudless, blueless, quiet. The brightness grew, not much at first, and the wastelands 
showed their wares. Depression came. The last man moved toward the peace of purpose. No friend was left. Of this he knew. But man had left a legacy. Oh, universe, you stay intact, and yet my earth is ruined. Earth within the solar womb, aborted now and dying. What is there now to write on stone when ground contains thy bones? The last man walked down dusty roads, bounded there by mortar brick. To his right, a farmland once, no rooster crowed to wake the harvest. The house, once white, with red barn near, was ground and dust by the cattle hooves. He crossed a bridge that stayed intact, and looked below at floating flesh. Blood, once red, had turned to brown, as did the once green land. The road moved on. He followed course, remembering the beauty. Beauty, then, but now it passed, as scent became a rotting thing. The dust moved up as feet came down, and though he did of burning, no atom left by flames intense, no atom but the dust he tread. O oh, friends below, he spoke in passing, pardon my traversing. I cannot see how other roads could leave me less offending, unless, of course, the road I chose was dusted with thy enemy. The road moved east, bounded there by lamp posts melted. The last man walked, his shadow pointed on and on to city crumble. The buildings there were shorter now, but that was as it should be. No one was left that stood above to rule and litter lesser ones. The air moved thick with activeness. The last man knew its purpose. Death was near, of this he knew, but a purpose had he also. Find he would the truth of man, his legacy of living. Men lived here, but now men walked in search of purpose written. Those that come, the last man spoke, must know of man, his greatness. The last man searched each crater now for treasures, saved from burning. He finished this as shadows searched, moving east in passing. The last man walked, his treasure gathered, found a bank, and entered it. He walked amid the roofless thing, shaded some by walls still standing. He reached the vault and stepped inside, where treasure found was taken too. He placed each one by walls of steel, closed the door, and locked it tight. Man must have a legacy. On the wall he wrote, Gathered here are the works of man, that you that come may know him. The names of each the last man writes, the item lays beneath it. Coke bottles, golf balls, lipstick cases, powder puffs, soda straws, nurse shoes, prophylactics, aerosols, hi-fi records, cowboy boots, living bras, and neon signs. The last man, in dying, took one sign and placed it by itself. Alone it stood in reverence. Above it there were these words. Jesus saves, this one says, but failed to tell us how. The End of The Legacy by Dick Hank
The Barbarians by Tom Godwin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The execution violated the basic laws of Thanar, but the danger was too great. The Terrans couldn't be permitted to live under any circumstances. Tal Caranth, supreme executive of Thanar, signed the paper and dropped it into the outgoing slot of the message dispatch tube. It was an act that would terminate 180 days of studying the tapes and records on the Terran ship and would set the final hearing of the Terran man and woman for that day. And since the Terrans were guilty, their execution would take place before the sun rose again on Thanar. He went to the wide windows which had automatically opened with the coming of the day's warmth and looked out across the city. The city had a name, to be found in the books and tapes of history, but for 50,000 years it had been known as the city. It was the city of all cities, the center and soul of Thanarian civilization. It was a city of architectural beauty, of flowered gardens and landscape parks, a city of 500 centuries of learning, a city of eternal peace. The gentle summer breeze brought the sweet scent of the flowering lana trees through the window, and the familiar sound of the city as it went about its day's routine, a sound soft and unhurried, like a slow whisper. Peace for 50,000 years. Peace and the unhurried quiet. It would always be so for the city. The supreme executives of the past had been chosen for their ability to ensure the safety of the city, and so had he. He turned away from the window and back to his desk to brush his hand across the gleaming metal top of it. No faintest scratch marred the eternal oil surface, although the desk had been there for more than 30,000 years. It was permanent and never changing like the robot-operated fleet that guarded Thanar, like the white and massive executive building, like the way of life on Thanar. The Terrans would have to die, lest the peace and the way of life on Thanar be destroyed. They were of a young race, a race so young that his desk had already been in place for 15,000 years when they began emerging from their caves. They were a dangerously immature race. It had been only 300 years since their last war with themselves. 300 years. Three normal Thanarian lifetimes. And the Thanarians had not known war for 600 lifetimes. A race so young could not possess a civilized culture. The Terrans were, he searched for a suitable description, barbarians in spaceships. They lacked the refinement and wisdom of the Thanarians. They were a dangerous and unpredictable race. It could be seen in their history. Could be seen in the way the two Terrans had reacted to their capture. He pressed one of the many buttons along the edge of his desk, and a three-dimensional projection appeared. The scene that had taken place 180 days before when the Terrans were brought to Thanar. The ship of the Terrans stood bright silver in the sunlight, slim and graceful against the bulk of the executive building behind it. The Terrans descended the boarding ramp, the left wrist of the man chained to the right wrist of the girl. Two armed robots walked behind them, their faces metallically impassive and four armed Thanarian guards waited at the bottom of the ramp to help take the Terrans to their place of imprisonment. The Terrans approached the guards with a watchfulness that reminded him of the old films of the coast wolves that had once lived on Vendal. They did not walk with the studied, practiced leisure of the Thanarians, but as though they held some unknown vitality barely in check. The face of the man was lean and hard, 
the black eyes inscrutable as flint. The girl looked at the guards with a bold nonchalance, as though they were really not formidable at all. Somehow, by contrast with the Terrans, the guards appeared to be not grimly vigilant, but only colorless. There seemed to be a menace in the way the man watched the guards. There was the impression that he would overpower them and seize their weapons if given a shadow of a chance. And the girl, what would she do then? Would she flash in beside him to help him, as the female coast wolves always help their mates? He switched off their projection, feeling a little repugnance at the thought of executing the Terrans. They were living, sentient beings and intelligent for all their lack of civilization. It would have been better if they had been of some repulsive and alien physical form, such as bloated, many-legged giant insects. But they were not at all repulsive. They were exactly like the Thanarians. Exactly? He shook his head. Not exactly. The similarity was only to the eye, and not even to the eye when one looked closely, as he had looked at the images. There was a potential violence about them, lurking close beneath their deceptively Thanarian physical appearance. The Terrans were not like the Thanarians. There was a difference of 50,000 years between them, the difference between savage barbarianism and a great and peaceful civilization. He looked again across the city, listening to its softly murmuring voice. In hundreds of centuries, the city had known no strife or violence. But what if the barbarians should come, not two of them, but thousands? What would they do? He was sure he knew what they would do to the gentle, peaceful city, and the faint twinge of remorse at the thought of executing the Terran man and girl paled into insignificance. Under no circumstances could they be permitted to live and tell the others of Thanar and the city. Bob Randall shifted his position a little in the wide seat, and the chain that linked his wrist with Virginia's rattled metallically, sounding unduly loud in the quiet of the room. Virginia's black hair brushed his cheek as she turned her face up to him, to ask in a whisper so low it could not be heard by the four guards who stood beside and behind them. It's almost over, isn't it? He nodded, and she turned her attention back to the five judges seated at the row of five desks before them. The gray-haired one at the center desk, Bob knew, was the one in charge of the proceedings, and his name was Vor Durgal. He had gained the knowledge by watching and listening, and it was the only information he had acquired. He did not know the names of the other four judges, nor even for sure that they were judges and that it was a trial. There had been no introductions by the Thanarians, no volunteering of information. Vor Durgal spoke to them. In brief, the facts are these. You claim that your mission was of a scientific nature, that the two of you were sent from Earth to try and reach the center of the galaxy where you hoped to find data concerning the creation of the galaxy. Your ship carried only the two of you and is one of several such ships sent out on such missions. Since the voyages of these small exploration ships were expected to require an indefinite number of years, and since the occupants would have to endure each other's company for those years, your government thought it more feasible to let the crew of each ship consist of a man and a woman rather than two men. He saw Virginia's cheek quiver at the words, but she managed to restrain the smile. Our system was reached in your journey, Vor Durgal continued, and you swung aside to investigate our sister planet, Vendel. You were met by a guard ship before reaching Vendel, and it fired upon you. Instead of turning back... You destroyed it with a tight-beam adaptation of your meteor disintegrator. For Durgal waited questioningly, and Bob said, Our instrument showed that the guard ship was robot-operated. They could discern nothing organic in the ship, nothing alive. The same instrument showed us that this planet, Vendel, possessed operating mines and factories and no organic life other than small animals. 
We knew that machines neither voluntarily build factories nor reproduce other machines, yet the mines and factories were operating. We thought it might be a world where the inhabitants had all died for some reason, and the robots were still following the production orders given them when the race lived. And so you willfully destroyed the guard ship that would have turned you back. We did. It was a machine, operated by machines. And so far as we knew, it was protecting a race that had died a thousand years before. It was all a mystery, and we wanted to find the answer to it. Vordurgel and the others accepted the explanation without change of expression. Vordurgel resumed. Three more guard ships appeared when you were near Vendel. In the battle that followed, you severely damaged one of them. And when your ship was finally caught in the guard cruiser's tractor beams, you resisted the robots. When they boarded your ship, you destroyed several of them and were subdued only when the compartments of your ship were flooded with a disabling gas. That's true, Bob said. In summary... You deliberately invaded Thanarian territory, deliberately damaged and destroyed Thanarian ships, and would have landed on Vendel had the guard ships not prevented it. Your guilt is both evident and admitted. Are there any extenuating circumstances that have not been presented at this hearing? No, Bob said. None had been presented all day, for the good reason that there was not a single factor of the circumstances that the Thanarians would consider extenuating. Your guilt was evident from the beginning, Vordurgel said. We have spent the past 180 days in studying the books and tapes in your ship. What we learned of your history and your form of civilization leaves us no alternative in the sentence we must pass upon you. The chain clinked faintly as Virginia lifted her hand to lay it on his arm and she gave him a quick glance that said, Here it comes. For Durgle pronounced sentence upon them. Tomorrow, at 3312 time, you will both be put to death by a robot firing squad. Virginia's breath stopped for a moment, and her hand gripped his arm with sudden pressure, but she gave no other indication of emotion, and her eyes did not waver from For Durgle's face. Vordurgo looked past her to the guards. Return them to their cell. The guards produced another chain to link their free arms together behind their backs, and they were marched across the room and out the door. Outside, the sun was setting, already invisible behind a low-lying cloud. Bob calculated the designated time of their execution in relation to the Terran time as given by his watch, and found that 3312 would be about halfway between daylight and sunrise. Tal Caranth stood by the open windows and watched the guards return the Terrans to their cell. Extra guards, both Robot and Thanarian, had been posted inside and outside the prison building for the night to prevent any possibility of an escape. Other Robots stood guard around the Terran ship, although it was inconceivable that the Terrans could ever overpower the prison guards and reach their ship. But it had been inconceivable that a ship as small as the Terran ship could ever destroy a Thanarian guard cruiser. The tight beam adaptation circuit of the meteor disintegrators was very ingenious. Why had the Thanarian cruisers not had the same weapon? They possessed the same general type of meteor disintegrators. The same adaptation circuit would transform a Thanarian cruiser's meteor disintegrators into terrible weapons. Why had no one ever thought of doing such a thing? Why had it been taken for granted for 50,000 years that the cruiser's blasters were the ultimate in weapons? What other weapons did the Terrans on Earth possess? How invincible would their cruisers be if a small exploration ship could destroy a Thanarian cruiser? The captive Terrans could not be permitted to return to Earth and tell the others of Thanar. Nor could they be permitted to live out their lives in prison on Thanar. Someday, somehow, they might escape and return to Earth, or send a message to Earth. The robot fleet of Thanar could never withstand an attack by a Terran fleet, the fate of Thanar and the quiet 
and gentle city would be written in blood and dust and ashes. There was the sound of rubber-padded metal feet in the distance, and he saw six more robots marching out to add their numbers to the robots already guarding the Terran ship. The ship itself was not far from the executive building, close enough that his eyes, still sharp despite his 70 years, could make out the name on it. The Cat. The Cat. And a cat was, he recalled the definition to be found among the Terran books, any of various species of carnivorous and predatory animals noted for their stealth and quickness and their ferocity when angered. The robot shoved the plastic food tray under the cell door and went back down the corridor. Virginia turned away from the single window where the cat could be seen as a silhouette merging into the darkness. Last supper, Bob, she said. Let's eat, drink, and be merry. He went to the door to get the tray and noticed the three robots and two Thanarian guards down the left-hand stretch of corridor and the same number down the right. Virginia came up beside and said, They're not taking any chances. We won't be here in the morning, are they? No, he said, picking up the tray. None to speak of. He carried the tray to the little table in the center of the room, and Virginia seated herself across from him as she had done each meal for the past six months. But she toyed with the plastic spoon and did not begin to eat at once. I wonder why they made it a firing squad, she asked. You'd think they would have used something ultra-civilized and refined, such as some painless and flower-scented gas. Spies were executed with firing squads during the last Terran War, 300 years ago, he said. He smiled thinly. I suppose they consider us spies and want us to feel at home in the morning. I'm glad they do. I don't want it to be shut up in a room. I'd rather be out under the open sky. She poked at the rim of her tray again. They never did tell us why, Bob. They didn't tell us anything, only that they had no alternative. We didn't hurt any Thanarians. We only destroyed one of their ships and some of their robots. We upset their sense of security and showed them that they're not secure at all. I suppose they're afraid of an attack from Earth. They didn't tell us anything, she said again. They act as though we were animals. No, he said. They don't seem to have a very high opinion of our low position on the social evolution scale. He began to eat in the manner of one who knows the body needs nourishment to take advantage of any opportunity for escape, even though the mind may be darkly certain that no such opportunity shall arise. You ought to eat a little, Jenny, he said. She tried and gave up after a few bites. I guess I'm just not hungry. Not now, she said. She glanced at the darkened windows where the cat had become invisible. How long until daylight again, Bob? He looked at his watch. Seven hours. Seven hours. A touch of wistfulness came into her voice. I never noticed before how short the nights are. The robot laid the material Tal Caranth had requested on his desk, the records and tapes from the Terran ship, and withdrew. Tal Caranth sighed wearily as he inserted the first tape in the projector, wondering again why he felt the vague dissatisfaction and wondering why he hoped to find an answer among the material from the Terran ship. It would be an all-night task, and he could hardly expect to find more than he already knew. Thanar was not safe and secure from discovery by Terrans in the years to come, and faith in the robot fleet had been an illusion. Before setting the projector in operation, he put through a call to his daughter. Thralna's image appeared before him, reclining on a couch, while two robots worked at caring for her fingernails. She raised up a little as his image appeared before her and the robot stepped back. Yes, father? she asked. She waited for him to speak, her wide gray eyes on his face, and her jet black curls framing her young and delicately beautiful face. For a moment, she reminded him of someone, someone more mature and stronger. With something of a shock, he realized it was the Terran girl his daughter reminded him of. 
that the Terran girl seemed the more mature of the two, although Thralna was 28 and the Terran girl was 21. They had the same gray eyes and black curls, the same curve to the jaw, the same chin and full lips. But the similarity was only incidental. There was a grace and a gentleness to Thralna's beauty, a grace and gentleness that was the result of 50,000 years of civilization. Beneath the superficial beauty of the barbarian girl lay only an animal-like vitality and potential violence. Yes, father? Thralna asked again in her carefully modulated voice. Are you going to the theater tonight, Thralna? Yes. Tonight's play was written by Durette Thon, and it's supposed to be almost as good as one of the classics. Why do you ask, father? I called to tell you that I have to work late tonight. I may not be home until morning. Couldn't you let a robot do it? No, I have to do it myself. Does it have to do with those two aliens? Yes. A little frown of worry appeared and has quickly disappeared. Her slim fingers touched her forehead for a moment to smooth away any vestige of a wrinkle. Then she said, It'll be such a relief when they're finally disposed of. Whenever I think of how they might escape and get into the city, it frightens me. Are you sure they can't escape, Father? There is no possibility of their escaping, he said. You go ahead with your plans for the evening. Will you come home when the show is over? Not for a while. Ken is taking me dancing afterward. Where you went last time? The place where they were reviving the old dances? No, nobody goes there anymore. Those old dances were rather fun, but they were so, so tiring. Our modern dances are much slower and more graceful, you know. All right, Thralna, he said in dismissal. Enjoy yourself. Yes, father. She was reclining on the couch again, her eyes closed when he switched off the image. He sat for a little while before turning on the tape projector, recalling his conversation with her and a feeling growing within him that he was almost on the verge of discovering still another menace to Thanar. Virginia held her hands to her face to shade her eyes as she looked out the window. What you can see of the city from here is all bright with lights, she said. But there's no one on the streets. Only some robots. Everyone in the city must be in bed. That's the way it's been every night, he said. Early to bed and late to rise. They're an odd race. I've wondered what they do to pass away the time. But what they're doing now is something you should be doing. Resting. She turned away from the window. I'm not sleepy. I keep thinking of the cat out there waiting for us and how we might get to it if we could only get a hold of a blaster. Which we can't try to do until they come for us in the morning. Some rest now might mean a lot then. All right, Bob. She went to him and sat beside him on his cot. What is it now? How much more time? About three hours. She leaned her head against him, and he put his arm around her. I guess I am a little tired, she said. But don't let me go to sleep. All right, Ginny. It's only three hours, and never any more if we aren't lucky in the morning. And if we aren't lucky, I don't want to have wasted our last three hours. Tal Caranth stood before the window again and watched the city as it slept in the pre-dawn darkness. How many slept in the city? Once, there had been three million in the city, but each census found the population to be less. Five years before, there had been less than a million. Two-thirds of the city was a beautiful shell that housed only the robots that cared for it. What was wrong? And why had it never occurred to him before that there was something wrong? He went back to his desk, where the material from the Terran ship littered the eternal loy top of it, and sat down again. He was tired and frustrated. A menace faced Thanar, and no one seemed to realize it. The coming of the barbarians had awakened him to the fallacy of trusting the robot fleet. But there was still another danger, and the robot fleet would be more helpless before the newly discovered danger than it would be before the Terran ships. He pressed a button, and music filled the room. Music that had always before been soothing and restful to hear. 
but it sounded flat and meaningless compared with the throbbing barbarian music he had heard that night, and he switched it off again. What was wrong? It was one of the latest compositions, one that had been acclaimed as almost as good as one of the classics. Almost as good, like the play Thralna had attended, like the art exhibits, the athletic records, the scientific discoveries, like everything in the city and on Thanar. Almost as good, but never quite as good as they had been 50,000 years before. Was that part of the answer? No, not part of the answer. Part of the problem. Part of the danger greater than a barbarian invasion. There was no answer that he could see. Something had been lost by the Thanarians 50,000 years before, and he was neither sure what it was nor how to give it back to them. He pressed the button that would connect him to Security Officer Tenquath. Of the two problems, it was only within his power to handle the immediate phase of the first problem, to make the final authorization of the execution of the Terrans. Bob looked again at the window, which had lightened to a pale gray square. It was already daylight outside. It would not be long until the guards came for them. Virginia had fallen asleep at last, more tired than she had thought, and she still slept with her head against his shoulder and with his arm around her to support her. He straightened his legs slowly, not wanting them to be numb from lack of circulation when the guards came and not wanting to awaken Virginia to grim reality any sooner than he had to. But the slight movement was enough. She opened her eyes drowsily. Then the sleepiness gave way to the hard jolt of remembrance and realization. She looked at the gray window and asked, How much longer? Within a few minutes. I wish you hadn't let me sleep. You were tired. I didn't want to sleep. I didn't think I would. Then she changed the subject, as though to keep it from going into the sentimental. I see the robot never did come back for the tray. We'll be leaving a messy room, won't we? I wonder if they'll disinfect it to make sure it's clean when we're gone. You know, she smiled a little, fleas and things. She lifted her face to kiss him on the cheek. Then she rose and moved to the window. It's cloudy, she said. There's a mist of rain falling and it's cloudy outside. I guess it's already later than we thought. He went over to stand beside her and saw that the morning was alight with near sunrise behind the gray clouds. It's out there waiting for us. The cat, she said. He saw it, standing silver white in the gray morning, gleaming in the rain and with its slim, dynamic lines making it look as though it might at any moment hurl itself roaring into the sky. It's a beautiful ship, she said. I wonder what they'll do with it when they... A sound came from the end of the corridor, a snap command in Thanarian. The command was followed at once by the sound of footsteps approaching their cell, the heavy tread of robots, and the lighter, softer steps of the guards. Virginia turned away from the window, and they faced the cell door as they waited. This is it, she said. Are you afraid, Ginny? Afraid? She laughed up at him, a laugh that came only a little too quickly. It's like a play set a long time ago on Earth. Coffee and pistols at dawn. Only I don't think they're bringing us any coffee, and if we get a pistol, it'll have to be one of theirs. It isn't over till the end, and maybe we can change the ending of this play for them. I'll be watching you, Bob, so I can help you the moment you make the try. The Thanarian guards stopped outside the door, their blasters in their hands. One of them unlocked the door, and two robots entered, guards locking the big door behind the robots the moment they were inside. The robots carried no blasters, nothing but three lengths of chain. The Thanarian leader outside the door rasped a command. You will both turn to face the window with your hands behind you. Bob did not obey at once, but appraised the situation. The robots were massive things, more than 600 pounds in weight, their metal bodies invulnerable to any attack he could make with his bare hands. 
but there was one chance in 10,000. If he could catch the first robot by surprise and send it toppling into the cell door, its weight might be enough to break the lock of the door. He struck it with his shoulder, all his weight and strength behind the attack, and Virginia's small body struck it a moment later. But it was like shoving against a stone wall. The robot rocked for the briefest instant, then it threw out a foot to regain its balance. The other robot snapped a chain around his wrist while Virginia fought it. Don't, Ginny, he said, ceasing his own struggles. It's no use, honey. She stopped then, and the robot jerked her arms around behind her back to lock the second chain around her wrist. She smiled up into his dark and somber face. We tried, Bob. They were just too big for us. A third chain, longer than the first two, was produced. He felt the cool metal of it encircle his neck and heard the lock snap shut. The other end of it was locked around Virginia's neck. The cell door was opened, and the guard door commanded, Step forward. The robots will guide you. They stepped forward, the robots beside them, gripping their arms with steel fingers. The chain around their necks rattled from the movement of walking, linking them together like a pair of captive wild animals. Bob wondered if the chain had been solely as another precaution to prevent their escape, or if it had been a deliberate act of contempt. The Thanarians feared them, and because they feared them, they hated them. Did it bolster the morale of the Thanarians to deliberately treat them as though they were animals? They stepped out into the cool dawn, into a small courtyard with a black stone wall at its farther side. The sky was bleakly gray and the rain was falling as a cold mist, dampening Virginia's face as she looked up at him. The last mile, Bob. Walk it straight and steady, Ginny. They're watching. How else would we walk it? She asked calmly. They came to the wall where a metal ring had been set in the stone. There was a chain fastened to the ring, and when the robots had swung them around with their backs to the wall, the free end of the chain was locked to the center of the chain around their necks. Again, it could be an added precaution or it could be the final attempt to let their execution be like the killing of a pair of dangerous animals. Did not really matter, of course. Two of the armed robots who had been walking with the guards took up a position 20 feet in front of them, blasters in their metal hands. The robots who had chained them stepped to one side, away from the line of fire. The leader of the guards lifted his arm to look at his watch and said something to the robots. The robots lifted their blasters at the words and leveled them, one aimed at Virginia's heart and one at Bob's. But the expected blast did not come. The guard leader continued to observe his watch. Apparently, the first command had meant only aim. The fire command would come when the hands of the watch reached the 3312 mark. Virginia's shoulder was warm against his arm, but her hand, when it found his behind their backs, was cold. They cheated us, she said. We were supposed to have a whole firing squad. The guard leader gave another command, and there was a double click as the robots pressed the buttons that would ready their blasters for firing. Virginia swayed a little for the first time, a movement too small for the Thanarians to see, and one from which she recovered almost at once. It's, I'm all right, she said. I'm not afraid, Bob. Of course you're not, Ginny. Of course you're not. The guard leader had returned his attention to his watch, and the seconds went by. Long seconds, in which the only sound was the almost inaudible whisper of the rain against the stone wall behind them. Virginia looked up at him for the last time, the cold mist wet on her face. We had a lot of fun together, Bob. We never expected it to end so soon, but we knew all the time that it might. We'll go together, and that's the way we always wanted it to be, wherever and whenever it might happen. 
Then she faced forward again and they waited, the rain whispering on the wall behind them and forming in crystal drops on the chain around their necks. She did not waver again as she stood beside him, and he knew that she would not when the end came. The guard leader dropped his arm as though he no longer needed to refer to his watch. He glanced at them very briefly and then turned to the robots, his face revealing the command he was going to give. Virginia's hand tightened on his own in farewell, and he could feel the pulse of her wrist racing hard and fast. But she stood very straight as she looked into the blaster, and they heard the final command to their robot executioners. Dorenthandar. 33-1. Tal Caranth looked again at the timepiece on the wall. 33-1. At the end of eleven more small fractions of time, the Terrans would no longer exist. What was life? What was the purpose behind it all? In 50,000 years, the Thanarians were no nearer the answer than their ancestors had been. Why should there be life at all? Why not the suns and planets created by chance and devoid of life? And why even the suns and planets? The millions of galaxies racing outward across the illimitable expanse of space and time. Why the universe? And why the life it contained? Why not just nothing? The barbarians had set out to find the answer within a hundred years after the building of their first interstellar ship. And Thanar's interstellar ships had not been outside the system for 50,000 years. No Thanarian had been as far as Vendel for 15,000 years. Why had the Thanarians lost their curiosity? the curiosity and desire to learn that had created the past glory of Thanar. He thought again of what he had discovered that night, of one of the reasons why the Terrans had named their ship the Cat. It was not because a cat was a dangerous animal, as he and the others had thought. It was because the mission of the Cat would be to explore in unknown territory because of an old Terran proverb. Curiosity killed a cat. He did not yet understand the second reason behind the name, but the first reason showed that the Terrans were not without a sense of humor. How long had it been since he had heard a Thanarian laugh at himself, at his own failings or possibility of failure? Never. Yet, wasn't that pride? What was wrong with the high-headed pride that admitted no inferiority, no failure? Wasn't 50,000 years of civilization something of which to be extremely proud? 33.5 He went to the window and pressed the button that would open it against the mechanical will of the automatic health guard equipment. It slid open and he breathed the cool, moist air that smelled of wet earth and grass and the odor of the Lana tree flowers, flowers that were closed against the rain and would not open until the sun came out. The city was quiet in the gray of the morning. He could see one pedestrian and three moving vehicles in the entire visible portion of the city. The city, like the flowers of the Lana trees, would not open into life until the storm was over and the sun was shining again. 33.9 The city, like the flowers of the Lana trees, the beauty and perfection of them both was the result of 50,000 years of breeding to bring about that perfection. The city, like the flowers of the Lana trees. But flowers were without purpose, were only vegetation. And what was the purpose of the city? He did not know. He was the supreme executive of Thanar, and he did not know. 33.10 He went back to his desk and switched on the three-dimensional projection of the scene that would be taking place in the courtyard behind the prison. 
The man and girl stood chained to the wall, and the robots were waiting for the third and last command from the guard leader, the blasters in their hand as steady as though held in vices, and their metal faces impassive. He increased the magnification of the scene, drawing the images of the man and girl closer to him. There was no reading the man's face, other than the hardness and lack of fear. But on the face of the girl was a defiance that seemed to shine like a radiance about her. He was reminded of the physical similarity between the barbarian girl and his daughter. But now the similarity had faded to a shadow. There was something vital and alive about the barbarian girl. There was a beauty to her in the way she waited for death that was strange and wild by Thanarian standards. What had Thralna said the night before? Whenever I think of how they might escape and get into the city, it frightens me. It frightens me. What if it was Thralna who stood before the robots? Would she have her Thanarian pride as she looked into the black muzzle of the blaster and knew she only had a few more heartbeats of life left? Would she stand with the bold defiance of the barbarian girl? or would she drop to the ground and plead for her life? He knew the answer, but it was not Thralna's fault that she was as she was. She was only like all the others of Thanar. Thirty-three, eleven. How different they were, the two barbarians and the men and women of Thanar. Yet the difference would cease to exist within a few moments. When the man and girl were dead, when all the life and restless drive were gone from them and they lay still on the cold, wet ground, they would look the same as Thanarians. How did it feel to die in the cold dawn on an alien world a thousand light years from your own? But they had known such a thing might happen to them. They had named their ship the Cat because of that. Because of that, and something else. Suddenly, clearly, he understood the second reason for the name of their ship. 33.12 The guard leader dropped his arm to give the last command to the robots. Tal Karanth's mind raced, and he saw two things with vivid clarity. He saw the inexorable decline of Thanar and the city continuing down the centuries until the little spark that was left smoldered its last and was gone. And he saw the way death would obliterate the wild and savage beauty of the barbarian girl, knew that it would go when the life went from her to leave her with a beauty that would be colorless by contrast, that would be like the beauty of Alana Blossom or a Thanarian woman and he thought he could see the answer to the menace that faced Thanar and the city. Dorend! The guard leader's first word of command came. Tel Karanth's finger stabbed at one of the buttons along his desk. He shoved it down to deactivate the robot executioners, and they were frozen in immobility when the final word came. Thandar! He snapped the switch which connected him with the office of Security Officer Tenquath and said, Have the chains taken from the Terrans and see that they are given comfortable in unguarded quarters. Tell them they have been pardoned by the Supreme Executive and that they are free to leave Thanar whenever they wish. It was mid-morning of the next day, bright and warm with a few fleecy white clouds drifting across the blue sky. Tal Karanth stood before the window again, Vordurgo beside him, and watched the city come to life, slowly and leisurely, as it had come to life each mid-morning for the past 50,000 years. Vordurgo looked toward the cat, where the boarding ramps had already been withdrawn and the airlocks closed. They're ready to go, he said. I hope you haven't made a mistake in what you did. The other Terrans will learn of us now, and when they come... He let the sentence trail off unfinished. We have a great deal to gain by the coming of the Terrans, Tal Karanth said. 
and little to lose. Little to lose? Vordurgle asked. We have Thanar and the city to lose. We have our lives and our civilization to lose. Yes, our civilization, Talcarant said. Our god that we worshipped. Our civilization. Look, Vor, listen to what I have to say. I did some thinking the night the Terrans were waiting to be executed. I'm afraid it was probably one of the few times for thousands of years that a Thanarian ever tried to critically examine the Thanarian way of life. I started from the beginning, more than 50,000 years ago, when the interstellar ships of Thanar were actually interstellar and were manned by men instead of robots. It was a good start we made in interstellar exploration, but it didn't last very long. We wanted to associate with our cultural peers, and there weren't any. We didn't attempt to make any contact with the primitive races we found. We felt that there would be no point in doing so. The Nar possessed the highest and the only civilization in all the explored regions of the galaxy, and younger races had nothing to offer us. The time came when no more exploration ships were sent out. We retired to Thanar and Vendel and surrounded them with a robot-operated fleet to keep out the inferior races when they finally did learn how to build spaceships. We devoted ourselves to our social culture and became imbued with self-satisfaction, with the assurance that we of Thanar possessed the full flowering of culture and progress. We withdrew into a shell of complacency and each generation lived out its life with comfortable, methodical sameness. And our robot-operated fleet was on guard to prevent any other race from annoying us, from disturbing us in the wisdom and serenity of our way of life. Fifteen thousand years ago, the last of us on Vendel returned to the more ideal world of Thanar and there was plenty of room for them on Thanar by then. The population had been decreasing for thousands of years. It's decreasing right now. Women don't want to have children anymore. It's an inconvenience for them. They want comfort, the full stomach, the soft couch, the attention of their robots. And men are the same. There is no longer any incentive for living on Thanar other than to duplicate the lives of our ancestors. There's nothing new, nothing to be done that has not already been done better. So we lapse into an existence of placid satisfaction with the status quo. We vegetate. We're like plants that have been seeded in the same field for so many centuries that the fertility of the soil is exhausted. This barren field in which we grow is our own form of culture. Do you see what the ultimate end will have to be, Vor? He had thought old Vor Durgal would reply with a heated defense of Thanarian civilization, but he did not. Instead, he said, If the present trend continues, there will come a time when there will be more robots in the guardship than there will be Thanarians for them to guard. But is the other better, the destruction at the hands of the barbarians? Destruction? It's within their power to destroy us. But why should they? It will be unpleasant for many Thanarians to contemplate. But an unbiased study of the Terrans shows that they would not want the things we have on Thanar and in the city. That they would not consider Thanar and the city worth the trouble of conquest. A conjecture, Vor Durgal said. And even if you are right and the Terrans never come to destroy us, what have we to gain by taking this risk? New life. We've been too long in the barren feel of our own culture. We've lost our curiosity, our desire to learn, our sense of humor that would permit us to make honest self-evaluations, our pride and courage. And in losing these things, we lost our racial urge to survive. Look at the city this morning, Vor. See how slowly it moves? Listen to how still it is for a city that contains almost a million people. 
Do you know what this day is for the city? It's one more act to be added to the thousands of acts in the past in the city's rehearsal for extinction. The Terrans have what we lost. They're a young race with a vitality that's like a fire where our own is like a dying spark. That's why I let those two go. Why I want the others of their kind to know of Thanar and come here. It's not too late for us. Not yet too late for contact with these Terrans to give back to us all these things we lost. In the pause following his words, the quiet of the city was suddenly shattered by the thunder of the cat's drives. It lifted, shining and slender and graceful, and hurled itself up into the blue sky. Tal Caranth watched it until it was a bright star, far away, and going out into the universe beyond, until the sound of its drives had faded and gone. He looked away from the sky and back to the slowly moving, softly whispering city, the city that was dying and did not know it. He felt the stirring of an uneasiness within him, a strange, non-physical desire for something. It was the first time in his life he had ever felt such a sensation. It was something so long gone from the Thanarians that the Thanarian word for it was obsolete and forgotten. But the Terran word for it was wanderlust. I almost wish I could have gone with them, Vor, he said. They're going to try to reach the heart of the galaxy and see if they can find the answer to creation. And we on Thanar spend our lives sipping sweet drinks as we discuss trifles and wait for the sun to shine warm enough for us to emerge from our air-conditioned houses. If you're right in thinking that Terrans won't come to plunder Thanar in the city, Vor Durgal said, then it would be interesting to know what those two find when they reach the center of the galaxy, if they don't get killed long before they reach it. I think any hostile forms of life they encounter will find them hard to kill, Tal Karanth said. We paid a high price for their capture, remember? There were two Terran proverbs behind the name of their ship. It took me quite a while to understand the second one, but when I did, I realized the true extent of Terran determination and self-confidence. Their mission was to explore across the unknown regions of space. They knew it would be dangerous, very dangerous. So they named their ship the Cat, partly because of an old Terran proverb, curiosity killed a cat. But that was only half the reason behind the name. They intended to reach the center of the galaxy, and they didn't intend to let anything stop them. So there was a second meaning behind the naming of their ship. A cat has nine lives. End of the Barbarians by Tom Godwin Read by Paul Hampton Pogo Planet by Martin Pearson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Rucker Pogo Planet by Martin Pearson As my ship hit the darkness that was the outer atmosphere of mid-planet, I thrilled to the thought that I, Ajax Calkins, had at last achieved my rightful place among the pioneers of space. Even when my ship bounced on the green soil, flew end over end upwards to come down kaplunk in the wrong side of a gooey thick swamp, I exulted that I was the first in possession of a major planet that had been overlooked by the rest of the interplanetary crowd. As I picked myself up from the midst of a pile of miscellaneous equipment, hiking ropes, elephant guns, para rays, spare shoes and cans of unifood, and rubbed my bruised arms and head, I thought of how many millions would give their all to be in my place. Mid-planet! How the whole system had thrilled when its discovery was finally determined last year. 
For decades, science had known there was a planet between Saturn and Uranus. Ever since Pickering had proved the perturbations of those planets' orbits pointed to a body between them. Yet telescopes had always failed to detect it. Few had taken it seriously, yet it was there. It was discovered finally by electromagnetic induction coils at the Mars Prime Observatory. It was rechecked from Flagstaff and searched for by Tycho I. The latter could not see it. It was still invisible, a strangely dark world. It was then that I conceived my great idea. For years I had secretly nourished my grievance against the world into which I found myself born. All the great heroic acts had been done. The major planets pioneered, Gretel Spoon had at last opened up Pluto, and there was nothing left for me to do to show that I too was made of godlike stuff. But mid-planet, there was my chance. Hastily, I outfitted a small spaceship with all that I would need. Hastily, but craftily, I had the orbits charted and the controls processed. My destiny was always certain, for had it not been my destiny to come into a large fortune early in life, surely this had been ordained. Then I had hurtled through space towards mid-planets alone, secretly. The world would not know of my triumph until I returned to tell them and receive their adoring plaudits. Months went past when I endured the hardships of space sickness, the cosmic, and the voidal ague. At last, mid-planet loomed dark in the celestial panorama. Still it cast no light. Still it was a black orb sailing silently on its mighty orbit, unattended by any moon. Finding that my ship was irrevocably destined to hit the planet— I determined to land rather than turn back, so it came about that I plunged down through the darkness and found to my amazement that after several hundred yards of opaque gaseous envelope, I emerged into brilliant blue sky and rapidly approached the green surface. After the crash, and after I had picked myself up and rubbed arnica on my black and blue spots, the problem of the dark planet turned light demanded my attention. I realized that some strange gas or mixture of gases chanced to make up the outermost strata of the atmosphere of mid-planet. A gaseous compound that absorbed light one way, but would not pass it once it had struck the surface of the planet so that above the planet remained swathed in lightless mystery, while below the sky seemed to radiate blue, and the lighting and warmth was held in to appear as a beautiful spring day on earth. This, then, had been the circumstance which had kept mid-planet veiled from the sight of man until I, Ajax Calkins, tore aside the veil." I felt a glow of warmth suffuse my body with pride for this accomplishment. Buckling the para-ray to my belt, for I did not think heavier weapons were necessary in this peaceful-looking scene, I stepped to the door of the ship and forced it open. At my feet the swamp oozed and gurgled. A scant distance away the bank of solid ground lay. I leaped the distance, and I am proud to say I misjudged it by a mere foot or so. Dragging myself out of the thick, gummy mess, I clambered to the bank of the strangely greenish soil, placed one foot forward, scowled, and raised my right hand. I hereby take possession of this land in my name, Ajax Calkins, and proclaim it subject to my will as emperor. This I pronounced with firm dignity, becoming a Magellan or a Cortez. You may seem surprised that I should make myself ruler of this land and not merely annex it to the interplanetary union. Why should that surprise you? Was it not mine by right of priority? And how indeed do you think kingdoms and empires are one? I am not a modest man. I have always said that I am a man of great destiny. Why should I bow to traditions? Having satisfied my will, I looked about. 
before me stretched a long rolling plain, green as if covered with fields of grass. Yet it was not grass, but a curious green hard clay that seemed to make up the soil. Far to the distance low hills rose. The oddest feature of the soil was the fact that it was interminably interlaced with deep, sharp cracks like a clay that had been baked improperly and cracks all over. It seemed to me that there was a strange discoloration far off in the base of the hills from which white and gray plumes of vapor arose as if marking the factories of some hillside city. A city could well prove to be, and if that were so, then I had found a capital and subjects. I set out to walk the several miles to the hills. I had sufficient equipment for such a reconnoiter already on me. The going was not easy. The ground was flat and hard enough to walk on, but the deep cracks and the narrow crevices which one constantly came across made the trip difficult. I would have to leap perilously over the more narrow cracks or else carefully find a way around the wider ones. It seemed to me that it would be difficult to make roads across such a terrain. The bridges would be innumerable. I wondered how the natives got around. I had seen no sign of animals as yet, but that was not to be considered surprising if there were a city so near. There were plants, a large number scattered here and there in clumps, reddish and greenish masses somewhat like the vegetation of our American western deserts. After walking and jumping and still more walking and leaping, I became tired after about an hour. The city was still a distance away, but it could now be seen with greater distinctness. It was indeed what I had thought, a cluster of buildings obviously constructed for intelligent beings, and there were indeed columns of smoke rising from them. More than that, I could not distinguish. I had come across no roads as yet, which was odd if this were a city, though comprehensible considering the nature of the ground. At last I saw a building of some sort in my path. It was a small structure, hardly more than a framework construction of clay. I made my way to it and looked at it. The building itself was nothing, just a framework, as I had said. It was what was propped up beside it that puzzled and amazed me. It was a nine-foot cylinder of shining metal. About the middle of this metal shaft was fixed a circular frame, There were a number of what might be controls set in the cylinder just above this central railwork, and a large mass like a donut running underneath the metal hoop, which might have held an engine of some sort. The bottom of the shaft was capped by a large rubbery mass. I could not figure out what this was. I stood it upright, it was not too heavy, and looked at it from all directions. It was a puzzle. Then I climbed on to the hoop affixed to its middle and sat down. The central shaft ran between my legs. The engine was under me and the controls faced me. It occurred to me that here was a machine designed to be operated by someone in my position and of my general size. Because I am afraid of nothing, I touched the controls and pressed them. Below me there was a sort of murmuring and rumbling. Then the cylinder seemed to vibrate slightly to grow more tense. I grasped the metal bar tightly. There was a terrifying hiss and then a terrific crash and the cylinder suddenly hurtled into the air. I held on for dear life, my composure dreadfully shaken. The whole machine bounced upwards into the air and then came down on its rubber-capped bottom. I held on. It hit. A shaft within the cylinder contracted and absorbed the shock and suddenly flicked out again and up we went. As I grasped the main tube for dear life, I realized what it was, a pogo stick a giant, mechanically controlled, powered pogo stick. Up and down, jarring and violent, down and up. I was dizzy and ill, and I didn't know how to stop it. It was progressing madly in the general direction of the city. I pushed buttons wildly when I wasn't holding on for dear life, but I didn't seem to get the right combination. 
The stick would hurtle wildly forward into the air many dozens of feet, then come down to hit the earth with a shock, contract, and then recoil violently again and up with a sickening jolt into the air again. I saw that it was a means for travel over terrain impassable because of its crevices and cracks to wield vehicles or beings on foot. I saw this as the unguided power pogo came down directly into a narrow crack. The capped button slid between the sides. The engine box hit the sides of the narrow cleft hard. There was a terrific kick and the shaft hit out again futilely in the airy emptiness of the depth below it, and I went sailing out head over heels to land several yards away in the midst of a band of mid-planetarians. The next thing I knew I was being pinned down by a number of gray fuzzy arms, while a kangaroo looked down at me and questioned me in a squeaky language. At least it looked like a kangaroo, for it had the giant legs and the long, powerful tail of one. It had upstanding mousy ears, a pointed rodent-like face, and a mammalian body covered with short gray-brown hair. Around its waist was strapped a belt-like harness from which several pouches were slung. In one hand it held a weapon, like a sort of combination pistol and slingshot. Naturally, I did not answer its questions. It, the chief kangaroo man, shrugged its shoulders and motioned to its fellows who were holding me down. They allowed me to get to my feet when I was surprised to find that I was still all in one piece and that they had not touched my equipment, including my pararray. A little distance away was standing a simply gigantic power pogo, towering a couple of dozen feet high, with a large circular platform set around its middle. Facing that, they started to walk towards there. Started, I say, for they walked in kangaroo leaps, and I simply fell when they tried to make me do the same. They picked me up bodily and bounded over and up to the platform. There they hold on to the straps attached to the main cylinder and waited. I think I must have fainted because I have no recollection of the trip outside of a nightmare of terrible leaps and falls. When I came to again, it was in the city by the hills. Several of the creatures were standing around me trying to question me in their odd language and, of course, making no headway. I felt that this was not the time to inform them of my imperial accession. I was not sure that they were the most fitting inhabitants of this world to receive that honor. There might be other intelligent races inhabiting the same planet, even as there are on Venus. Accordingly, I kept my mouth shut and stared them down. That was a feat of which I could be proud considering the odd nature of their eyes and faces. Finally, they led me away in short bounds to a building and up a ramp to a room. There they thrust me and closed the door. The room was large, partly open to an interior patio, but it had another inhabitant, a girl. She was standing by the open semi-balcony staring into the courtyard. When I exclaimed, she turned sharply and looked at me. She was dressed surprisingly like an earth girl. She looked very much like the earth type. I congratulated myself on having picked for my empire a planet which held a race so similar to my own, but my hopes were dashed two seconds later when she opened her mouth and said in perfect English, Hello, stranger. How'd you get to mid-planet so soon? I recovered my composure and introduced myself modestly, not telling her of the position I had taken upon myself. And who are you? I asked. Oh, I'm Nadia Landor, and I came with the official IU expedition. Our ship is about 30 miles away, and I came here on a geological survey on a single-seater flyer. I stopped to say hello, but our hosts don't seem to know the meaning of the word. Oh, I said and fell silent. What was I to say? I had been so certain that I could get to mid-planet first, and now it seemed that the Union had beaten me out again. Then I squared my shoulders. 
This was no way for Ajax Calkins, emperor of at least half of Mid-Planet, to act. My destiny would see me through. You need have no fear, I said. I will find a way for us to escape. She looked at me oddly and smiled. Oh, that? That's all settled. We'll escape immediately if you want to. I've fixed things up with our buggy friend. With whom? I gasped. Why haven't you seen the buggers yet? Look, there's Bosco in the yard. She beckoned to the inner courtyard. I went over to her side and looked. In the courtyard, standing just below us, stood a monstrous insect, a thing somewhat larger than a horse, a big, squat, compact-looking, broad-backed creature. For a moment I stared at it without comprehension, and then suddenly its appearance struck a responsive chord in my brain. It was a flea, a gigantic flea. Isn't he cute? murmured Nadia. He's agreed to help us escape. He's what? Do you mean to say he's... I started. Intelligent? She finished. Yes, the buggers have a rather high intelligence. Not as good as our kangaroo friends, but nonetheless clever. The fleas are a sort of semi-barbarian group inhabiting a section about a thousand miles away. This fellow, whom I call Bosco, was captured and doesn't like the idea of making a banquet for some kangaroo holiday. I goggled at the creature and it stared with an interested flicker of its feelers at me. I'm glad you still have your pair array. It was all that I was missing. Come on, let's go now. Nadia suited her actions to her words by vaulting the stone balustrade and landing astride the monster bug's back. I gingerly followed her and seated myself in front. Now what? I said, for I didn't know how this was going to help us escape. Hold tight and use your ray when the guard appears, she said, and then screamed at the top of her lungs. I was nearly paralyzed myself with the sound, but the guard who opened the gate was more so, and I beamed him nicely. Bosco seemed to sink lower, and then his monstrously powerful legs smashed down, and we made the most colossal bound I have ever ever dreamed of. That super flea must have covered at least 300 yards with that first bound, and he must have made 200 at least with every subsequent bounce. We held on for dear life, and the air wished past us like mad. Behind us the city of kangaroos sprang to life as they saw their assorted prisoners escaping, and very soon I saw over my shoulder that a line of gigantic steam-powered pogos were bounding along after us, each manned by several armed creatures. The flea was fast, but the pogos, powered by terrific steam boilers, were equally so, and thus we raced across the clay crevice terrain, two humans on the back of a flea colossus, followed by a single file line of puffing steel pogos, their plumes of smoke leaving a trail behind them. I turned and tried to pick off the riders with my ray, but it was hopeless. So violently was everything going up and down. I gave up and clung for dear life to the hard neck of our steed. But it seemed to be impossible to shake off our followers. They remained fast on our trail, and after a while I realized that Bosco was tiring out. His leaps were not so high or far. What shall we do? called Nadia to me. We can't shake them. It was then that the idea occurred to me that saved us. We were already very close to where my spaceship had landed, and I succeeded to conveying in signals what I had in mind to our quite intelligent flea. On we went, and when we came to the side of the swamp in which my ship had landed, Bosco gave a terrific leap which must have well set a record for all mid-planet and sailed fully 500 yards across the swamp to land exhausted on the other side. But the Pogos could not make that great leap, nor could the giant things stop so easily. On they rushed, and one after another they landed in the middle of that thick, gummy, deep, swamp-like mass. 
The automatic vibrations of their shafts continued, but their bases were hopelessly gummed in. The crews were hurled off in all directions and fell helplessly into the gooey morass. We were saved. My ship was around at the other side, but we could walk it. Nadia signaled our thanks to the bugger, and it bounded off alone towards the distant horizon. As we walked, Nadia complimented me on my trick of the swamp. I glowed within and turned to her and said, Let us stay here and master this world, my empress. I, Ajax Calkins, lay my heart and a planet at your feet. But women are fickle creatures and cannot understand the ways of the great. She laughed and said, Don't be silly. My husband is waiting for me at our own spaceship. And then we found that my ship had, while I had been away, sunk into the swamp completely, and that we would have to walk the twenty or so miles to Nadia's craft. She laughed even louder. Women do not appreciate destiny. End of Pogo Planet by Martin Pearson Cargo to Callisto by Jerome Bixby, writing as J. B. Drexel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Four Arnian criminals, vicious and deadly, fled silently into the Martian night, and grimly the patrol threw out an airtight dragnet. Nothing human could have escaped. But what's human about an Arnian? Sarah emerged from the surface of the Great Canal, as sleek and brown as a seal. Laughing and sputtering, she jerked her head once over each round shoulder, parting her soaked hair and revealing her face. Try that once again, she flung at Joe. Joe Kerdak ducked her again and Kent shouted something from the bank that wasn't quite audible over the squeals and splashes. What? Joe held his wife's head firmly between his knees. What'd you say, Kent? His senior intendant's grin widened as he cupped his hands over it to shout again. I said, you'll drown the poor thing. Joe grunted as Sarah cold-bloodedly located a nerve center in his thigh and bit it. Not this thing. He released her, and she bobbed up swearing in Sand Coast Martian. They had to rope it out of a canal to teach it to walk. He narrowed his gray eyes humorously and poised for the attack. But Sarah had conceded and was swimming toward the bank. The setting sun struck a series of glowing Vs in her wake. Joe rubbed his tingling leg and followed. They reached the green slope at the same time, and Big Kent handed them up with ease. Ray's watching the Franks, he said. And I've been watching Ray, and I think we better get up there, or he won't be able to hold off much longer. His inner man is showing through. The pianist's dark, saturnine face peered at them over the fire as they came up, and he rose, wiping his hands carelessly on his sport tunic. He had evidently gone into the canal skimmer and changed out of his bathing suit. How do, he greeted dourly. The damn thing itched, so I took it off. Joe gave himself a last swipe with the towel and tossed it through the open hatch of the skimmer. Sarah carried her towel into the boat and came out presently in a suede skirt and bolero, looking rubbed down and delectable. Joe's wife was half Martian and it showed in her long, slender eyebrows and delicately cleft nose and chin. She looked worriedly at the three men busy with the Frankfurters. There's something on the tele-audio, she said. Come in and listen. What is it? Joe asked. Something about somebody escaping from Mars detain. Ray's humming stopped. He had been practicing wrist octaves on the flat rock and his long hand hung motionless for a moment as if he were reaching for something. 
Kent set his frank across the top of his coffee cup, he was always careful about everything, and stood up. Joe looked at his wife, looked at her eyes. They were frightened. That's pretty near here, isn't it? Sarah said. She moved back to let the three men into the boat. They grouped around the teleaudio. I don't think there's anything to worry about, Kent said slowly. They're bound to catch the men. They aren't men. The four listened. Ruthless Arnians, this warning cannot be taken too seriously. Detain is doing everything in its power to recapture the four criminals, but as is known, the Arnian psyche is able to leave its body at will and inhabit the body of another entity, subjugating the mind of its host and control. My God, Ray whispered. I've heard of those devils. In all likelihood, we'll seek to escape from Mars. To prevent this, all persons now holding tickets for interworld travel must submit to being psycho-screened before entering liners. No more tickets will be sold. Sarah's eyes were wide and round. They'd have to leave their bodies behind. Here on Mars. Big Kent because he was one of the Karadak's oldest friends and could do such things, put his arm around her shoulders and squeezed. She was shivering. Tenant Smith of Detain informs us that the Arnians are unable to pronounce certain consonantal diphthongs, such as G and J, even if occupying bodies that can normally pronounce such sounds. This is very important, as it may be an only possible means of identification, for the Arnians will undoubtedly seek new bodies. Sarah switched off the teleaudio, her brown face openly sick. She bit her lip and looked at each of the three men surrounding her. That gives me the shivers, she said. Let's go home. After that, they didn't talk much. Under the red twilight, they packed up the pots and pans, leaving the unwanted food for the night-crawling gnolls. They spent a lot of time looking over their shoulders as they did this, although each tried to conceal it from the others. At last, the skimmer moved silently away from the bank and pointed its nose at the distant haze that was au by the Great Canal. At precisely seven o'clock, the teleaudio on the headboard of Joe's bed turned itself on. Sounds pricked the balloon of his disturbed slumber, tugging his mind out to wakefulness. He rolled over and sat up, listening rubbing his lanky legs. Instead of the usual symphonic music, he heard an urgent voice, obviously ad-libbing. Be very, very careful. The criminals, the Arnians, have still not been found. All residents of Ofe and vicinity are warned. This warning cannot be overemphasized. Joe reached out and clicked on the screen. The announcer's tunic was wrinkled. His sash was awry. He looked as if he had been up all night. Are advised to stay within the city limit. Joe snapped off the teleaudio and glanced over at Sarah's bed. She was snoring delicately, one smooth arm pillowing her mass of blue-black hair. Better that she doesn't hear any more about that business, he decided firmly. Joe liked the simple life. No servants, no flunkies, although he could have afforded a dozen. Five sunshiny rooms on the Great Canal, with a nice view of Mars Memorial Park on the bank opposite. He robed himself against the early morning chill and headed for the kitchen. His head ached faintly, and to judge by what little he could remember of it, he had had a dilly of a nightmare. Something about being chased, or something, or smothered by a... Even as he stopped in his tracks to try to pin it down, the memory broke, dissolved as if in flight. Frowning, he pushed through the kitchen door and crossed to the deep freeze, slid it open, and rummaged in it. The nightmare wasn't important, surely, but he molded over with interest as he prepared breakfast, for Joe, being rather well-adjusted, dreamed rarely, and then mostly about Iowa back on Earth. A long-ago picture 
of a 12-year-old boy, his first day in college. The boy, sitting under his shining projector, surrounded by a group of thunderstruck psychologists, the quick death of their initial skepticism, and in its place, a growing wonder as it became evident that Although a history spool was whirling in the scanner and the thought helmet functioned to perfection, the boy's mind was receiving neither spoken text nor images. You don't feel anything? A psychologist asked skeptically. Joe closed his eyes. There was a low, unmusical humming in his ears, and that was all. He tried to shake his head and couldn't, so he said, No, I don't. When was the World Federation formed? I don't know. Are you lying? No. One of the other psychologists standing nearby looked up from the little box he held in his hand and said that Joe wasn't lying. The first psychologist raised his eyebrows. We'll try another projector. While technicians dismantled Joe's projector and examined it for shorts or haywire, the psychologist had Joe sit down under all the other projectors in first Y cubicle 149. Then they tried 148 and 150. It's some kind of block, the first psychologist said finally, looking profound to cover up his tizzy. There's some kind of barrier in his mind. Joe Kerdak clenched his fists. That's not true. I want to learn. Then you probably will, boy. The psychologist sat down to fill in some forms. But you'll have to go back 300 years to do it. You'll have to learn from books. There the dream would simply end, for no fantasy of wish fulfillment could have exceeded in satisfaction Joe's actual conquest of this problem. At 18, he wore thick glasses. He preferred them to contacts or artificial irises. At 20... He took tests contrived especially for him by the members of central education assigned to his case. He was awarded equivalence degrees in business administration, metatomics, and interplanetary law. His marks were the highest of the year, and Joe Kerdak's name was briefly in the news phones. He started with the new Chicago offices of Mars Imports and Exports as a Mercury. After six weeks of flying back and forth with memos, he traded his anti-graphs for a dusk. And on June 32, 2401, the newly appointed regional buyer for M-I-N-E got married and was flown to Mars by a chartered spacer to take command of the regional office at Ofe by the Great Canal. He was putting the finishing touches on breakfast when he heard a groan and the sound of a stretch from the bedroom. When he turned around, Sarah was standing in the doorway. Joe's sandy eyebrows went up. His wife was certainly not a modest woman, but considering even that, this morning was an agreeable surprise. Her eyes were still dull. He guessed that she worried about those whatchacallits after going to bed but she was smiling broadly. Joe began to have visions of missing work for half a day. He smiled back at her, and she laughed a little. Hon, Arnold, she said. Joe was thrusting halved oranges into the juicer. He turned off the machine and grinned. You'll have to talk plainer than that, little monkey, he said. He held out a glass of juice. Drink this. It'll wake you up. The last word faded into an astonished silence. Then Joe said, Hey, come back. He set down the glass and went into the bedroom. She was lying on her bed, her face hidden. Joe dropped onto the edge of the bed and put a tentative hand on her back. Hey, now, he said softly. If that's the way you feel about it, I'll juice up some grapefruit. He moved his hand down and spanked lightly. Hein? She didn't look up. She had turned her head and was looking at the corner of the room by Joe's bed. I do not feel well. Go away. 
Joe's face was immediately concerned. He bent over her, reaching for a wrist. What's the matter, Sarah? Can I get you anything? The wrist hung limply in his hand. No, go away. Joe straightened up and drew his eyebrows together in thought. Sarah was usually tearful and pretty much of a leech when she wasn't feeling well. Excessive commiserations and breakfast in bed were the rule at such times. Do you want me to get Doc Halprin? The blue-black head shook from side to side. So what am I supposed to do, monkey? I hate to leave you this way. Go away. But can't I? Go away, damn you! Joe stood up abruptly. He clenched his fists and looked at his wife's still form, and gradually the anger dulled and left him. He had no right to be angry. Everyone got temperamental once in a while. But this was the first time she had ever cursed him. Okay, he said softly. I'll see you tonight. The regional offices of Mars Imports and Exports sat upon a hill at the end, or the beginning, of Isla Boulevard, depending on which way you were going. It was 2,500 feet of silver and native marble and covered four city blocks, and Joe Kerdak was top man, literally, since his office and personal staff took up the whole 251st floor. His morning mail, about twelve letters weeded out of the daily thousands, was gotten out of the way with skill and dispatch. Grinning, he propped his feet on the low, curving window sill and said, Miss Cal, take an audiogram. Miss Cal used two of her arms to adjust pad and stylus, looking up expectantly. Her other arms were busy transcribing a previously dictated letter into Venusian, her native tongue, although she spoke 68, and tugging at a humidified legging that had somehow worked down almost to the floor. My dearest darling monkey, Joe began. Miss Cow looked up again in amazement. Joe grinned at her and said, It's to my wife. Miss Cow nodded wisely and began to write. I am sending this from my dark and dismal office, Joe went on. It was a habit they had when anything went wrong at breakfast. Joe had first proposed by audiogram. He casually watched a skimmer that was in danger of creating a honey of a traffic jam down below. Didn't that Schlemiel know his left from his right? Where was I? Oh, yes. My dark and dismal office. Joe scratched a cigarette alight, blew a happy smoke ring. I hope that you are feeling much, much better and that you will take luncheon with me in the Pluto room of the you-know-what hotel. His mind went back to those honeymoon days, and he lost track of his dictation again. Another smoke ring, a somewhat more thoughtful one. You-know-what hotel? said Miss Cow, phlegmatically. Yes, uh, just ended at 115 sharp. Your ever-loving Joe. There was a knock on the door, and Miss Cal set down her pad and stylus and started to get up. Joe was on his feet and around the desk in a second. Stay right where you are, he smiled. I need the exercise. Miss Cal smiled also and settled back into her specially built chair with its temperature and humidity controls. A present from Mr. Kerdak. He was such a nice being to work for. Joe opened the door and said, Oh, hello, Kent. Since when are you knocking? Big Kent nodded formally to Miss Cal and winked at Joe. He said, Yo, there's something I'd like to talk over with you in private. With a sigh, Miss Cal rose again and made her way through the other door into her little office. The door closed behind her. Kent let out a long breath. He smiled at Joe, and the smile turned into a laugh that had an odd sound of triumph. Hone your Arnold, he said and laughed again. What's in a Dion Loir? Joe sat down behind his desk and looked at the big man. Hone you Arnold? Wasn't that what Sarah had said, or something very much like it? He shook his head. 
You wanted to talk to me about something, Ken? What are you and Sarah cooking up with this gibberish? The brilliant Martian sunlight, not as dim as had been anticipated in the days before space travel, came through the ceiling-high windows, struck little lights here and there from the bouquet of Venusian glass moss that Miss Cal had tended so carefully. It slanted across Kent's big face as he looked at Joe for a long moment, giving his left eye a pale, shallow luster and throwing the shadow of his jutting nose down over his mouth. He opened and closed his hands and said, Nothing. It'll wait, I guess. His gaze wandered over the room and settled on a corner that was empty save for a throw rug, a relic of Karadak's Iowa past. Kent's mouth tightened into a thin line. He stared at the corner. It'll wait for a while, he said stiffly, and opened the door and went into the outer office. Bone-faced, he walked toward the transveyor belt. Mr. Kent, Mr. Kent! The big man's Mercurian secretary rose out of a chair near the door, his voice quacking from the speaker set into his fishbowl helmet. Yes? They told me that you had gone to Mr. Kardak's office, sir. I've been trying to find you all morning, sir. A lady, sir, on the visiphone. She has called many times. Many times. Thank you, Kent said tonelessly. I know who it is. Joe Kardak stared in astonishment at the door. First Sarah, now Kent. This seemed to be the day for everybody to blast in orbits. Well, hell. He shrugged his shoulders and called Miss Cal back out of her office. She dropped into her chair with a sigh, and they picked up the day's business from where it had fallen. San Vika of Saturn Enterprises was threatening all kinds of things if he didn't receive his shipment of atter rotors on the very next flight. Joe didn't waste much time with that. One of the many things that made him a top executive was that he knew how to deal with phonies. He told San Vika, via space phone, that he could go stick his heads in a waste eliminator and push the button, and that if he wanted to get nasty, M.I.N.E. had an army of lawyers hanging around just itching to get their teeth into last year's insurance double deal. We let everyone get away with it once, Joe told him and cut the subtly fawning image off the screen. M.I.N.E.'s investigators, he thought absently, could certainly give the Saul Secret Service a run for their credits. Now that he had tactfully gotten San Vika straightened out, he might as well release those Atta rotors to be shipped. At 12.15, an audiogram came from Sarah. I don't feel well enough to come. Love, S. Well... At least it was an improvement in tone. At one o'clock, Miss Cal went into her office to open the mysterious little package of lunch that she brought with her every day. Joe stretched out his legs on the windowsill and looked at the traffic jam below. That driver had really done a fine job. There were three patrol skimmers circling the mess, darting to and fro like angry wasps. He didn't feel much like eating. Breakfast and supper were his big meals. The habit was a long-standing one. However, he thought, this morning's breakfast hadn't been much to rave about. Orange juice, some burned pall, some undercooked sand hoppers. He switched on the inner office visiphone. I would save you the trouble, he said, when Miss Cow's face appeared. But they built this place so that all my inside calls have to be routed through your selective tentacles. The usual, Mr. Karadak? The usual. Joe was rather proud of the fact that everything in his division of M, I, and E worked smoothly and efficiently, even the kitchens. In a little less than 40 seconds, a portion of his desk folded back and the usual appeared on an elevator tray, a pot of light coffee and some donuts with powdered brown sugar. Joe dunked the solid portion of his lunch and considered the morning's peculiar happenings, apparently unrelated incidents that were related in part always intrigued him. There was usually a logical reason for parallels. The trick, he thought, 
was to concentrate not on the coincidences themselves, but to examine the circumstances under which they occurred. Sarah's illness, Kent's queer behavior, not obviously connected, separately neurotic, yet what was it Kent had said that reminded him of Sarah's strange greeting? Hone you Arnold. The two had played practical jokes on him before. He grinned. This was probably one of their special five-day jobs, designed to make him into a shattered wreck by Friday, so Sarah could duck him on Saturday and get by with it. Joe repeated the syllables aloud, trying to make some sense out of them. Hone you Arnold. Instantly, he was on his feet, fighting, his lips raving silently. His big chair tipped back and fell over to the floor. A furious, icily cold intrusion was being made upon his mind. He stood with feet planted on either side of the overturned chair and threw the force off, but it came back again and again. The office was suddenly oppressive and stifling, and the objects around him were small and crystal clear, as if seen through the wrong end of a hand galaxoscope. The churning, utterly loathsome invasion surged up like a wave roaring against a reef and fell back and away in horrible desperation. From a million miles away, he heard, or felt, a voice. It said, You Arnold! Yes, you Arnold! And it said other things raging things that Joe could not understand. Then it was gone, as suddenly as it had come. The office regained its normal perspective. The bright sunlight, reflected now from the tall buildings across the Great Canal, erased the ragged black hole out of his consciousness. Painfully, he righted the chair and sank into it. His lungs felt pressed in and stale, like the inside of a folded blanket. He took a deep breath, shoved his wet palms hard at the top of the desk. You Arnold, the nightmare. It came back to him as dreams rarely do, down to its last beastly detail. A dream of fear and peril, a running dream, and not a dream after all. You Arnold. He looked at the corner of the room, at the colorful throw rug. It lay there under the sun, brighter than it had been, as if a pane of glass had been lifted from it. After a while, he got up and went to the door of Miss Cal's office. She looked up vaguely, concealing a small, resigned lizard under her jacket. Miss Cal, Joe said blindly, do you have my morning papers? He took the facsimiles back to his desk, walking slowly, afraid to get there and sit down and open them. The nightmare, the first aborted attempt, Sarah and Kent approaching him separately, yet similarly, allies. Each had been confident that during the night, you Arnold had. There was nothing else on the front sheets but the names. It, Lof, Der, and You Arnold. And the story of their possessor's escape from Mars Detain. A power breakdown had weakened the energy barrier that kept their elusive minds, and hence their bodies, in confinement. By the time arm replacements could be sent to the Arnian's isolated cell, the beings had vanished. The guards had been strangled. Energy barriers had been set up at all space and canal ports. Other barriers had been formed into a hundred-mile noose that was being carefully drawn in toward detain. Joe folded the last paper over the cruel, three-eyed faces that seemed to mock him. He fumbled at the visiphone. Miss Cow was wiping her lips cheerfully. Miss Cal, Joe said, get me Mr. Reader in shipping. He leaned his elbows wearily on the desk 
and waited until Reader's puritanical face appeared on the screen. Yeah, boss. Reader, has anyone consigned four large crates to go off world tomorrow night? Yeah, Reader replied promptly. Mr. Kent, B-type mobile spacesuits had me alter the manifest this morning. Do you have the crates down there? Uh-uh. Mr. Kent said he'd skim them in sometime tomorrow. He was coming up to get the switch okayed by you. Why? Anything wrong? Joe opened the center drawer of his desk. No, nothing's wrong. Listen carefully, reader. I'm going to take care of those crates myself. If I'm not in my office tomorrow, you are not to load them on ship, no matter what Mr. Kent anyone says or does. If the crates come in, refrigerate them, and call the patrol, and send the name of the addressee to detain immediately. Reader came as near as he ever had to looking surprised. Nothing wrong? His right eyebrow shot up several millimeters. Joe added, Keep this in your cheek, and there'll be double credits for you payday. Reader nodded. Yeah, boss, don't I always? Joe took his Adam pistol out of the drawer, handling it with unfamiliar fingers. It had been a long time since those target shooting days in Iowa. He checked the gun quickly, reloaded it with fresh pellets. He had left the visiphone on, and when Reader had broken his connection, the interior of Miss Cal's office and the surprised face of that eavesdropper had automatically returned. She stared at the Adam pistol. Miss Cow, Joe said softly, get me a canal cab. The bodies were lying in a row beneath an overhanging ledge of sandstone. They had burrowed deep into a miniature jungle of thick-leaved canal weeds, and it had taken him a long time to find them. The gleam of four shiny new B-type spacesuits less carefully concealed had finally ended the search. Kent and Ray had been busy this morning. Standing where he was, Joe could look down the green and red-dotted slope and see the ashes of the picnic fire, the scatterings of food that the night-crawling gnolls had found unpalatable. And, blown by Mars's occasional winds, or taken by alien hands, to a spot only a few feet from where it had been thrown away, was the scrap of paper with his letterhead on it. The paper that he and Kent had marked up during their discussion of tomorrow's flight to Arne, Callisto. If they didn't actually hear us talking, Joe thought, it was that paper that started the whole thing. He said loudly, Are you here, you Arnold? You thought it was perfect, didn't you? You thought you could repossess your bodies as the liner went off-world. Well, look at this. With exutival thoroughness, he blasted the four bodies into cinders. Sarah came out of the kitchen as Joe opened the canal door and let himself in. He turned and paid the cabbie, and the skimmer moved off. Hello, darling, she said, and tugged at his arm. I've got a swell supper fixed. Joe smiled at her as he shrugged out of his tunic. He flung it casually over her favorite potted it. She didn't grab it off. I should have been a detective, he thought. He followed her into the kitchen. Anything interesting happened today? Sarah began to arrange the table, moving things here and there fussily. She looked at Joe from the corner of her eye. That's about how you like it, isn't it? She asked. Joe said, That's fine. He ground out his cigarette on a clean plate. Sarah would have taken his head off if he had ever done that. No, he went on. Nothing happened. Same old stuff. They sat down to eat. Joe tasted his soup. It was rotten. He wondered if they cooked like that all over Callisto or only in Arn. Is it all right, darling? Sarah was looking at him brightly. Her fingers twined under her chin with the left pinky extended, her head cocked to one side. 
It was all so cute that it made Joe sick. He decided that if the showdown were put off much longer, he'd never be able to stand the sight of her again. You haven't called me darling since our days of stardust and chivalry, he said. Call me Joe. What? I said, call me Joe. Sarah pushed her plate away. Her brown eyes were muddy. I wasn't hungry anyway, she said coldly. Big Kent and Ray came through the door that led into the living room. Kent leaned against the wall and folded his massive arms. He grinned mockingly at Joe. We never give up, he said. Ray stared nervously and wet his lips. Joe shoved back his chair, inch by inch. You Arnold's dead, he said. He blundered things in my office and got scared and tried to get off world in a passenger. The patrol blasted him. Sarah rose calmly and looked at Ray and Kent. Their faces were stony. She said, Luff, Durr, I think the four of us together can break down his resistance to occupancy. Her eyes traveled to an empty corner of the kitchen. Are you ready, you Arnold? She faced Joe again, a sly smile on her lips. You Arnold wasn't killed, yo. Atomics don't kill us. The passenger was. Joe wasn't surprised when she floated away from the chair and toward him, her slippers hardly seeming to touch the floor. He had been expecting to be attacked. But what almost broke him into little pieces was her third eye, the one that blinked open in the middle of her forehead, brushing aside a brittle shell of skin and glaring at him with its wide, unhuman hunger. Then... For one terrible second, his brain felt packed in ice. The room was grotesque, filled with alien contrivances. The only sensible thing in it was eye's warm, familiar third eye. With all his melting strength, Joe thought, I destroyed the bodies. And the whole scene dangled unmoving before him. The weird, distant setting in for the climax of the play as he heard his own voice in a wrenching groan. Our bodies! Destroyed! Appalling misery and hatred for himself rocked Joe's brain. Then you Arnold recoiled as the Arnian's rapport was broken. Joe cried chokingly, Lieutenant! Lieutenant Smith! The canal door burst open and Lieutenant Smith of Mars Detain, who had been hugging the narrow metal landing ledge, came in like the proverbial tornado. What he had heard had more than convinced him. The deadly little sphere in his hand started to make sharp, spitting sounds. Sarah and Kent and Ray and the invisible Uarnal screamed, all together in a dissonance of agony and fear and death. Then three of them stood loosely, in puzzled silence. Big Kent brushed a hand across his eyes. Ray, he muttered, what in hell were you yelling about? Ray looked at him and sank into the nearest chair. Yelling? He said bewilderingly. His fingers began to unconsciously perform on the chair arm. I don't know. Was I yelling? Sarah was in Joe's arms, her blue-black hair sending its aching fragrance into his nostrils. Joe, she whispered. Joe, what happened? He tipped back her head, ran a finger over her smooth brown forehead, hypnosis to paralyze and freeze him to weaken him. He drew her face against his shoulder again. What had happened? What would those psychologists back in Iowa say if this story ever reached their ears? The barrier? 
some sort of block in my mind, my freakish mind, that keeps out projectors and Arnians? Kent, he said, fix us all some drinks. Lieutenant Smith's got a story to tell us about that picnic. End of Cargo to Callisto by Jerome Bixby Writing as J.B. Drexel Read by Paul Hampton Mr. Ruplugel's Dream by Evelyn E. Smith This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Doug Wade Mr. Replugel's Dream by Evelyn E. Smith This was a proud day in the life of modern art. This exhibition would prove that the machine could not conquer man. The Cimabue Gallery was the last stronghold of nostalgia, expensive nostalgia. Apart for the robot attendants, unfortunately necessary, the times being what they were, there was practically nothing machine made about the gallery, dedicated as it was to being more than a mere commercial venture. Evelyn E. Smith returns to these pages with a gently ironic story of men and dreams, the day after tomorrow. This, said Mr. Dittmers, is a proud day in the life of the Cimabue Gallery. It is a proud day in the life of modern art, added Mr. Replugel, feeling that Mr. Dittmers was giving too parochial a picture of the situation, for it proves with more force than ever that the machine will not conquer man. Both partners gazed with varying degrees of complacency at the large, brightly colored oil paintings that covered the refined pastel walls of the Cimabue. There was almost nothing machine made about the gallery. The thick, soft rugs had been hand-woven at fabulous expense by workmen in the less industrialized areas of the Middle East, the furnishings hand-carved by tribes and deep in the heart of the Australian bush. The only exception was the robot attendants, which were, unfortunately, necessary, for no one paid attention to human beings anymore unless they were top management or very high in the hierarchy of handcrafters. Simabu could afford all this luxury, and more too, for, now that big business had become an art, art had become a big business, People saved the excess from their government subsidies, or, if they were lucky enough to have professional status, their salaries, to buy a painting, a holograph manuscript, anything to distinguish their homes from the uniform gray mass of material comforts which the government bestowed on everyone alike. As a result, the partners were as wealthy as anyone outside the ruling class could hope to be. However, Mr. Replugel, at least, was not happy. He suffered from nightmares. But where is Orville? demanded the man from the Times Herald Mirror. We haven't come to interview you two. You all say the same thing about every new artist you discover. In fact, we already have your words set up in type. Mr. Dittmers gave him a benign smile. Orville's case is different. Never before in history has an absolutely unknown artist received such an immediate ovation from the public. Why, almost every picture on exhibit is already sold. The buyers have kindly allowed us to retain them on our walls for the duration of the show as a service to the public. Simabu is more than a mere commercial venture, Mr. Replugel added, wishing he could slip off for a perisprin. His head hurt most mechanically. It is a cultural institution. Yeah, Orville did get pretty good write-ups, the World Post and Journal man conceded, though any halfway decent artist sells like hotcakes these days. People naturally go for anything that's handmade, and he fingered his hand-painted tie self-consciously. But it can't last. This disturbed Mr. Replugel more than it should have, but he had been bothered for many years by his recurring dream a dream so frightful that he did not dare to confide it to anyone because of its terrifying plausibility. And anything said or done by day that seemed to approach that midnight horror roused him to immediate defensiveness. Oh yes, it can last, he protested. It will. It must. For art is the people's last bulwark against the machine, the one area which cannot be mechanized, which reassures the human race that it's still preeminent. Kindly do not touch the pictures, the robo-guard droned. I was only feeling Orville's imposto, the lady from the woman's own news defended herself. Very thick. I couldn't have told her to stop, Mr. Replugel reflected bitterly. Coming from me, it would have been rude, but from a robot, it's all right. Everyone knows a robot's only aim is to serve man. Our altruism depends on our individual consciences. Theirs is built in and hence more reliable. But where is Orville? The man from the Times Herald Mirror persisted. He was supposed to be here at 3.30, and it's almost 4 now. Softly, softly, said Mr. Dittmers. The robo-bar doesn't open itself until four anyway, so you know you're in no hurry. And remember, a great artist mustn't be rushed. He is not a machine, you know. Hervey McGeechan is bringing him, Mr. Replugel explained. One could hardly hurry McGeechan, he added, unnecessarily, for everyone knew that one didn't hurry the richest man in the United States. One awaited his pleasure. Beside being fabulously wealthy, McGeechan had the reputation of being something of a recluse. But this did not make him more newsworthy, for all members of top management tended to be a bit eccentric. The rank was hereditary. It took more than one generation for a family to begin to understand its machines, and there was a lot of inbreeding, with the usual results. 
Orville is a protege of Mr. McGeechan's, isn't he? Asked the lady from Women's Own. Yes, Mr. Dittmer said. All that was in the press release. He's one of Mr. McGeechan's employees. Mr. McGeechan discovered him personally, and he got in touch with us. Mr. Dittmer's almost swelled with visible pride. Mr. Replugel wished he would exercise a bit more self-restraint. Such an open display of emotion was vulgar, almost mechanical, one might say. Especially since they themselves were management, in a way, although one didn't, of course, apply such a word to those who dealt in the arts and crafts. The general public feared and respected the management which governed them, but they loved entrepreneurs. A factory hand, woman's own gushed. What a story that will make. The male reporters laughed as one male. Where have you been all these years, Cookie? asked the World Post and Journal. I doubt if there's a factory left in the United States that isn't mechanized to the very hilt by now, with robot labor for the most specialized operations. I know, she sighed. Deep down inside of me, I really know. I was just hoping. I suppose I am, and she batted her eyelashes, like all females, an incurable romantic. What do you suppose Orville is, then? Might be a clerk, Time Week suggested. A lot of the big places still use life clerical help for tone, and, of course, you always need a few human beings around in case the machines break down. I somehow got the impression that he was an executive, Mr. Dittmer said frostily. Let's hope not. It would ruin the human element in the story. You can't expect our readers to identify with management. A minor executive, that is, Mr. Replugel hastened to inform them, before Dittmer's could open his big mouth again. More like a shipping clerk. Is Orville his first name or his last name, Woman's Own wanted to know. Just Orville, Mr. Dittmer said, like Rembrandt. Of course, Rembrandt did have a last name, Mr. Replugel pointed out. He just isn't known by it. And Orville's more like Grandma Moses, anyhow, I would say, commented the Times Herald Mirror. He is a primitive, true, Mr. Replugel said judiciously. If you insist upon pinning a label on him, you might call him a post-pre-Raphaelite with just a soupkin of Rousseau. I didn't know Rousseau painted, the World Post and Journal man said, busily clicking on his typo pad. Not that one, Mr. Replugel told him kindly. The other two. How old is Orville? Woman's own held her typo pad at the ready. How many children does he have? Is he married? Fond of animals? What does he eat for breakfast? For heaven's sake, Mr. Dittmers exploded. It isn't the man himself that matters. It's the man as interpreted through his art. And you can see that art for yourself. He waved his arms towards the pale gallery walls. Drink it in and absorb the essence of the artist. But we'd like a little more factual data as a point of departure. After all, our readers... All right. All right, Mr. Dittmer said before Mr. Replugel could stop him. I'll give you all the facts we have. To wit, none. All we know about Orville we put into the release. McGeechan's been keeping him under wraps. We don't know a thing about him. He's eccentric. McGeechan, I mean. Could be Orville also, the World Post and Journal suggested. Mr. Dittmer sighed. Could be Orville also, he conceded. It's more of a story if Orville is eccentric. You more or less expect it from management. Well, Mr. Replugel said, unable to contain himself further, his head was really blasting off. Artists can be pretty peculiar people, too. It was Mr. Dittmer's turn to glare at him. Make way for Hervey McGeechan III and Orville, the robot at the door declaimed. Make way. Every head swiveled to catch sight of the well-known but seldom-seen financier as he came jerkily through the crowd. All the journalists were dressed in the maroon or beige or navy synthetics of almost similar cut that mass production had enforced upon the entire population, save for the very wealthy. Gay knitted mittens, colorful plumed hats, rainbow-hued scarves, all of which were ostentatiously handmade, showed that the pressmen were professionals and not mere government pensioners who could do nothing that a machine could not do as well or better. However, although there was no sumptuary laws as such, few of the journalists could afford more than one or two of these costly status-making accessories. McGeechan was completely costumed in rugged individualist style. His scarlet silk hose, emerald satin knee breeches, swallow-tailed plum velvet coat, and starched white ruff made Mr. Replugel, who had been rather proud of his own pale blue brocade waistcoat and sealskin mucklucks, almost sick with envy. He's so handsome, he's practically mechanical, he said bitterly to himself. McGeechan was followed by a Class Three all-purpose manual labor robot, well-burnished, but of rather an early pattern. Surely, Mr. Replugel thought, if the financier had to use a mechanical man, and personal attendants were far more handmade, he could at least have gotten a more recent model. Welcome to Simabue, Mr. McGeechan, Mr. Dittmers and Mr. Replugel said almost simultaneously. But where is Orville? the senior partner added. McGeechan pointed with his long green cigar. This is Orville, he said in a crisp metallic voice. Mr. Replugel could feel himself growing pale all the way down to his mucklucks. 
This was precisely the way his nightmare had always begun. Only now it was reality. Or was it? Perhaps he was back in the dream again. He could close his eyes and, when he opened them, he would be lying in his own standard air-conditioned Tota Comfort sleep lounge under his own satin-covered, goose-down-filled luxury quilt. A robot, he could hear Mr. Dittmer's wail as the typo pads began to click thinly, his voice somehow sounding far away. How could you? Why didn't you let us know he was a robot beforehand? Mr. Replugel opened his eyes and nothing had changed. It was all real. It was the end. Because you would have discriminated against him, Hervey McGeechan was saying, his gray face shiny with excessive emotion. Everybody discriminates against my poor robot. Trustworthy, hardworking, clean, loyal to a fault, yet everybody discriminates against them merely because they're machines. I knew that if I told you he was a robot, you would have never hung his pictures in Simabue, in spite of the fact that it was I who recommended him. Top management or no, Mr. Replugel felt he must speak. There were principles at stake. The dismal future of humanity rested somehow in his own shaking hands. Sir, he said in a hoarse voice, you have not dealt fairly with us. You said that this Orville was a protege of yours. And so he is. McGeechan put a thick, unmuscular arm around the robot's hard shoulders. He is my protege and friends, and I don't care if people do call me a robot lover. There was a gasp from the reporters, even those representing the liberal press. McGeechan pointed his cigar at them. Listen, he said, autobiographical note. Typo pads began to click. Up until the age of 17, I hardly knew there was anybody on the planet but robots. My father didn't have time to mess around with kids, since he believed in running all of his multifarious industries personally. I myself, though I tour the factories only once a year, have succeeded, by means of a computer and a Ouija board, in increasing what little remained of his vast fortune after taxes to an amount that is ten times as great as his was at its peak. How do you spell Ouija, the man from the World Post and Journal interrupted. So, McGeechan continued after affably spelling the word and making a few adverse remarks on the sad state of current education, During my childhood, I was left entirely in the care of robots, and I was a happy, carefree lad until I was sent to Harvard. There I discovered the dark truth which has overshadowed my life ever since and rendered me a virtual recluse, that there are also large numbers of people in the world. Give me a robot any time. Trustworthy, hardworking, clean, loyal to a fault, and, in Orville's case, artistic also. Tell him how you got started into paint, Orville. Well, it was like this, gents, Orville said in a voice like a rusty hinge. I work for the perfect paint section of the Superior Chemicals Division of the Universal Materials Corporation, which is a subsidiary of the McGeechan Interests, and, as I'm getting along in gears, I was put onto artists' oils colors, which are individually ground, like all artists nowadays want them to be. In all McGeechan products, from paints to parliaments, the financier interjected, the customer comes first, insofar as his desires are compatible with the mass production methods necessarily imposed upon us by automation. And there was a little left over of some colors that wouldn't fit into the tubes, and the Forbot says to me, he says, throw them into the disposal, Orville. All the McGeechan robots have names. It gives that personal touch I like to have around my plants. There was something extraordinarily odd about McGeechan, Mr. Replugel felt, though he couldn't quite put his finger on just what it was. Something more than mere eccentricity. Something curiously sinister. And I says to the Forbot, Begging your pardon, sir, but if there was no other use for him, I would like to try my hand at painting a picture like on the pretty calendars Perfect Paint sends out every Christmas. And he says to me, laughing like, Well, if that's what you want to do with your restoration period, Orville, more power to you, which is, the robot snickered, a kind of little joke we have amongst ourselves at the factory. One of the Simabu robots gave a laugh, which Mr. Replugel cut short with a glance. But I didn't know they could do that, the Times Herald Mirror said plaintively. Laugh, I mean. Ah, McGeechan told him, that's because you never bothered to understand the real robot. You don't look beyond the metal to the wires that vibrate underneath. So I painted a picture on a piece of cardboard, Orville continued patiently. The side of a carton it was, and the picture was much admired in the plant, though I says it as shouldn't. And Mr. Pembroke, the superintendent, went so far as to ask as he might have to hang it in his office, which of course I was glad to have him do. And there it came to the attention of Mr. McGeechan when he was making his annual tour of the plant. Mr. McGeechan is, Orville approximated a modest cough, by ways of being a connoisseur. When I saw that picture, I knew I was standing in the presence of solid genius, McGeechan took over. Mind you, when I heard it been painted by a robot, I was surprised myself, I admit it freely. But I was not prejudiced. I had spent all my life with machines, and I knew of what fine handcraft they were capable. Why shouldn't a robot paint a picture, I asked myself. No reason whatsoever, I answered. And I was right, as is amply evidenced by this splendid and tastefully arranged display. He beamed at Mr. Dittmers, who groaned. 
But it's impossible, the lady from Woman's Zone protested, looking as if only the dignity of her profession kept her from bursting into tears. How could a robot paint a picture? How could it want to paint a picture? I don't know. Orville, as the only one who could conceivably be expected to answer this question, said, It just come to me like that. You could say I was inspired, I guess. But inspiration is human prerogative. If a robot can be inspired, what is left for people now? "'Tisn't for me to say, miss,' Orville said modestly, "'only I don't see why we both couldn't be inspired. "'Peaceful coexistence, like. "'If robots are designed to serve man, "'they could do a better job of it "'if both men and machine work side by side harmoniously.' "'Work?' exclaimed the male reporters unharmoniously. "'Mr. Replugel closed his eyes. "'He had never expected to hear such a mechanical word "'in the chaste purlieu of his gallery. "'His and Mr. Dittmer's gallery, that was. "'But it didn't matter. "'Soon it wouldn't be anybody's gallery.' Reality was following the inexorable course of the dream, and they were doomed. "'No offense intended,' Orville said hastily. "'I meant work like maybe painting or knitting. I didn't mean machine work.' "'And why not machine work?' McGeechan demanded. "'Why shouldn't man work with his hands instead of just crafting?' "'A little man,' Replugal thought, would be lynched for saying a more than mechanical thing like that. Mechanical, why it was downright subversive. But McGeechan was secure because of the position that he maintained only as a result of the sweat and toil of others.' Only, of course, robots don't sweat. The light film that had begun to cover Orville was doubtless only excess oil. Disgusting, nevertheless. Listen, McGeechan said, pointing his long green cigar at the reporters. Important announcement. I have decided to replace all my feedback equipment, except where the most delicate operations are involved, by people. The typopads clicked furiously. You ask me why? Although no one had, they were much too stunned. Because robots, though trustworthy, hardworking, clean, and loyal to a fault, have one drawback. They're expensive. A worker dies or gets sick, it's no extra money out of my pocket. I got to pay taxes for his welfare anyway. A robot breaks down, his loss is all mine. A human worker I got to take care of maybe six, seven hours a day. A robot, 24 hours. And it isn't as if they worked all that time. They got to have rest periods too, or they wear out too fast. A human worker isn't my responsibility. A robot I got to look out for all the time. But I thought you liked machines better than people, Mr. Replugel said. So is management expected to like labor? Is labor supposed to like management? Traditional enemies. I just figured out why I've been so unhappy most of my life. I like my employees. It's unnatural. It's wrong, Mr. McGeechan, quavered woman's own. What do you mean? I'm going to put people in my factories and have robots at my dinner table. They don't eat, McGeechan chuckled frutally. So you can see what an economy move that would be. Nobody laughed. If McGeechan hadn't been top management, really top management, Mr. Replugel knew, he would have been torn to pieces. But top management was boss. It was government. It was divine right. No one did anything. If the machine can replace man, Orville suggested, why can't man replace the machine? Plenty of room for both. Did I say something wrong, he added, seeing the expressions on the human faces that surrounded him. You're just ahead of your time, boy, McGeechan clapped him on the shoulder. But you're right. Why can't man coexist with the machine? Why can't robots paint pictures and write books and compose operas while people work in the factories? Don't know just yet how it'll work out in the factories, but it'll be a great day for art. We're going to have to give the money back, Mr. Replugel said dully. What money? McGeechan asked, obviously annoyed by this anticlimactic remark. The money paid for Orville's pictures. We cheated the buyers. Unwittingly is true, but we cheated them nonetheless. We sold the pictures as handmaids. They're machined. But I have hands, Orville protested. Mr. Dittmer shook his head. You're a machine. Replugal is right. Simabue is ruined. I'll make good your losses, McGeechan said in his crisp, metallic voice. And just then Mr. Replugal knew what had been bothering him all along about the financier. Despite his completely handmade costume, McGeechan looked exactly like a robot. The triumph of environment over heredity. Or was it as simple as that, Mr. Replugel wondered. Everyone knew who Hervey McGeechan's father was, but who had his mother been? No one can make good our losses, Mr. Dittmers told him. Modern art has suffered a crushing blow from which it will never recover. The handwriting is on the wall. You mean the typewriting, Mr. Replugel said. End of Mr. Replugel's Dream by Evelyn E. Smith Recording by Doug Wade Through Time and Space with Benedict Breadfruit by Randall Garrett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Through Time and Space with Benedict Breadfruit Part 1 On the ancient planet of Fujiu II, the natives were in a terrible tizzy. Their local god, a huge, intelligent lichen which covered a fifth of the habitable surface of Fogio II, was dying. Naturally, they sent for Benedict Breadfruit. He took one look at the lichen and said, It is obvious that the fungi part of this intelligent, symbiotic organism is in good health. The other part, however... He gave it a shot of vitamins and a chlorophyll pill. The great lichen immediately spruced up, and began delivering its deep pronunciamentos with the proper punctilio. What was wrong with it? asked one of the natives. Nothing serious, said Benedict Breadfruit. All it needed was an algae buttress. Grendel Barrington Through Time and Space with Benedict Breadfruit Part 2 the accepted method for removing space lice from the hull of a ship was by sandblasting, but the boys around the space docks noticed that Benedict Breadfruit's shiny hull was not pitted either by space lice or by sandblasting. Breadfruit used hydrogen cyanide to remove the pests, but he had never told anyone about it. Come, Breadfruit, said one of the spaceport officials. Tell us how you remove your burden of pendiculous pests. Breadfruit gestured at his HCN generator. A gas moth! Grendel Barrington. Through Time and Space with Benedict Breadfruit. Part 3. Father, said Benedict Breadfruit's son, Benedict II, look at that robot over there. How can a machine in such horribly battered condition move about? Benedict Breadfruit looked sourfully at his son. Haven't you ever seen John Campbell, Jr.? Grendel Barrington Through Time and Space with Benedict Breadfruit Part 4 But what will they do with the robot when it becomes too decrepit to move? persisted the boy. Breadfruit pointed to a large vat of bubbling acid in the public square. They'll throw him in the pool yonder, son. Grendel Barrington. Through Time and Space with Benedict Breadfruit. Part 5. On the planet Tenta 1, plants of the melon and related families were so rare that the king himself had issued a royal fiat to protect them. Not knowing this, Benedict Breadfruit's young son started to pick a pumpkin. Fortunately, his father stopped him in time. But why can't I pick a pumpkin, father? asked the child. It would be a violation of the Gord Edict, son. Grendel Barrington Through Time and Space with Benedict Breadfruit Part 6 On the planet 2 for 6, said Benedict Breadfruit in his address to the members of the Institute for 21st Century Studies, a group specializing in ancient history, the natives keep time by means of cords which have knots tied along their length at precisely measured intervals. Since the material from which these cords are made is remarkably even in its rate of burning, it is possible to tell the exact hour by noticing how many knots have been burned after one end has been lit. What is this remarkable contraption called? asked one of the members. Well, naturally, said Benedict Breadfruit in his best British accent. It would be a knot clock. Grendel Barrington. Through Time and Space with Benedict Breadfruit, Part 7. The Black Beast of Beetlejuice, although horrible in aspect, was really a very pleasant fellow when you got to know him, as Benedict Breadfruit did. But because of his alienness, he was forbidden to go to Earth by a galactic space lines regulation, forbidding tickets to be sold to horrible monsters. It's an unfair law, said the Black Beast. 
You're a man of some importance, Benedict. Couldn't you do something about it? Breadfruit nodded. I believe I can get the Reginald, Bait Noir. Grandel Barrington. Through Time and Space with Benedict Breadfruit, Part 8. The peculiar religio-sexual practices of the inhabitants of Who Got Nine are known throughout the galaxy. One day, a group of Hugatu called upon Benedict Breadfruit. We are, said their spokesman, planning to build an old-fashioned earth-type house for our group. The living quarters for the males and females will be on the first and second floors. The Temple of Love, as we call it, will occupy the top floor, just under the roof. Knowing your abilities with language, we would like for you to give us a name for our temple. Orgiastic top floor, eh? asked Breadfruit. That's right. A hot pants attic, as it were, said Breadfruit. If you insist, yes, said the spokesman. A libidinous area just under the roof, one might say. That's what we said, agreed the Hugatu. In other words, a lewd loft, persisted Breadfruit. Most emphatically, said the Hugatu spokesman. Benedict Breadfruit shook his head, baffled for the first time in his life. Gee, fellas, I just can't think of a damn thing. Grandel Barrington. Editor's note. In this final episode of Benedict Breadfruit, the author's name is revealed. End of Through Time and Space with Benedict Breadfruit. Read by Paul Hampton. The Protector by Betsy Curtis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Doug Wade. The Protector by Betsy Curtis. There's a fortune in a boxer who feels no pain. This one didn't, except in odd ways. How come I live on Gorlin Permanent? Well, it's something like this. There is nobody real surprised when some scientist writes an article in the Sunday Supplement about the primitive tribes of Anista dying out, probably. The Aniston natives is freaks, anyway, and folks just naturally figure they can't last long in stiff competition. If you are like them, and your body don't feel any pain any time, you need a nursemaid around to keep you from doing dumb things, like walking in front of a truck or starving to death. I'm here on Gorlin a couple times and know about them. Some folks think it's comical to watch the space crews think up ways to give an Aniston a workout. I see one Aniston girl, a real looker she is, too. Dance 14 hours before she gives out, just for a bottle of perfume in one of the Venusian fur lounge robes. They sure enjoy their pleasures, even if they never feel no pain. You feeling any? More Thiska? Hey, Nor, another round of Thiska for the boys. Well, they can feel your feelings, and any thoughts that are about them, too. I guess all they live for is pleasure and a pat on the back. One time, a little runty Aniston guy even builds a whole stone blockhouse for a first Louis, when the Louis thinks real hard that the little guy looks like a first-rate hod carrier. Time the house is built, the Aniston's hands is all bloody and one ankle broke where a chunk of rock drops on him. He don't notice it, of course. Pierre gets all worked up about them Anista dying out. That's my boy Pierre, the heavyweight. I name him Pierre so as nobody thinks he is tough till afterward. He comes from Gorlin. Of course I have to stable him on Venus long enough for a legal residence or the boxing commission would have him investigated and maybe banned from the ring as a telepath. Tough training him, too. He can't see the sense of fighting, but man, he can stay in the ring all night. He never does get real speedy on his feet, but he learns fast and packs a wicked left. I don't have to lie when I'm thinking real hard that he is champion material. Anyhow, Pierre gets all worked up over his race getting extinct. He has a sister who is glenched to some nice boy, and his old man is some sort of a chief. He is all for beating it back by the next Via Venus ship to see what is getting at the old folks at home. I calm him down, though give him a couple of shots of Thiska, and say I better take him around to see that scientist dopester and get the inside first. I have to go everywhere with him to see he doesn't break a leg and forget to tell me about it. So we hop a tat and shy and make for Washington where this science fellow is with some Smithsonian Institute. He is nice enough about seeing us, but he can't figure out how a Chinaman like Pierre has any call to be steamed up about the Anista. 
You've seen these Anista with their slick black hair and goldy skin and smooth eyelids like an Earth Chinaman. So I have to break down and tell him about Pierre being an Aniston. That scientist is pretty peeved with me bringing Pierre into the Earth system. But when I tell him Pierre wants to go back to help out the folks, he kind of clams up and says the article is just one of those Sunday paper things. There don't really seem to be anything wrong on Gorlin, except that all the workers are getting more careless than usual, falling off walls they are building and getting hit by rocks during blasting, or walking in front of full cars in the mines. Pierre gives the man a look. Workers? Mines? Blasting? He says. What gives? There are no mines on Gorlin, he says. Just a few quarries and a lot of farms. We never have to kill ourselves working. What gives? He says. Oh, the man comes back. There's a couple big targ mines in full swing. Some big earth concern is shipping out the stuff five freighters a day to Mercury for mass insulation. All native workers. They don't get paid much. Weege cigarettes, bubble baths, some thiska, electro fur blankets, stuff like that. But I don't hear yapping. If I do, I report anything that looks like slavery. Of course, he says it with a lot of grammar and it takes him half an hour, but that is the slant. He wants to gab son then with Pierre. I see that the boy is getting jittery and homesick, too, when the guy starts raving about swimming in the flaff pools and the feeling of catwheela pedals under your bare feet, so I says we have to catch a plane and get out of there. Pierre still wants to head for Gorlin. He says his people must be unhappy about something, or they are more careful. Life on Gorlin is too much fun to just go and die for no reason. I try to pep him up on the way back to Shy, talking about his next fight with Kid Bop, but he says he can't see any reason in fighting, either, just now. I tell him I think he kind of likes fighting, but he says what he likes is the nice things I think about him when he wins, and he is too worried about his family to pay much attention to what I think just now. Well, we are both pretty flush from one of the best fight seasons I ever see, and a rest won't hurt the boy, so I say okay, we are going by the first liner off the flats. You don't have to go, Joe, he says. Keep your dough and train a couple more kids. I may not be back, he says. Look, boy, I says, you know what the food is like on them liners, I says, kind of kidding. And if there's nobody around to cram it down you, you don't eat. And if you don't eat, you starve. And if you starve, you are in no condition to cheer up your sister and your old man. Besides, I says, I can afford a vacation, and you're the only fighter I want to work with. You've got a real future, I says, and I'm going to bring you back alive. I guess that makes him feel kind of good, because he grins first time since he reads that paper and says, All right, Joe, come along. We buy a few pretties and neckties in the station and ship out of Shy for the flats on the next tat. Pierre wants to get some perfume for his sister, but I tell him we can get better on Venus, where all the good stuff is made. The trip from Venus space base to Gorlin is fast on account of overdrive, but even so I have no trouble passing Pierre off as a fighter who has the jitters and is headed for a vacation where he learns to take it easy the easy way. He is always burning his fingers or his mouth on a cigarette, and I have to keep an eye on him all the time. Nerves, I explain to the passengers. When we land, Pierre is all for hunting up his folks, but I says no. If there is some trouble, it is smarter to case the joint. We check in at the swanky tourist hotel. She is new since I'm on Gorlin a couple years ago, and what class. She is built around one of the biggest flaff pools on the whole planet, and our room is completely lined with padded velvety stuff, sort of a deep red color, and the bathroom has a cloud drift shower you can nearly float away on. But Pierre just doesn't relax. I keep trying to make him get in the shower, but it is no use. He says he is just too worried to take any pleasure in it. I don't think we ought to go scouting till night, and that is some 30 hours yet. But when I see he is settling down to wear the fuzz right off the floor walking round and round, I give in, feed him a sandwich I bring from the ship, and we stroll off in the woods like we are looking for flowers. There are no signs around the hotel saying which way to the mines, so we set off to circle the hotel and spaceport clearing to look for the rail line that brings the targ to the port. I figure we have gone about two-thirds of the way around when I nearly fall over a guy sitting on the ground with his head in his hands. What I think is a Ketwila flowers is just the red Aniston Chloe he has on. He looks up sort of dull when then he sees Pierre with me. He lets out a yip and sits back hard on the ground and moans. Pierre yanks the fellow up on his feet and hugs him and starts to jabber away so fast I can't tell what he is saying. Foreigners always talk faster than anybody else. The other guy puts in a word or two every once in a while, and then he scrams off through the trees. That's Nor, Pierre informs me. The guy my sister Janelle is glenched to. He is going to get us a couple of clothes so nobody notices us around the mine. He's feeling mighty low, but I can't figure out why. He says Janelle and the old man are okay, only he can't ever carry Janelle to his own house because he ain't man enough. I don't get it. He can make a good fighter, Joe. 
before you can count three, Nora's back with the cloas and Pierre strips and gets into his. I ain't too keen to show my shapelies, but Pierre starts grabbing my shirt and I have to put the cloa on or else. The boys head south at a good clip and I tag along trying to catch up and find out the score. When Pierre sees I am making like winded, he slows down and tells me we are going to the mine owner's fancy dump about two miles down the drag. Pierre says Nor tells him the mine owner doesn't like him and he has to leave us when we get inside of the house. After about a mile, Nor begins to drag along. Then he just sits down under another tree and says that that is the end of the line for him. He points through the trees and says, go on, maybe he is still there when we come back, maybe not. While Pierre is jawing with him, I look up the trail and see an Aniston babe about a hundred feet away. You can tell it is a babe from one of them blue and green molos draped over her over the cloa. Nor sees her too and takes off like a bat back the way we come. Pierre jogs ahead and when I get up with him, there he is hugging and jabbering again. My sister Janelle, he says, and Janelle, this is Joe, my manager. She is a cute trick with lots of yumph showing through the molo. She stands kind of slumped, though, and a few of the flowers in her shiny black hair are pretty mashed. What's the matter, Janelle, I says. You look kind of dragged out for a dame whose brother comes home practically a champion. Can't wheel of flowers go on strike? I says, just trying to make talk. She slumps a little more and says the boss don't like her and how it's too bad her brother has to come home and find her still alive and cluttering up the woods. I tell Pierre she better take us to this boss that don't like a babe like her, but she just shakes her head and says, go that way, and we come to the house. Then she says the boss makes the natives use the employee's entrance on the other side of the house, and she offers to take and show us the way. She kind of twitches when she says, natives. She don't even says yes or no all the way to the gate till, just before we get there, I trip on a root and bang my knee on a rock on the way down. Well, I howl and cuss some, and she comes up close and asks me what seems to be the matter. I tell her the blamed rock hurts my knee, and I think real hard about her knee it would feel if a rock hits it, and she busts right out crying. Oh, you poor man, you poor man, you, she sobs. That rock don't like you at all. It don't hate me either, I says. It's only a rock. But it makes a hurt to you. It don't love you, and now you are not happy where there's any rocks because they don't love you, she says, and she helps me up and starts dragging me along, still crying like crazy. I don't make nothing out of that, but pretty soon we come to a little gate in a thick row of bushes. Janelle lets go of me and says she hopes Pierre is a strong man and a good worker and that the boss likes him. And then she gives a big sigh and says if the boss don't like him, we can find her over there where the men are cutting down a bunch of trees. Because if one of the trees likes her, it will maybe fall on her pretty soon. Pierre tells her to wait right there by the gate because he is coming back. He isn't looking for work so the boss won't care if he is strong or not. She just sighs again and sits down on the grass and whimpers. Pierre tries once more to get her to tell him what is the matter, but all she says is that their father and some other fellow named Frith are up at the big house. They are being talked to by the boss about not getting enough targ on the shifts where there are foremen, and she says how sad it is about Pierre coming home. It is just beginning to filter through my thick skull that the boss is connected with all this dying out of the Anista, as the Sunday paper puts it, and I grab Pierre away from Janelle and hustle him through the gate. Look, Pierre, I says, we'll go around and listen by them long windows and see what cooks. I'll bet that boss is up to something dirty in there. If he is the one who messed up Janelle, I says, we better just mess him up some. There is nobody in sight on the lawn, and we just march up to the window easy as pie. There is this big, booming voice giving somebody what for. You poor, miserable idiots, yells this voice. You can't keep the workers off the tracks, and you get out less than 20 tons of targ since last night, and then you waste a whole charge of nitro by not telling the watchman he's not supposed to smoke in the enclosure. All those people are dead, and it's your fault. I hear a sniffle behind me, and when I turn around, there is Janelle. She has sneaked up behind us to see what we are going to do. That's how he talks to me, too, she lets us know in a whisper. Only he says I am not fit to even wash dishes, let alone ever have a house of my own. When I dropped one of his plates a little while ago, he says I am looking in a mirror instead of where I am going, and he hopes I see what an ugly pan I have, because I ought to know it and keep it out of people's way so they won't have to look at me. Her tears splash right down on the grass. And that's not all, the yelling inside goes on. Not only do you kill off all my workers, but at this rate I'm losing money paying you four packs of cigarettes a day. If I have to blast off and start from scratch in some other part of this blamed universe, you stupid gutless. Why, you aren't even men. You worms don't even run when you see a car coming at you. Too blamed dumb to come in out of the rain. I stick my head around the corner and look in, and there is the back of a big guy in a mercury-made suit with a bald head that is red all the way round to the back of his neck. 
On the other side of the room, I see a couple of the sorriest-looking Annas that God ever makes, shuffling their feet and looking like kicked dogs. I turn to Pierre. Go in there swinging, I says, like a fight, and pull the windows open. He won't like me, Pierre says, hanging back. He says Annas are dumb cowards. Maybe he knows. Maybe I won't dare hit him. You get in there and poke him, boy, I says, and give him a push. I like you and I see you fight, and the Anista got more guts than anybody. The big guy hears us and turns around. Get out of here, you mangy natives, he bellows. You good-for-nothing, shivering, sniveling, cowardly boobs. I'm not ready for you yet. He is shaking a whippy-looking cane at me and Pierre, and I think he has turned purple. We're ready for you, though, I yell back. I climb into the room, pulling Pierre in after me. Pierre's no sniveling coward, and you can quit talking to this brave, heroic, self-sacrificing father like that. Put him up and defend yourself, you howling ape, I yell, because Pierre is going to give you the beating of your howling life. I see Pierre's old man and the other fellow spruce up some. The big guy sits down in a chair real quick, and, sucking in a big breath, he starts going all fatherly at Pierre, telling him that he doesn't want to have to hit him back, because Pierre will not feel it when he kills him which he doesn't want to have to do because Pierre is just a poor weak Aniston who don't know from nothing, and he doesn't want to injure any of his workers, and he is just telling Pierre's old man a few things to protect the Anista. Pierre looks at me, kind of doubtful. Go on, hit the fat bully, I says real icy. He has it coming. You owe it to your old man and Nor and Janelle here. Go ahead and show him what kind of champions the Anista can turn out. It's just for his own good, I says, so hit him now. Then you can tell your dad what a great guy you are. Pierre's left obediently swings into the lug's jaw with a crack like a rifle. He don't even watch the big guy sag down on the floor. He begins hugging his father and the other fellow and grinning and jabbering away like blue blazes. The big guy is still breathing, but out cold, so I go to look for a televis. I figure the authorities better hear my story before the big guy wakes up. After I make my spiel, the port chief says to come in and bring Pierre and his father and Frith and Janelle and Nor too, if we can find him, and make an official recorded report. He is sending a doctor out by copter. We beat it for the port, leaving the fat boss sleeping on the floor. We all stay in protective custody at the hotel, swimming in flaff and lounging around the Thiska bar for a couple of weeks, until the commission headed by that scientist from the Smithsonian Institute comes out and takes the boss back to Earth. He has to see a judge about why he should not go into stir for a while for psychological coercion or something like that. Before they leave, the commission hands me an official charge at 100 thou a year to stay as a protector of morale to the Anista. That is better than the fight racket, but the protectorship is a laugh. I can't even go out for a walk without a couple dozen Anista tagging along to keep me from stubbing my toe on some unfriendly pebble or socking my eye on some unloving devil of a doorknob. End of The Protector by Betsy Curtis Quinque Pedalion by Piers Anthony. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Quinque Pedalion by Piers Anthony. It lay there, an indentation in the soil, two inches deep and nine feet in diameter. It was flat, it was smooth and the sand and the dirt were twined with rotted leaves and stems in a marbled pattern. The edge, cut sharp and clean, exposed a miniature stratum leading up to the unpressed forest floor, and spoke of the weight that had stood on that spot, molding the earth into the shape of its fundament. It was the mark of a foot, or a hoof, or whatever it is that touched the ground when an animal ambulates, one print. Charles Tennerman shook his head somberly. A single print could have been a freak of nature. This was one of many, a definite trail. They were spaced twenty or thirty feet apart, huge and level. Ridges of spadacious earth narrowed toward the center of each, rounded and smooth as though squirted liquidly up between half-yard toes. Some were broken, toppled worms lying askew, scuffed when the hoof moved on. Around the spore rose the forest, in gargantuan splendor each trunk ascending gauntly into a mass of foliage so high and solid that the ground was cast into an almost nocturnal shadow. At dusk the three men halted. "'We could set up an arc,' Tennerman said, reaching behind to pat his harness. Don Abel grunted negatively. Uh, "'Use a light and everything on the planet will know where we are. We don't want the thing that made that,' he gestured toward the trail, "'to start hunting us. 
The third man spoke impatiently. It rains at night, remember. If we don't get close pretty soon, the water will wash out the prints. Tennerman looked up. Too late, he said. There was no thunder, but abruptly it was raining, solidly as it must to support a forest of this type. They could hear the steady deluge flaying the dense leaves far above. Not a drop reached the ground. The trees won't hold it back forever, Abel remarked. We'd better break out the pup tent in a hurry. Hi, Fritz Slaker's voice sang out ahead. There's a banging or something up here. Shelter! Columns of water hissed into the ground as the great leaves far above overflowed at last. The men galloped for cover, packs thumping as they dodged the sudden waterfalls. They stripped their packs and broke out rations silently. The dry leaves and spongy loam made a comfortable seat, and after a day of hiking, the relaxation was bliss. Tennerman leaned back against the base of the nearest trunk, chewing and gazing up into a bowl of the tree. It was dark, but he could make out a giant spherical opacity from which multiple stems projected downward, bending and swelling for a hundred feet until they touched the ground as trunks twelve feet in diameter. Don Abel's voice came out of the shadow. The monster passed right under here. I'm sitting on the edge of a print. What if it comes back? Slaker laughed, but not loudly. Maybe we're in its nest. We'd hear it. <laughs> a critter like that. Just the shake of the ground would knock us all a foot into the air. There was a sustained rustle. What are you doing? Abel asked querulously. Making a bed, Slacker snapped. Do you think it's safe? Abel asked, though his tone indicated that he suspected one place was as unsafe as another. After a moment, the rustle signified that he, too, was making a bed. Tennerman smiled in the dark, amused. He really did not know the other men well. The three had organized an AWOL party on the spur of the moment, knowing that the survey ship would be planet-bound for several days. The bark of the tree was thick and rubbery, and Tennerman found it oddly comfortable. He put his ear against it, hearing a faint melodic humming that seemed to emanate from the interior. It was as though he was auditing the actual life processes of the alien vegetation, although on this world he was the alien, and this fascinated him. The other two were soon asleep, sitting there in silence, the absolute blackness of a strange world's umbra pressing against his eyeballs. Tennerman realized that this outing, dangerous as it was, offered him a satisfaction he had seldom known. Slaker and Abel had accepted him for what he was not, one of the fellows. Those footprints, obviously animal, yet so large. Would a pressure of a hundred pounds per square inch depress the earth that much? How much would the total creature weigh? Tennerman found his pack in the dark and rummaged for his miniature slide rule. The tiny numbers fluoresced as he set up his problem. 144 times the square of 4.5 times pi divided by 20. It came to about 460 tons per print. And how many feet did it have? And how much weight did each carry when it rest? He had heard that creatures substantially larger than the dinosaurs of ancient Earth could not exist on land. On an Earth-type planet, which this one was with regard to gravity, atmosphere, and climate, the limits were not so much biological as physical. A diminutive insect required many legs, not to support its weight, but to preserve balance. Brontosaurus, with legs many times as sturdy as those of an insect, even in proportion to its size, had to seek the swamp to ease the overbearing weight. A larger animal, in order to walk at all, would have to have disproportionately larger legs and feet, mass cubed with increasing size while the cross-section of the legs squared. To maintain a feasible ratio, most of the mass above a certain point would have to go to the feet. 460 tons? The weight on each foot exceeded that of a family of whales. Bones should shatter and flesh tear free with every step. The rain had ceased and the forest was quiet now. Tennerman scraped up a belated bed of his own and lay down, but his mind refused to be pacified. Bright and clear and ominous, the thoughts paraded, posing questions for which he had no answer. What thing had they blundered across? Jumping animal. Tennerman sat up, too excited to sleep. Like an overgrown snowshoe rabbit, he thought, bounding high, hundreds of feet to nip the lofty greenery, then landing with terrific impact. It could be quite small, less than a ton, perhaps, with one grossly splayed balancing foot. At night, it might sail into a selected roost, or onto... He turned his eyes up to the impenetrable canopy above. In the flattened upper reaches of the banyan, a nest? Tennerman stood, moving silently away from the bodies of his companions. Locating his pack a second time, he dug out cleats and hand spikes, fitting them to his body by feel. 
He found his trunk shaping its firm curvature with both hands. Then he began to ascent. He climbed, digging the spikes into the heavy bark and gaining altitude in the blackness. The surface gradually became softer, more even, but remained firm. If it were to pull away from the inner wood, the fall would kill him. He felt the curvature increase and knew that the diameter of the trunk was shrinking. But still, there was no light at all. His muscles tensed as his body seemed to become heavier, more precariously exposed. Something was pulling him away from the trunk, weakening his purchase, but he could not yet circle any major portion of the column with his arms. Something was wrong. He would have to descend before being torn loose. Relief washed over him as he realized the nature of the problem. He was near the top. The stem was bending in to join the main body of the tree, and he was on the underside. He worked his way to the outside, and the strain eased. Now gravity was pulling him into the trunk, helping him instead of leaving him hanging. Quickly he completed the ascent and stood at last against the massive nexus where limb melded into bowl. Here there was light, a dim glow from overhead. He mounted the vast gnarled bulk, a globular shape thirty feet in diameter covered with swellings and scars. It was difficult to picture it as it was, a hundred feet above the ground, for nothing at all could be seen beyond its damp mound. Although it was part of a living, or once living, thing, there was no evidence of foliage. There was no nest. The center of the crude sphere rose onto another trunk or stalk, a column about ten feet in diameter, pointing straight up as far as he could see. He was not at the top at all. The bark here was smooth and not very thick. It would be difficult to scale, even with the cleats. Tennerman rested for about ten minutes, lying down and putting his ear to the wood. Again the melody of the interior came to him gentle yet deep. It brought a vision of many layers, pulsing and interweaving, of tumescence and flow, rich sap in the fibers. There was life of a sort going on within, either of the tree or in it. He stood and mounted the central stalk. Quickly he climbed, spikes penetrating at fingers, knees and toes, bearing him ant-like up the sheer column without hesitation. The light above became brighter, though it was only the lesser gloom of a starless night on a moonless planet. Ahead, the straight trunk went on and on, narrowing but never branching. Huge limbs from neighboring trees crossed nearby, bare and eerie, residual moisture shining dully, but his climb ignored them. Fifty feet, seventy-five, and now he was as high above the bowl as it was above the ground. The stem to which he clung had diminished to a bare five-foot diameter, but rose on toward the green upper forest. Tinnerman's muscles bunched once more with strain. A wind came up or perhaps he had come up to it. At this height, even the slightest tug and sway was alarming. He reached his arms around the shaft and hung on. Below the spokes of another tree were a forest of their own, a fairyland of brush and blackness, crossing and recrossing, concealing everything except the slender reed he held. Above, the first leaves appeared, flat and heavy in the night. He climbed. Suddenly, it ended. The trunk, barely three feet through, expanded into a second bowl shaped like an upside-down pear with a five-foot thickness, and stopped. Tennerman clambered onto the top and stood there, letting his weary arms relax, balancing against the sway. There was nothing else, just a vegetable knob two hundred feet above the ground. All around, the dark verdure rustled in the breeze, and the gloom below was a quiet sea. No branches approached within twenty feet of the knob, though the leaves closed in above, diffusing the glow of the sky. Tinnerman studied the hollow around him, wondering what kept the growth away. Was this a takeoff point for the hidden quarry? Then it came to him, unnerving him completely. Fear hammered inside him like a bottled demon. He dared not let it out. Shaking, he began the descent. Morning came, dim and unwilling, but it was not the wan light filtering down like sediment that woke the explorers, nor was it the warmth of day soaking into the tops and running down the trunks in the fashion of the night water. They woke to sound, a distant din, as of a large animal tearing branches and crunching leaves. It was the first purposeful noise they had heard since entering the forest. As such, it was unnatural, and brought all three to their feet in alarm. The evening deluge had eradicated all trace of the prints leading up to the giant structure under which they had taken shelter. Beneath it the spore remained, as deep and fresh as before. One print near the edge was half gone. Slaker sized up the situation immediately. Guarantees the trail was fresh, he said. We don't know whether it was coming or going, but it was made between rains. Let's get over and spot that noise. He suited action to word and set off, 
pack dangling from one hand, half-eaten space ration in the other. Abel was not so confident. Fresh, yes, but we still don't know where the thing went. You don't look as though you got much sleep, Tenny. Tennerman didn't answer. They picked up their packs and followed Slaker, who was already almost out of sight. They came up to him as he stood at the edge of an open space in the forest. Several mighty trees had fallen, and around their massive corpses myriad little shoots were reaching up. The sunlight streamed down here, intolerably bright after the obscurity underneath. The noise had stopped. There was a motion in the bush ahead. A large body was moving through the thicket, just out of sight coming toward them. A serpentine neck poked out of the copse, bearing a cactus-like head a foot in diameter. The head swung toward them, circularly macaradont. A ring of six-inch eye stalks extended. The men froze, watching the creature. The head moved away, apparently losing its orientation in the silence. The neck was smooth and flexible, about ten feet in length. The body remained out of sight. Look at those teeth, Slacker whispered fiercely. That's our monster. Immediately the head reacted, demonstrating acute hearing. It came forward rapidly, twenty feet above the ground, and in a moment the rest of the creature came into sight. The body was a globular mass about four feet across, mounted on a number of spindly legs. The creature walked with a peculiar caterpillar ripple, one ten-foot leg swinging around the body in a clockwise direction while the others were stationary, reminding Tennerman of the problems of a wounded daddy long legs. The body spun, rotating with the legs, but the feet managed to make a kind of processional progress. The spin did not appear to interfere with balance or orientation. The ring of eye stalks kept all horizons covered. Slaker whipped out his sidearm. No! Tennerman cried too late. Slaker's shot smacked into the central body, making a small but visible puncture. The creature halted as if nonplussed, legs rising and falling rhythmically in place. It did not fall. Slaker's second bullet tore into it and his third before Tennerman rested away the gun. It wasn't attacking, he said not knowing how to explain what he knew. They watched while the monster's motion gradually slowed, huge drops of ichor welling from its wounds. It shuddered, then the legs began pounding the ground in short violent steps, several at a time. Coordination was gone. Slowly the body overbalanced and toppled. The great mouth opened like a flower, like a horn, and emitted an ear-shattering blast of sound, a tormented cry of pain and confusion. Then the body fell heavily on its side. For a moment the three men stood in silence, watching the death throes. The creature's legs writhed as though independently alive, and the head twisted savagely on the ground, knocking off the oddly brittled eye stalks. Tennerman's heart sank, for the killing had been pointless, if he had told the others his nighttime revelation. From the forest came a blast of incredible volume. Tennerman clapped both hands over his ears as the siren stridents deafened them with a power of twelve to fifteen bells. It ended, leaving a wake of silence. It had been a call, similar to that of the creature just shot, but deeper and much louder. There was a large monster in the forest answering the call for help. "'It's mate?' Abel wondered out loud, his voice sounding thin. "'It's mother,' Tennerman said succinctly. "'And I think we'd better hide.' Slaker shrugged. "'Bullets won't stop it,' he said. Tennerman and Abel forged into the brush without comment. Slaker stood his ground confidently, aiming his weapon in the general direction of the approaching footfalls. Once more the foghorn voice sounded, impossibly loud, forcing all three to cover their ears before drums shattered and brains turned to jelly. Slaker could be seen ahead, one arm wrapped around his head to protect both ears, the other waving the gun. The ground shook, high foliage burst open and large trees swayed aside, their branches crashing to the ground. A shape vast beyond imagination thundered into the clearing. For a moment it paused, a four-legged monster a hundred feet high. Its low head was twelve feet thick, with a flat, shiny snout. A broad eye opened, several feet across, casting about myopically. A ring of fibers sprouted, each pencil thick, flexing slightly as the head moved. Slaker fired. The head shot forward, thudding into the ground thirty feet in front of him. The body moved, rotating grandly as another member lifted and swung forward. They were not heads, but feet. Five feet with eyes. The monster was a hugely sophisticated adult of the Quinquipedalian species Slaker had killed. The man finally saw the futility of his stand and ran. The towering giant followed, feet jarring the ground with rhythmic impacts, hoofs leaving nine-foot indents. 
It spun majestically, a dance of terrible gravity, pounding the brush and trees and dirt beneath it into nothingness. As each foot lifted, the heavy skin rolled back, uncovering the eye, and the sensory fibrils shot out. As each foot fell, the hide wrinkled closed, protecting the organs from the shock of impact. The creature was slow, but its feet were fast. The fifth fall came down on the running figure, and Slaker was gone. The Quinqua Pedalian hesitated, one foot raised, searching. It was aware of them. It would not allow the killers of its child to escape. The eye roved, socketless, its glassy stare directed by a slow twisting of the foot. The circle of filaments combed the air, feeling for sound or smell or whatever trace of the fugitives they were adapted to detect. After a few minutes, the eye closed and the fibrils withdrew. The foot went high, plummeted. The earth rocked with the force of the blow. It lifted again to smash down a few feet over, leaving a tangent print. After a dozen such stomps, the creature reversed course and came back, making a second row ahead of the first. This, Tenemon realized, was carpet bombing, and the two men were directly in the swath. If they ran, the five-footed nemesis would cut them down easily. If they stayed, it would get them anyway, unless one or both of them happened to be fortunate enough to fit into the diamond between four prints. The odds were negative, and quite possibly it would sense a near miss and rectify the error with a small extra tap. They waited motionless while it laid down another barrage and another. Now it was within fifty feet, mechanically covering the area. Behind it, a flat highway was developing. Saturation stomping, Tennerman thought, and found the concept insanely funny. Man discovers a unique five-footed monster, the Quink, and it steps on him. Would the history books record the irony? He saw the answer. He gave a cry and lurched to his feet, flinging his pack aside and plunging directly at the monster. The foot halted quite fast on the uptake and rotated its eye to cover him, it gathered itself, crashed down an irresistible juggernaut. The earth jumped with its fury, but Tennerman, running in an unexpected direction, had passed its arc. He halted directly under the main body of the Quinquipedalian. If his guess were correct, it would be unable to reach him there. It would have to move, and he would move with it. Far above, the main body hovered, a black boulder suspended on toothpicks. Above that, he knew, the neck and head extended on into the sky a head shaped like a pear, when its mouth was closed. The first foot turned inward, its eye bearing on him. It hung there, several feet above the ground, studying him with disquieting intelligence. It did not try to pin him. Balance, Tinnerman judged, was, after all, of paramount importance to a creature two hundred feet tall. If it lost its footing, the fall of its body would destroy it. So long as it kept three or four feet correctly positioned and firmly planted, it could not fall but if it were to pull its members into too small a circle, it could get into serious trouble. Several hundred tons are not lightly tossed about. The Quinquipedalian moved. The feet swung clockwise, one at a time, striking the ground with an elephantine touch. The bars of Tenerman's cage lifted and fell, crushing the terrain with an almost musical beat. The body turned, gaining momentum. The feet on one side seemed to retreat. On the other, they advanced, forcing him to walk rapidly to keep himself centered. The pace increased. Now the feet landed just seconds apart, spinning the vast body forward. Tinnerman had to break into a run. Small trees impeded his progress. Every time he dodged around an obstruction, the hind feet gained. On an open plain, he might have been able to outrun the monster. But now it had maneuvered him onto rough ground. If it didn't tire soon, it would have him. In time, it could force him over a cliff that its own legs could straddle, or into a bog. Or it might forget him and go after Abel and he would have to stay under it, not daring to place himself outside its circle. His respect for it mounted. He was in the eye of a hurricane, and would soon have to find some other place of safety. Tennerman studied the pattern of motion. At this velocity, the individual feet did not have time for more than peremptory adjustments. The maintenance of forward motion dictated an involved but predictable pattern. One foot had to vacate the spot for the next. He was not sure whether two feet ever left the ground at the same time, but could see sharp limitations, if he were to cross a print just vacated. He timed his approach and took off to the side, almost touching the ascending foot. It twisted in flight, its eye spotting him quickly, but it was unable to act immediately. It struck the ground far ahead, casting up debris with the force of its braking action, and the following member lifted in pursuit. Tennerman ran straight out at breakneck speed. He had underestimated Quink's versatility. The second foot went after him much more alertly than an ordinary nervous system should have permitted. 
In a creature of this side, many seconds should have elapsed before the brain assimilated the new information and decided upon a course of action. Yet the feet seemed to react promptly with individual intelligence. This thing was far too large and far flung for the operation of any effective nervous system, yet it operated most effectively. The shadow of a leg passed over him, and Tinnerman thought for a detached moment that he had been caught. But the impact was twenty feet to his rear. The next one would get him, unless... He cut sharply toward a medium-large tree at the edge of the clearing. He dared not look, but he was sure the creature behind was milling in temporary confusion. It could not dodge as fast as he... he hoped. He reached the tree and ducked behind its fifteen-foot diameter, feeling safe for the moment. Quink brought up before the tree, one foot quested around the side, searching for him. He could see its enormously thick hoof completely flat on the underside, polished steel with a reddish tinge in the center. Probably natural coloration, but he thought of Slaker and shuddered. The wooden skin drew back, uncovering the eye. The ankle above the hoof widened, the skin bunching in a great roll. He knew now that it settled when the foot rested, coming down to make contact with the ground. He had rested against that swelling last night. He had climbed that leg. As though satisfied that it could not reach him so long as he hid behind the tree, the quinquapedalian paused for an odd shuffle. Tinnerman peeked around the trunk and saw the legs bunched together in a fashion that destroyed some previous theories, then spread out in a trapezoidal formation. One foot hung near the tree, supporting no weight, and seemingly overbalancing the body somewhat. Then the near foot hefted itself high, swinging like a pendulum, and threw itself against the tree with resounding force. The entire trunk reverberated with the blow, and a shower of twigs and leaves fluttered down from the upper reaches. The foot struck again, higher. Again the tree quaked and loosed a larger fall of detritus. Tennerman kept a cautious eye on it. He could be laid low by a comparatively small branch. The single foot continued its attack, striking the tree regularly about fifty feet above the ground. At that height the foot was about the same diameter as the tree, and the weight behind it was formidable. Yet such action seemed pointless, because damage to the tree would not affect the man behind it. Or was he underestimating Quink again? The pounding ceased, and he poked his head cautiously around once more. Was the thing retreating? Somehow he did not expect it to give up easily. It had demonstrated too much savvy and determination for that. It was a remarkable animal, not only for its size. Three legs stood in a tripod, while two came up simultaneously. Tennerman's brow wrinkled. It did not seem possible for it to maintain its balance that way. But it was acting with assurance. It had something in mind. The two feet rose together, one held just above the other. In awe, Tinnerman watched the lofty body topple forward, unable to stand upright in such a position. Suddenly, the two feet thrust forward with staggering power. The entire body rocked backward as they smashed into the tree, and this time the timber felt it. A gunshot explosion rent the air as the fibers of the trunk split and severed, wood splaying, and the large roots broke the ground like sea monsters as the entire tree hinged on its roots. Now Tennerman could see how the clearing had been formed. The parent opened a hole in the forest so that the baby could feed on the little saplings. As the vegetation grew, so did the child, until tall enough to reach the foliage of full-sized trees. A few more blows would fell this one. Tennerman waited for the next impact, then fled, hidden from view, he hoped, by the tilting trunk. The creature continued its attack, unaware that the real quarry had gone. Tennerman picked up the trail, human prints this time, Abel should have escaped during the distraction and would be heading for the ship. The mighty forest was quiet now, except for a slight rustle ahead. That would be Abel. Tennerman moved without noise instinctively, disinclined to interrupt the medication of the great tree's eternal beauty. And he knew that he was a fool for the forest hardly cared, and the quinquipedalian, with all its decibels, would not worry about the distant patter of human feet. Don, he called, not loudly. Abel turned at once, a smile on his face. Tenny, I'm glad you got away. He, too, was careful of his volume. Probably the monster could not hear, but it was pointless to ask for trouble. You seemed to know what you were doing, but I was afraid you had not made it. I would have waited for you if... I know, Don. Abel was no coward. If there had been any way to help, he would have done so. When dealing with the quinquipedalian, loitering was futile and dangerous. The person involved either got away or he did not. The most practical recourse was to trek immediately for the ship, so that at least one person would live to tell the story. Ship takes off in twelve hours, 
Abel said, shaking his pack into greater comfort. If we move right along, we can make it in six hours. Can't be more than twenty miles. Going to make a full report, Don? Tennerman was uneasy without being certain why. Fritz was killed, Abel said simply. Tennerman put out a hand and brought him to a stop. We can't do it, Don. Abel studied him with concern. I'll give you a hand if you got clipped. I thought you were okay. I'm all right, Don. We killed that thing's baby. It did what any parent would do. If we report it, the captain will lift ship and fry it with the main jet. Code of space, Tenny. Anything that attacks a man, it didn't attack. It came to the defense of its child. We don't have the right to sentence it. Abel's eyes grew cold. Fritz was my friend. I thought he was yours, too. If I could have killed that monster myself, I'd have done it. You coming along? Sorry, Don. I have no quarrel with you, but I can't let you report Quaint to the captain. Abel sized him up, then took off his pack. He didn't ask questions. If that's the way it has to be, he said evenly. Don Abel was a slow man, cautious in his language and conservative in action. But he had never been mistaken for a weakling. His fists were like lightning. Tennerman was knocked back by two blows to the chin and a roundhouse on the ear. He held back, parrying with his forearm. Abel landed a solid punch to the midriff, bringing down his guard, and followed that with a bruising smack directly on the mouth. Tennerman fainted with his left, but got knocked off his feet with a body check before getting a chance to connect with his right. He rolled over, grasping for the feet, and got lifted by a blinding knee to the chin. His head reeled with a red haze, and still the blows fell, pounding his head and neck, while Abel's foot stunned the large muscle of the thigh, aiming for the groin. Tennerman's reticence fell aside, and he began to fight. He bowled upward, ignoring the punishment, and flung his arms around the other man's waist. Abel retaliated with a double-handed judo chop to the back of the neck, but he held on, linking his forearms in a bear hug, pulling forward. Abel took a fistful of hair, jerking Tennerman's head from side to side, but slowly the hug lifted him off his feet. Abel was free suddenly, using a body motion Tennerman hadn't met before, and once again fists flew. It took about fifteen minutes. Abel finally lay panting on the ground, exhausted but conscious, while Tennerman rummaged in the pack for first aid. Uh, I knew you could take me, Abel said. It had to be faster that damn endurance of yours would figure in. You ever been tired in your life, Tenny? Tennerman handed him the sponge to clean up the blood. Last night, I climbed the quink, he said. I stood on its head, and it never made a motion. Quink? Oh, you mean the monster. Abel sat up suddenly. Are you trying to tell me? A look of awe came over his face. That thing with the legs, the big one. You mean we slept under? He paused for more reflection. Those tracks. It does figure. If it hadn't been so dark, we would have seen that the monster was still standing in them. That's why there were leaves under there, and a couple of prints from the front feet. It must have been asleep. His mind came belatedly to grips with the second problem. You climbed it? Tennerman nodded soberly. It couldn't have slept through that. I used the spikes. I didn't catch on until I saw the way the leaves had been eaten around the head. All it had to do was open its mouth. But it let me go. Live and let live. Abel came to his feet. <sighs> okay, Charlie. We'll wait six hours before heading for the ship. That'll give us time to look this thing over. Don't get me wrong, I haven't made up my mind. I may still tell the captain, but not right away. Tenderman relaxed. Let's see what we can learn, he said. He reassembled Abel's pack and glanced up. The foot was there, poised with Damoclesian ponderosity fifteen feet above their heads. The eye was open, fibrils extended. The quinquapedalian had come upon them silently. Split! Tenderman yelled. The two men dived in opposite directions. Once more, the ground bounced with concussion as he raced for the nearest tree. He slid around it, safe for the moment. A glance back showed the monster hauling its foot back into the air. Only half of Don Abel had made it to safety. Then the huge hoof hovered and dropped, and the grisly sight was gone. There was only another flat print in the earth. Abel might have been fast enough if he hadn't been weakened by the fight. Just as Slaker would have been more careful had he been warned. The Quinquapedalian was the agent, but Tennerman knew that he was the cause of the two deaths. Now Quink approached the tree, spinning in her stately dance, 
hoofs kissing the shadowed ground without a sound. She stood. Why hadn't she crushed them both as they fought, oblivious to the danger above? She must have been there for several minutes, watching, listening. One gentle stomp and the vengeance would have been complete. Why'd she waited? Fair play? Was this thing really intelligent? Did it have ethics of its own? Her own. The familiar foot came around the trunk, perceptors out. He stood calmly, knowing that he was safe from immediate harm. He stooped to pick up a handful of dirt, tossing it at the light-sensitive area. The eye folded shut immediately, letting the earth rattle over the bare hide. Fast reflexes. Too fast. An animal of this size had to be handicapped by the distance between brain and appendages. It was manifestly impossible to have an instantaneous reflex at the end of a limb 100 feet long. No neural track could provide anything like the speed he had witnessed. Tennerman moved to the other side of the trunk, as though getting ready for a dash to another tree. The foot swung around at once, intercepting him from the other direction. There was no doubt that it learned from experience and could act on it immediately. But how could that impulse travel from eye to brain and back again so quickly? Usually an animal's eye was situated quite close to the brain to cut down neural delay. Unless Coink had a brain in her foot. The answer struck him stunningly. There was a brain in the foot. There had to be. How else could the pedal members be placed so accurately, while maintaining perfect balance? There would be a coordinating ganglia in the central body issuing general orders concerning overall motion and order of precedence for the lifting of the feet. There could be another small brain in the head to handle ingestion and vocalization. And each foot would make its own decisions as to exact placement and manner of descent. Seven brains in all, organized into a mighty whole. The foot brains could sleep when not on duty, firmly planted in the ground and covered by a thick overlap of impervious skin. They were probably not too bright as individuals. Their job was specialized, but with the far more powerful central brain to back them up, any part of Quink was intelligent. Creature of the forest, Tennerman said to it in wonder. Quinquipedalian, septa cerebrian, you are probably smarter than I. And certainly stronger. He thought about that, discovering a weird pleasure in the contemplation of it. All his life he had remained aloof from his fellows, searching for something he could honestly look up to. Now he had found it. Eleven hours later, on schedule, the ship took off. It would be three, four, five years before a squat colony ship came to set up frontier operations. Quink was stalking him with ageless determination and rapidly increasing sagacity. Already she had learned to anticipate the geometric patterns he traced— he had led her through a simple square, triangle, and star, giving up each figure when she solved it and set her body to intercept him ahead. Soon she would come to the conclusion that the prey was something more than a vicious rodent. Once she realized that she was dealing with intelligence, communication could begin. Perhaps in time she would forgive him for the death of her child and know that vengeance had been doubly extracted already. The time might come when he could walk in the open once more and not be afraid of a foot. At night, while she slept, he was safe, but by day... Perhaps when the colonists came, they would be greeted by a man riding the mightiest steed of all time, or by the quinquipedalian, carrying its pet. It did not matter who was ascendant, so long as the liaison was established. Creature of the forest, he said again, doubling back as he perceived her bulk and weight at an intersection of the triquetra pattern. For a moment he stood and looked at her, so vast and beautiful, spinning in the dance of his destruction. Creature of the forest, he said. Thou art mighty. Thou art mightier than I. There was an answering blast, bells in magnitude, like a goddess awakening beyond the horizon. End of Quinquipedalian by Piers Anthony The Awakening by Jack Sharkey this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by SC1701. The Awakening by Jack Sharkey. Rick's first impressions were an uncomfortable chill creeping along his bare flesh and a bright, milky swirling of light that encompassed his entire vision. He shivered and blinked his eyes a few times, and then the swirling settled down and became the vault. The chill, he realized, 
was due to the body warmth being methodically sucked away by the cold slab on which he lay. Another shiver brought a gasp of breath into his lungs, and then he was wide awake. When he sat up and swung his legs over the side, the interior of the vault began swirling again. He had to grip the edge of the slab to keep from falling. The air was humid, much too humid, and he could taste the prickly presence of carbon dioxide when he breathed. The pump, he mumbled, dropping to the floor on feet that he could barely control. Something's happened to the pump. He pushed himself determinedly erect, then stubbled down the long corridor between the other slabs, hardly glancing at their silent tenants, until he got to Zena's. She lay still as death, not flicking so much as an eyelid, and her flesh was like frozen wax beneath his exploring fingers. There was nothing he could do for her until he got the pump working again. Rick pushed away from the slab on which Zena lay, and went through the archway into the next chamber. Here another fifty of the group lay on their slabs, not so much as a muscle twitch betraying the fact that they were all quite alive. It seemed only a few hours since he had lain down on his slab in the other room and gotten his injection, but he could not, for a dizzy moment, recall in which direction the pump lay. His mind seemed to be plumbing dust-covered depths to dredge out his memories one by one. He suddenly remembered the war. The war that had driven the group to build this place— to try and safeguard a handful from the Holocaust that would set fire to the surface of the world and turn the seas to steam. Was it possible the war had passed? Or had it ever come? There was no way to know without going outside. Wait, there was. Rick thought hard, trying to get his sense of direction back. The atom-powered clock that marked off months instead of minutes was in the central vault where the elders slept. The other nine volts ringed that one, he recalled, veering at right angles to his first direction— which would have taken him on a circular tour of the nine vaults and back to his starting place again. The archway to the vault of the elders was unaccountably blocked, and Rick realized suddenly that part of the ceiling there had fallen, carried by some fault in the granite of the mountain itself. But that was impossible. The elders had selected this site on the basis of the rigidity of the rock strata that made it up. A fault could not have occurred for more years than Rick's own lifetime. Or had that many years passed already? There was no way of knowing— not until he had examined the clock. Rick moved away from the blockade and made his way into the next vault, and the next, finally finding an archway in the sixth vault from his own where the rock had not completely sealed the way into the Elder's vault. Here he had expected to find the air fresher, already having theorized that the staleness elsewhere was due to the poor circulation occasioned by the blockaded central vault. But in fact, the air there was even worse, and laden with an odor that made Rick suddenly afraid to see its source. Still, he was the first to awake. It was up to him to try and save himself and the others. Rick made an effort of will, and then squeezed through the narrow orifice into the main chamber. He looked once toward the slabs holding the bodies of the elders, then quickly away. It was true. All were in advanced stages of corruption already. Choking, Rick went to the center of the high room and looked into the horizontal face of the clock. The broad indicator arm was at its utmost numeral, and was pocked with rust. They'd lain here beyond the time of awakening by at least four times the years they'd planned. It can't be right, Rick gasped, his brain reeling for want of clean, cool air. The mechanism has failed somehow. Afraid to think about it, he tilted the clock up on its base until the pedestal which supported it lay on its side upon the floor. The square block of metal that based the pedestal was now up-tilted beyond the vertical, exposing a gaping trap in the floor. Rick did not like the tarnished look of the metal underside of the pedestal base, forged of an alloy supposed to be incorruptible. A sick thought took hold of his insides then, as he placed one foot upon the rocky staircase under the floor. The clock indicator had halted at its utmost numeral. But what if they'd lain here even longer than that? There would be no way of knowing. No way at all. He descended the staircase swiftly then, glad at least that the air was better down in the pump chamber. It would be, of course, he reminded himself. If the pump went off, even, this air would never be circulated, never have had its chance to become corrupt with our exhalations. And then his musing was halted in mid-thought as he came upon the pump, or upon what had been the pump. Where rigid cylinders of gleaming metal had been, a few jagged teeth of brown corruption lay in a circle. The pistons were no better, though their thickness had preserved more of their original shape despite the inroads of age, so they could be recognized for what they were, 
had been. The central shaft was a long mound of flaking dust on the floor between the path of the pistons and the wall-sized mass of the filters, woven of metal and powerful synthetic fibers, crumbled beneath the pressure of his finger. He sought and found the ponderous casing in which the engine-empowered radioactive element had lain, and its thick walls tore away like wood pulp in his hands. He sought and found the ponderous casing in which the engine-empowering radioactive element had lain, and its thick walls tore away like wood pulp in his hands. The element, when he found it, was already become cold gray lead, and it had had a half-life of centuries. Rick crumpled slowly to the floor, shutting his eyes, trying not to think of the eons which must have passed while they all lay sleeping the pseudo-death in the vaults. What might the world have become in the interim? A current of cool air suddenly touched his face, His head came up instantly, his eyes seeking the source. A feathery motion of torn edges in the filter showed him that it came through the gap he had torn there. Rick sprang to his feet then, leaped at the filter, and tore out chunks by the armful, letting the pulverized material float in spinning clouds of dust motes behind him. The air grew stronger, came faster, as he ripped away the corruption, and then he could see the tunnel beyond. Gasping at the effort, how long since he had eaten— He staggered back from the opening then, back up the stairs into the chamber of the elders. Now that his nostrils had been stimulated by the clean air, the smell of corruption was violently repelling. But he held his breath and ran to the gap in the tumbled rock about the archway and squeezed his way into the area of subsidiary vaults. Without the pump in operation, the air could not circulate to this point, but he hoped to drag some of his companions down to the torn filter and revive them, then, with their help, bring the others. It would be all right. They would be saved as planned. He regretted the loss of the elders. But no matter. They were but the rulers. He and the others were the chemists, the scientists, the engineers. New eldership could be created when they had become settled again, and could rebuild their civilization. He went to Zena's slab first. She would not be as much help as some of the others, but Zena and he were too close for him to delay her revival any longer. Life was not worth having without Zena. He carried her out of the vault, through the gap and thick miasma of corruption, then down into the pump chamber. Leaving her lying on her back with the breeze ruffling her hair about her face, Rick went back up for the next person. Three exhausting trips later, he sat among the bodies of his friends, listening with joy to their returning quiver of breath and life. Zena was the first to open her eyes. She seemed startled to find she was no longer on the slab, and then joyous when her glance fell upon his eager face. We've done it, she sighed. We came through. She tried to sit up, then lay down heavily. Rick, I'm so weak. We need food, all of us, he said. I'm weak myself. He arose from his crouch at her side and stared down the tunnel to the outer world. I don't know what it's like out there, he said. There may be no food at all. If the war was as devastating as predicted, it may be barren rock, burning sun, and overall death. How long... Zena began, and then her eyes fell upon the time-rotted hulk of the pump and she stopped, her face going pale. "'As long as that,' she whispered. "'Oh, Rick, do you think—' "'I'll know when I've looked,' he said. Their eyes met for a long, silent moment. Then he turned and strided up the tunnel. Three hundred strides brought him to the barrier, the thinly perforated shield of rock that had been left intact to hide the location of the vaults from their enemies. Rick put his shoulder to the shell— It cracked and fell away, as he thought it would, with weather and erosion having weakened it for centuries. Bright yellow moonlight lay all about the land outside. Incredibly fine sand was everywhere, but a smell of fresh water and green growing things was mingled with the night air. The region had not been desert when the vaults were constructed. The war had left its mark of devastation here, Rick saw, looking in vain for a trace of the magnificent towered city that had once been just beyond this spot. He shook off his dismay and set himself to the task for which he'd emerged. The animals had to be alive yet, or they were doomed. He'd always regretted the haste in their preparations that had precluded preparing survival vaults for the food animals. The best they'd been able to do, before the day of devastation, was herd the stupid beasts into caves and pile the entrances with loose rock, hoping the animals would dig themselves out only after the worst fury of the war had passed. Rick threw off the bitter memory abruptly as his ears detected a tiny buzz of sound. He dropped to the ground and lay still, 
watching to see what sort of beast would appear. It sounded larger than the animals he remembered. I must be near a water hole, he reasoned. There's a pathway here, made by many animals passing this way, he mused, studying the narrow, flattened track that he'd spotted in the night-chilled sand. Then he saw something coming slowly up the trail, a thing much larger than the animals he remembered. It was a long moment before he realized what it was, and smiled. Then he reached out his hands and had it. It buzzed loudly in his grip until he pounded it to silence on a rock. By the time he'd returned to the pump chamber, he'd managed to prise it open, but its contents, mangled by the smashing upon the rock, were barely fit to eat. "'It's better than I could have hoped,' he said to Zena, when they and the others had picked the thing clean. "'Life promises to be much more exciting, infinitely more sporting in this new age outside the vaults. With care, we can survive until our engineers rig up some whip-rays and herding claws again.' It will be fun, Zena agreed, smiling with grim anticipation. I enjoy a challenge in the hunt. Who'd have thought the animals would have come so far from the caves? It was hours later that the bus company grew worried about their missing vehicle and started an investigation. But they could find no trace of the bus anywhere, and it remained a mystery until the day everybody suddenly knew what had happened. But that was far too late. End of The Awakening by Jack Sharkey Recording by SC1701. The Truth About Goldfish by Henry Kuttner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Truth About Goldfish by Henry Kuttner. For some time I have been wondering what the world is coming to. More than once I have got up in the middle of the night, padded towards the bureau, and peering into the mirror, exclaimed, Stinky, what is the world coming to? The responses I have thus obtained I am not at liberty to reveal, but I am coming to believe that either I have a most mysterious mirror, or something is wrong somewhere. I am intrigued by my mirror. It came into my possession under extraordinary and eerie circumstances, being borne into my bedroom one midsummer's eve by a procession of cats, dressed oddly in bright-colored sunsuits and carrying parasols. I was asleep at the time, but awoke just as the last tail whisked out the door, and immediately I sprang out of bed and cut my left big toe rather badly on the edge of the mirror. I remember that as I first looked into the fathomless glassy depths, a curious thought came into my mind. What, I said to myself, is the world coming to? And what is science fiction coming to? It is quite evident that a logical and critical analysis of science fictional trends is a desideratum today. The whole trouble, I feel, can be laid to velleity. I've wanted to use that word for years. Unfortunately, I have now forgotten exactly what it means. But one can safely attribute trouble to it. Where was I? Today, science fiction is split by schisms and impaled on the trilon of bad thoughts. The fans, I mean, not the writers. The writers have been split and impaled for years, but nothing can be done about that. In a way, it's a good thing. Look at Jules Verne, Victor Hugo, and for that matter, the late unfortunate Tobias J. Coote. I put flowers on his grave only yesterday. He lies at rest though his ghastly fate pursued him even to the grave. And I can attribute Mr. Coote's fate to nothing less than the schisms of fandom. For Coote was a hard-working young man, serious, earnest, with the promise of becoming a first-class writer. He took life very solemnly, almost grimly. My job, he told me once, is to give people what they want. I want a drink, I said to him. Give me one. But Coote couldn't be turned from his rash course. 
he began to write science fiction. That's where the trouble started. Is it science, he pondered, or is it fiction? Already the cleavage, the split, had begun. It was a matter of logical progression towards ultimate division. Coote got in the habit of typing the science into his stories with his left hand and the fiction with his right. He began to twitch and worry. He got up nights. He was troubled, uneasy. I have one thing left to cling to, he muttered desperately. Fandom. I can point to that and say, it is real. It exists. It is dependable. When fandom had its schism, Coote immediately developed a split personality. It was rather horrible. His left side, the scientific side, grew cold and hard and keen. He grew a Van Dyke on the left side of his face, and his left hand was stained with acids and chemicals. But the right side of his face became dissipated and disreputable, with a leer in the eye and a scornful sneering curve to the lip. He grew a tiny mustache on the right side, waxed it, and twirled it continually. It was rather horrid, but worse was yet to come. One day, the inevitable happened. Tobias J. Coote split in half with a faint ripping sound and a despairing wail. He was, of course, buried in two coffins and in two graves, the wretched man's fate pursuing him even beyond death. Well, you can understand how I feel. What, with the mirror, the cats in sunsuits, and the weasel? Or haven't I mentioned the weasel? I mean the brown one, of course, and he, perhaps worst of all. It isn't what he says so much as his sneering, ironic tone. The other weasels, who live in the spare bedroom with the colt, were happy enough until he arrived. But now they are arranging a schism. As you will readily see, something must be done about it before science fiction collapses and the standard falls trailing into the dust. I suggest we mobilize and, to avoid dissension, give everybody the rank of general. Then, first of all, we can march to my house and get rid of that weasel. The brown one, of course. The others are welcome to stay as long as they like. I feel they are weak rather than wicked, and need only a good excuse, or should I say example, in order to brace themselves up. Contributions to the Fund for Mobilization of Science Fiction and the Extermination of Brown Weasels may be sent to me in care of this magazine. Do not delay. Each moment you wait brings us closer to doom. And besides, I need a new piano. End of the Truth About Goldfish by Henry Kuttner Recorded by James Ransom Death Walks on Mars by Alan J. Ram This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Grace Owl There was death above. The Martian sand vulture swooped and hissed and twitched its barred, poisonous tail in the thin air. There was death below. The man lay cradled in the pebbly sand, red sand that matched the colour of his hair and the colour of the blood oozing slowly from the hole in his forehead and trickling greasily along the inside of his punctured head bubble. The air whistled thinly through the corresponding hole in the bubble, as the oxygen converter tried vainly to maintain the proper breathing mixture. There was death in the muzzle of the gun dangling nonchalantly from the tall man's gloved hand. It grinned from his face, etched in the sardonic twist that the purple scar gave to his right cheek. It danced in the emotionless distances of his eyes. There was death in every beat of Leda Carson's heart. With the adaptability of a pioneer, she accepted the fact of death, even that of her husband's. The last two long Martian years had tested Terry's and her love, refined it with hardships and discouragement. 
The menacing gun was an easy way to rejoin him, but it was too easy, too soft a response to unwarranted killing. With unrelenting determination, she kindled and fanned to life a fierce resolve that the free men before her would pay, as slowly and as painfully as possible, for what they had done. Through lips necessarily stiff with the effort of controlled emotion, she asked, Why did you kill him? Didn't have anything against him, ma'am. Had to do it. Showed we meant business. Easier to handle one than two of you anyway. The eyes of the tubby man who answered her kept flickering anxiously upwards towards the sand vulture. That thing as dangerous as they say. Leda turned to the third and youngest man. His glance was fixed hypnotically on the death on the ground. His skin was pale and his forehead beaded with sweat. She repeated, What did you do it for? Got into trouble at Canal Port. Heard a rumour that you and your husband had struck a pocket of Martian sunbursts. Fixed up a deal with a ship's cargo master to smuggle us back to Earth if we turned your stuff over to him. He jetted us out to here. Left a while ago. The fat man itched frantically as he answered her. They all itched. Leda noticed. It took a long time on Mars before anyone became used to the dust that penetrated even the protecto suits. It produced an agony that demanded attention, followed by festering sores. You talk too much, Fatso, the tall one said angrily. What's the difference, Rick? Fatso said philosophically. Won't do her any good. Rick turned to Leda. At least you know the score. Do you want to tell us where the stuff is, or are you going to make it tough on yourself? Eyes like a razorback sand lizard. Leda fought. Out by our diggings, she answered readily. His eyes moved to the plastic bubble house that she and Terry had called home when they weren't digging. Search the place if you don't believe me, she suggested. We never brought any of them back here with us. We cached them in the cave until we were ready to go home. Then you did strike it? The young man interrupted eagerly. She nodded. Rick turned to the young man. Search the house, Jocko. She may be lying. The sand vulture wheeled and made a few low exploratory swoops towards them, as they waited for Jocko, Leda automatically checked her clothing to be sure she was completely covered. If that barbed tail touched the skin, death came. Slow, agonizing, sure. Jocko came back, emptier than interstellar space. Holstering his gun, Rick started off saying, Let's go, and no funny stuff. Leda smiled ironically and remained where she was. It's not that easy. The cave is four walking days away. Startled, Fatso groaned. Where's your sandmobile? Broken down at the diggings, we came back to get parts. Fatso and Jocko cussed loudly. Rick quieted them. Get the parts, he told Leda. You bring any water? She asked. You haven't any? Fatso's voice rose shrilly. Leda reached to her waist and a small, attached flask. Just this, and Terry has... had... one just like it. Enough for a couple old-timers like us. Not near enough for everyone now, particularly with you being new to Mars. Jocko snatched a flask from Terry's waist. I'll take that, Jocko, Rick commanded, and yours too he gestured to Leda. She handed it over obediently. But Rick, Fatso began, no arguments. Share and share alike. I'll dole it out. Now get the parts, he told Leda. You go with her, Fatso. As soon as they were back, the men began to move off. For the first time, Leda lost control of herself. For God's sake, aren't you going to at least bury him? Rick's face twisted with its wry grin as he walked back to her. Give the sand vulture a break. He's got to eat. But, she began to protest, 
Swiftly, he was beside her, doing something to his fingers. A pain surged up her arm, brought her stomach up into her throat gaggingly. Then he released her, gave her a shove. When I say move, that's what I mean. Get going. The cold, dry Martian air sucked the moisture irresistibly through the skin and suits. As the day slid slowly by, the ever near horizon stayed practically featureless. The red sand bored like Callisto hornets into the skin. Lips began to crack. Twice they stopped to sip the water. The second time, Rick looked at her. How the devil do you know where we are? Maybe I don't. She taunted, "You'd better. We've no way of checking on you. But if you double cross me, I'll strip your clothes off and leave you to the first sand vulture that comes along. Understand? Don't worry," she answered. "I know the way. I've covered it often enough. There are many little landmarks if you know what to look for." When evening came, Rick let each of them barely wet their lips. Then he said. I need sleep, and I can't trust anyone. So I'm going to hide the water in the desert. If anything happens to me, you'll all die of thirst. Now turn your backs. Leda heard him scramble off. He soon returned. Now let's sleep. The below zero cold of the Martian night challenged the thermo unit of Leda's desert suit, until she lay shivering. But worn out from the walk and emotional events of the day. She finally dropped off to sleep. It was still dark when she awoke. Deliberately making a noise, she listened for someone to challenge her. When no one moved, she slipped off into the desert. It took her several hours at a rapid pace to get back to the bubble house. Terry's protecto suit lay scattered over a wide area. His bones gleamed faintly in the barely discernible Martian moonlight. Picked clean by the sand vulture and razorback lizards, flinging herself on the sand, she poured out her grief with dry, raking sobs. The power to cry hard long since been sucked out of her by dehydration. Rising at last, she gathered together the things she had come for. When at last she returned to the night's camp, the three men were still fast asleep. Next morning, while they sat munching the tasteless emergency food tablets that were carried in the desert, Rick went after the water. Suddenly, his cussing rolled around the desert toward them. Leda smiled quietly. He came back at a half run. Disgustedly, he flung the flask at his feet. The sides had gaps ripped in them. What nitwits! He cursed. Naturally, the cold froze the water. When it expanded, it tore the flasks apart. You knew this would happen," he accused Leda. "Of course," she admitted. Fatso struck her across the shoulders, knocking her onto the sand. "None of that, Fatso," Rick commanded. "We need her worse now than ever." "Is there any water near?" he asked Leda. "About two days away, and then it's a gamble whether it will be good to drink." Sometimes the water following the strata from the pole hits a pocket of mineral that's poison. When that happens, the Explorers Guild puts up a deaf head sign to warn anyone from drinking it. As you know, they check every water source regularly. Is it far from your strike? Jocko asks. About a day's walk. Any water at your cave? Rick questioned. None. We didn't use much. And when we did need a supply, we got it from the outcropping I've mentioned, and took it back and distilled it. Well, we've got to head for the spring, Rick decided, and it better be good water. He warned Leda, "If it isn't, and we've got to die out here, I'll see that you never bring in those sunbursts ever." They plodded voicelessly after Leda. She set as fast a pace as she dared. Even then, Fatso began to drift back. Keep up, damn you! Rick warned. If you don't, we'll leave you here alone. Midway through the morning, Jocko burst out. Look at her, fresh as a Venusian pool lily. She must have some water on her. Grimly, they searched Leda. 
she stiffened against the invading fingers and smiled at them derisively. I told you that a veteran doesn't need water like you do. Rick took her arm and twisted it until she crumpled with a cry onto the sand. His voice was full of suspicion. What a fool I've been. Why didn't you abandon us last night when you had the chance? Shrugging out of his grasp, she rose and turned to him. I wouldn't miss the pleasure of seeing you all die for all the sunbursts on Mars. She strode away at a faster pace than before. It was about six hours after they had been on the way that Fatso stopped and began to yell. Damn dust, grinding right into my guts. Got to scratch. He ripped and tore at his clothes until his stomach was bare. With a look of unutterable satisfaction, he began to itch and dig. The swoosh could hardly be picked up. There was a long shadow, then a scream from Fatso. A sand vulture's trail came out of his belly red. Then the vulture was away, circling high and out of range. Blindly, Rick pulled his gun and fired. Fast as his trigger finger was, the poison was faster. By the third shot, Fatso began to scream. His voice rose up the scale of torture, bursting occasionally in a pean of agony. As he screamed, he lay on the ground, writhing. Before their eyes, his stomach began to bulge and turn purple from the poison. His eyes rolled up into his head, and the moans began to dribble from his lips like the litany of an insane chorus. I can't stand it, Jocko shouted. How long will it last? Not long enough, Leda answered. Her voice brittle with satisfaction. Only about ten hours, and in that time... He will become mindless, an animal begging for death. Then finally, he will just grovel there moaning and moaning and moaning. You wanted this to happen to him, Jocko accused. Leda looked at him, and I hope the same for you, only worse. Stop it, you two, Rick commanded. It's bad enough this way. The living must live. He is dead and he doesn't know it. Why let him suffer? More meat for the sand vulture, Leda suggested sarcastically. The scar on Rick's cheek flared red-purple. He levelled his gun slowly, with steady aim. After the trigger was pulled, Fatso stopped moving. More meat for the sand vulture, he answered Leda. Now let's move. The red dust whispered at Leda all day. Death, death, death. Even with a pebble in her mouth to suck on, she felt her lips split and wrinkle. Her blood sweet in her mouth was welcome moisture. She set her shoulders forward and plodded through the endless sand and pebbly underfooting. Toward evening, Jocko stumbled and fell several times. At last he lay limply, looking to Leda and Rick pleadingly. His lips moved slackly, until he at last managed to croak. Got a rest. Can't go on. Please don't leave me. Rick mouthed his reply thickly. I'm pretty beat myself. Let's rest. Leda flopped to the sand without an answer. Her mouth was full of tongue. The pebbles she had been sucking, feeling like a file against her lips. Every muscle ate. Every cell screamed for moisture. After a long wordless rest, Rick holed himself to his feet and faced Leda. Can't trust you now. You'll sneak off and leave us alone. Leda looked at him scornfully. Don't worry about that. I meant what I said. I want to see you die. Still got to watch you, Rick replied. He turned to Jocko. You get some sleep first. I'll watch her. Later, I'll wake you to take over. Leda moulded a hip hole in the sand and settled down. The night cold had long descended when the two men changed shifts. All through his trick, Rick had sat facing her. She lay quietly, simulating sleep. At last, Jocko began to nod and doze. For a while, he managed to jerk himself awake, but he finally fell over and slept. 
Cautiously, she crept over to him and shook his arm. He didn't stir. Satisfaction, touched with grim humor, warmed her internally as she bent over him and removed his boots. She moved with them off into the desert, satisfied at last that she was far enough from camp. She heaved the boots into the desert darkness. She wasn't gone long, but even so, she had barely settled down again when she heard Rick shake Jocko, "Wake up, you fool! I'd like to kill you for this." The girl could have crept off, and you wouldn't have known it. I'm sorry, Rick, but I'm tired. I couldn't help it. Rick began to cuss, but stopped. What's the use? Go back to sleep. I'll finish your watch. It wasn't until they were ready to move the next morning that Jocko noticed that his boots were missing. He turned to Leda. You stole them. Don't be a damned fool, Rick answered. She was watched all night. You probably had a nightmare and heaved them out into the desert. Let's look. Leda watched them search in an ever widening circle, limpering and still bootless. Jocko moved with Rick back to the camp. You'll have to try it as is, Rick was saying as they came close. But I can't, Jocko whined. The dust almost drove me crazy with them on. What will I do this way? That's your problem, Rick said callously. Come or stay alone. It's up to you. He turned to Leda. Glad to see you look so lousy this morning. At least you are suffering some too. If you're telling the truth, we'll be at the pool tomorrow. They were on the way about a half hour when the sand around Jocko's feet began to boil. Almost immediately, his voice rose shrilly, and then disappeared. A set for twitchings on his cheeks and lips. What's wrong, Jocko? Rick asked. His feet, Leda said laconically. It looked as though Jocko was sinking into the sand. Then the red stain spreading into the sand told a different story. Razorback lizards, Leda informed Rick. They're all over the place. Come to life during the day when it's a little warmer. Our footwear keeps them off. But Jocko's feet haven't any protection, so they can get at him. They'll slice away at him at a fraction of an inch at a time. In fifteen minutes, there won't be anything left but his suit and a skeleton. Pleasant death, eh, Rick? But after all, they do have to eat, as you said. Jocko toppled and lay twitching on his side. The legs of his protecto suit apparently buried in the sand. The pants legs were strangely deflated, except for the twisting and squirming of the unseen lizards as they ate their way into the upper part of the suit. It took less than fifteen minutes. At the end, Leda looked away. Once long ago, she had watched in horror as the blood-colored tide burst into the helmet of a prospective friend of Terry's and hers. It was a sight she had seen many times later in nightmares. Now, as she imagined it, she heard Rick suck in his breath sharply and say hoarsely, "No, no, shall we be moving on?" She asked at last. The suit filled only with fleshless skeleton, left deflated on the ground. Rick's face was a dull, sandy, yellowish hue. He nodded and turned off into the desert. Without a word, that third day was shooting pains, a chest that protested with every step, legs that would not be felt but somehow magically functioned. Many times, Leda was ready to quit. She began to stagger and weave erratically across the sand. The only thing that kept her going was the obsession of revenge that seemed to provide a limitless source of power whenever she seemed weakest, and Rick. Was getting bad. He seemed about finished. How he managed to keep going, Leda could not imagine. He fell repeatedly, but pulled himself doggedly back to his feet and stumbled after her. When she flopped to the sand toward nightfall, he gestured her to her feet, and when she failed to get up, he came over and dragged her roughly erect. Can't stop. Never get up. Got to keep moving. Until we die or get there.
move. But the Martian knight accomplished what she could not. Landmarks became indistinguishable. They soon would have been lost. Lying down, Leda adjusted her head bubble, so that it became opaque, conserving the warmth that leaked off so rapidly from a transparent object. At long intervals, she tried to move away from Rick, who had settled right beside her, but each time his hand grabbed her firmly, forcing her back to the sand. He apparently intended to stay awake all night, so she wouldn't sneak off. When the morning of the fourth day arrived, they rose and once more moved stiffly, without a word from one another, across the waste on the route that Leda had selected. Without quite knowing how it happened, Leda twice found herself on her knees on the sand. She knew she had been staggering, that her strength had long past left her, yet she was still amazed that her legs would not do the bidding of her mind. Each time she fell, Rick jerked her roughly to her feet and supported her until her legs moved automatically again. His eyes were red-rimmed, his lips a ghastly slash of scabs and sores. About mid-morning he began to mumble incoherently, as though his voice alone could keep him sane. The only recognisable word that slid through his lips was, Water, water. It beat like the tone of a base Callisto Satan temple drum on Leda's stained mind until she began to vision waterfalls and huge cakes of ice on the desert before her. Reality and imagination became mixed until she wondered if there was a place called Mars and if the past few days were real. And it became noon, then mid-afternoon. Suddenly, the water hole appeared at a dark spot on the featureless landscape before them, distinguishable only by the lichens that surrounded it. They both broke into a shuffling, jerky trot. Leda was yards behind Rick when he reached the mud hole. Instead of flinging himself down to the moisture, he stiffened, then his voice broke into a babbling cackle. He pointed to the perma-metal sign staked in the watery mud, a death's head stood embossed on its surface, the interplanetary symbols for death etched into the age-resisting metal. Then his hand moved like doom to the skeleton that lay, head touching the red mud on the edge of the hole. Ignoring Leda completely, his voice broke into a hideous sing-song of wild laughter, and the word poison tumbled endlessly from his throat. He stopped abruptly and turned to the desert. The lines of agony on his face smoothed out, and the old sardonic grin twisted its way to his cheeks. Only his eyes gleamed madly. With a tremendous effort, he said loudly, Water! There! Only a little way off! And he staggered off into the desert, his arms extended eagerly, his hands fluttering aimlessly. Leda watched him go, watched him chase his mirage out into the Martian waste that extended for hundreds of miles without the slightest trace of water, watched him stagger into oblivion until it became small with the distance. Kneeling, she pushed the mud aside in the waterhole, forming a small trough into which the red water would seep. Then she advanced the gauge on her head bubble until she was breathing almost pure oxygen. Patiently, she breathed in the mixture. After 15 minutes, she removed the head bubble and bent her lips to the accumulated water. Her oxygen-saturated system would easily permit her to go a full 10 or more minutes without having to take a breath. Twice, she lay back and let the water regain its level, then drank. Satisfied at last, she placed the head bubble once more into its flange in the suit. Rising, she pulled the poison sign from the mud and carried it over to the skeleton. There she eased herself to the sand and gently placed her hand on the head of the skeleton. We did it, Terry, she said gently. There was triumph in her voice, a feeling of peace and wholeness once more inside her. 
the fools thought they could beat us. Four days to make an easy five-hour walk, circling around and around, waiting, waiting and planning, and killing. Now they are dead, and I can give you a decent burial. Forgive me, my darling, for moving you over here that first night, but I needed the sign and you to get even. Thanks for your help. End of Death Walks on Mars by Alan J. Ram Recording by Grace Owl